pain staging, all of the things that you really, really need to know that we can't explain to you in Nail the Mix in absolute detail, breaking them down into the lowest common denominators. Aside from that, at Enhance, we have one-on-one -on -one sessions where every month, me, Joey, and Al, we do like an office hours kind of thing, and we come in for a couple hours every week. And you guys can sit down with us on Skype one-on-one. -on -one. We can talk about your careers, your mixes, whatever you guys want to talk about. And the third thing we do is once a month, we grab one of your songs. And we do a mix rescue, which means we sit down like we're doing here and now and nail the mix with one of your songs and your sessions and show you guys how to rescue a mix. So don't take my word for it. Check out what other people have to say about you are If you guys want to fast track your audio game to the next level, head right on over to nailthemix.com slash upgrade and get enhanced. Yo, Drumforge Ultimate Sampler is finally here. Whether you're a songwriter, musician, producer, mixing engineer, or maybe you just love making metal renditions of pop songs on YouTube. Whatever the case, you need a great drum sound. Our sampler is hyper-optimized and lightning fast, so you can spend less time waiting and more time creating. Like, you know, your next cat video sensation. Harness your creativity with our award-winning sample library. Yo, shout out the Pro Tools expert! 60 plus instruments featured on records from bands such as Attila, Machine Head, Vinyl Theater, and many, many more. <laughs> Build your perfect drum kit creatively with a practical approach via the intuitive UI design. Change the engineering setups and select processed or unprocessed samples per microphone for maximum flexibility. Best of all, the mixer combined with powerful built-in DSP modules allows you to fully mix your drum sound from scratch without ever touching another plugin. How about that? Last but not least, it's actually affordable. Click below to learn more. We can all be mean queens We can all feel nothing We can all have big dreams, baby I can't give up my the slur plugin accomplished a lot of what I was looking for in this specific song. It is very warm and it's subtle and it does have that stereo effect that really gives it an interesting organic feel. We can all have big dreams, baby. I can give up mine. Someday I want to be one of the many. Soar is a new kind of tape delay combining the lush analog tones of tape with the power and flexibility of digital processing. Featuring true analog tape modeled processing, 
tape control including repeats, age, and flutter, variable 15 slash 30 IPS speed, groundbreaking tape health and contour adjustments, onboard mono and mix controls, and much much more. With SOAR, you'll have more control over your delay than ever before. Download SOAR today at joeysturgistones.com. and brings new justice to the tired and worn out warriors. Shaping transience into excellence. Seeking victory with every twist of the knob. DF Trans conquers all who dare to challenge his might. DF Trans, flawless victory. Hey everyone, it's John Brown here and I play with a band called Monuments. Nail the Mix is an online mixing school that gives you access to the sessions from world class artists and live streaming classes from the producers who mix them. This month I'll be going on Nail the Mix to mix I the Creator by my band Monuments. I mixed the album with some help from E.L. Levy and I'm excited to show you how I mix this. Sign up to Nail the Mix now and you'll get all the raw multi tracks, the same files that I used on the album and an online mixing class to show you how I did it. I mixed it in my very own home studio a long time ago. The setup I had was a lot more modest than what I have now and it's very similar to probably what some of you guys have. In fact, some of you guys might have better equipment than what I had at the time. Why am I telling you this? Because that's the point of my class. I know you've heard it a million times already, but it's the ear, not the gear, and that is what I want to show you with my session. I've heard so many of you say, I can't wait to get this piece of gear, I can't wait to get this plug in, I can't wait to get these better monitors. But in actuality, none of that is going to help if you don't train your ear to work with what you've got. It doesn't matter so much what door you're using, what plugins you're using, what monitors you have, or even if your room has great acoustic treatment. What matters is, is that the source material sounds great and that you make the right creative decisions when you sit down to mix it. If you've heard my band, then you know that everyone in the band can play that instrument very, very well. The source material of the drums is recorded great and especially the vocal performance is absolutely astounding. So here you have all these great raw materials ready for you to make a banging mix with. Banging. This session will prove that there is no reason why you can't get pro level mixes with the setup you have now. Every month on Nail The Mix there is a user judged mix competition where you can compete against your peers for real prizes from real companies. This month's sponsor is Line 6. First place will win a Helix Rack and Control, and second place will win a Spider 5 120 Combo Amp with an FBV2 and a G10T wireless transmitter. So if you want to get your hands on this session, access to my mixing class, and see the potential of a modest home studio, then click the link below and I'll see you there. Hey guys, if you're enjoying Nail the Mix, I want to take a second to tell you about how cool URM Enhanced is. Now, URM Enhanced is going to take Nail the Mix and just bring it to a completely different level of depth. We got fast tracks, we have an entire library of videos covering everything from hearing compression, gain staging, all of the things that you really, really need to know that we can't explain to you in Nail the Mix. 
in absolute detail, breaking them down into the lowest common denominators. Aside from that, at Enhance, we have one-on-one -on -one sessions where every month, me, Joey, and Al, we do like an office hours kind of thing, and we come in for a couple of hours every week. And you guys can sit down with us on Skype one-on-one. -on -one. We can talk about your careers, your mixes, whatever you guys want to talk about. And the third thing we do is once a month, we grab one of your songs. And we do a mixed rescue, which means we sit down like we're doing right now and nail the mix with one of your songs and your sessions and show you guys how to rescue a mix. So don't take my word for it. Check out what other people have to say about you are If you guys want to fast track your audio game to the next level, head right on over to nailthemix.com slash upgrade and get enhanced. Yo, Drumforge Ultimate Sampler is finally here. Whether you're a songwriter, musician, producer, mixing engineer, or maybe you just love making metal renditions of pop songs on YouTube. Whatever the case, you need a great drum sound. Our sampler is hyper-optimized and lightning fast, so you can spend less time waiting and more time creating. Like, you know, your next cat video sensation. Harness your creativity with our award-winning sample library. Yo, shout out the Pro Tools expert! 60 plus instruments featured on records from bands such as Attila, Machine Head, Vinyl Theater, and many, many more. <laughs> Build your perfect drum kit creatively with a practical approach via the intuitive UI design. Change the engineering setups and select processed or unprocessed samples per microphone for maximum flexibility. Best of all, the mixer combined with powerful built-in DSP modules allows you to fully mix your drum sound from scratch without ever touching another plugin. How about that? Last but not least, it's actually affordable. Click below to learn more. And welcome to July 2017 Nail the Mix with uh, Dr. Wizard Blood, real name Drew Falk, and uh, Mr. Jeff Dunn, good friends of ours. They'll be mixing Flag of the Beast by Imure. Uh I know that we have a lot of new people here, so hello in the chats. Uh, let me know that you can hear us by typing 1, though I kind of know that you can because you're already responding. So we're very excited. This is going to be a really cool mix. There's uh, lots of stuff in this mix that's relevant to how a lot of you guys work. Program drums, for instance, uh, very low tune guitars. It's going to be cool. And uh, how are you guys doing? How are you doing, Drew and Jeff? I'm doing great. Doing yeah. well. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you guys for being here. Of course. It's super fun to be here. This is going to be a fun song to mix. And this is your home studio? Yeah, this is, this is basically where we do everything. <laughs> Yeah, day in, day out. Yeah, so that we're, at, uh, we're at Sphere Studios in uh, L.A. I don't actually know what part of L.A. we're in. but uh, North Hollywood? Yeah, like Burbank, I think. Yeah. yeah, we're in Burbank. It's one of the most gorgeous studios I've ever seen. Um, Coolest airport in the goddamn world. That's right. It's in the airport, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's talk about this record some. Uh, How did it come to you guys? And... Uh, what was your uh, what was your thinking when you're like okay I'm gonna do an Embure record? 
How, like, what's the first thing that came to your mind? Uh, this one started, or this one came about through uh, their manager that I'm good friends with. His name's Andrew Yarin. And he called me one day and he said that Frankie was going to continue with the Muir and he had a new lineup and he felt like he had a really good batch of songs that he wanted to work with. And me personally, I'd never really listened to a Muir too much. Obviously, I knew who the singer was. I knew who the band was. I knew what they sounded like. And I wasn't sure if I wanted to do it because I, was, I wasn't sure if that was something that I wanted to do. And they sent me some demos and Frankie and I got on the phone and I could tell that he wasn't I felt like it was going to go one of two ways. Either he was going to feel defeated that he had to start over or he was going to feel energized that he had kind of a new a new crew of people to run with. And it was very quickly uh, the latter. And he was really excited. And obviously having Josh Travis as a guitarist is... I was about to say, you can't really... Yeah. If he felt depressed about that, I'd question... <laughs> yeah. I, I, and I had never talked to Frankie before and he felt... The energy I got was just pure excitement. He seemed very calm, very energetic, very creative, very inspired. Uh, and they sent me a bunch of stuff, and, and it was it was phenomenal. So I basically was like, yeah, I want to do it because it feels like it's going to be exciting and upbeat and positive in, in terms of like the energy of it. So um, that was how we kind of came about to doing it together, was talking with Josh and talking with Frankie and just realizing that he wanted to make the most classic version of a Muir. He didn't want to turn it into like a rock singing band. He didn't want to turn it into just what he had done in the past. He kind of wanted to do this uh, best of both worlds, things that he knew fans liked and things that he knew he wanted to try this time around. So um, that was that was how we kind of came together. And, so and when just, you say the most classic version of a Muir, for you as a producer, what does that mean? For me... When, I think when anyone in the heavy metal, heavy metal world hears the name of Muir, you think aggression, you think, you know, high energy, you think abrasiveness, you think intensity. So I, that was for me, I just wanted to make sure that if I was going to be involved with them, I wanted it to hit all of those notes because if it wasn't going to be that, it didn't seem like the right record to make. And when we checked all those, I was like, that's what feels like classic in Muir is something that you know, when you're angry, you have something that you can reach out and grab very palpably, like an Amur album. You know, if you're going to the gym, you can grab an Amur album. Those are things that I kind of align a lot of those just very aggressive, dark, um, low-tuned heavy metal bands with. And I think that's what they do great is, you know, they help people get through, you know, parts of their life that feel awful, parts of, you know, their job that feel awful, and all these things. And heavy music is like a coping mechanism. And for me, that's what bands like Amir do. So you think, at least, I'll say that, I think that sometimes when a band is this far into their career, especially when they go through lineup changes, sometimes it can be easy to change their sound in a negative way or like to water it down some. So you're saying that you kind of had a checklist of things that you wanted to tick off, like the aggression and all that stuff. Yeah. Like, was it literally like a checklist? Like, you went through the songs and were like, this needs... I, I don't mean, like, written down checklist, but, like, were you literally, like, going through the list on every song and every part? Like, this yeah. has the aggression, this has the intensity, or, like, this doesn't, it sucks, it's got to go. Yeah, I, I think it, it as as a role as producer your job is to make sure that you identify the lens that you want the listener to hear every song on the record or the album through and his job is to create whether it be far left far right far up far down fast slow anything and my job is to make sure that I'm catching it and pulling it into the lens that we've agreed on and that lens was you know the stuff that we had talked about before he got into the studio so there were times where he would do a, a vocal part and I would say well that sounds good technically, but is that what we're after with the lens that we've agreed on? He's like, oh yeah, you're right. We should just tweak it a little bit and then it'll actually fit. And that's why the record seems very cohesive is because I'm much more of a, a macro producer in terms of the energy and, and the feeling and, and the ebb and flow. Like you can have sad songs on an, aggression, on, on an aggressive record, but they have to still fit into the lens of a heavy band. You can't just kind of go out and do like a 
Coldplay piano song on the Muir record and expect people to be like, yeah, I, I get down with that. But you can do things like Metallica where you can play down tempo melodic songs and you can sing and people be like, yeah, that's a metal band, but that's still a metal song. So there was definitely a filter that everything he did, every, every vocal take, every layer, everything has to go through that agreed upon lens. And uh, did you find that the band was pretty much agreeable? Yeah. Like, it, even if they came with ideas that didn't quite fit through that lens? Like, what's the process for you as a producer to be like, ah, uh, not quite? Well, in, I mean, in general, it, I, I think as a producer, your job is to tell people no when they don't necessarily want to be told no. And I've told artists many times, I'm like, hey, this doesn't feel this way, but if you think I'm wrong, tell me and let's debate it out because we're trying to win the same battle here. So let's go through it. But when you have Josh Travis and you have Frankie Palmieri and you're like, okay, I guess we're going to make a heavy record. There was very, there was like zero times where anyone was like, I think we should chill this out. Everyone was just always like, well, I think if we do this, it'll get heavier. And I think if we do this, it'll sound more aggressive. I think if we do this. And after a while, it's just people like putting building blocks on top of the song till you get to this point that if just I had made it or just Frankie had made it, or just Josh had made it, it would have been here. But instead, everyone working together, it got up to this, you know, this kind of banner that made the record what it was. Makes sense. So, yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about how that actually translates into audio a little more technically. So, you work with Jeff here. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about how you, how you guys met, what your roles are, and how that translates artistically. Uh, how, how did, I think we met through. We were setting up the studio. Yeah, and we had just known each other through the internet. Yeah, you know, the same I'll, circles. Yeah, this. Kyle was the main link. Yeah, yeah my, Kyle Odell. My, 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 one of my best friends and engineers in North Carolina, Kyle Odell, um, was on an online community very similar to, you know, URM. And we had just kind of always, you know, gone back and forth, kind of like, you know, I'm sure a lot of, people out there kind of interact and, and give each other feedback and communicate which I think is great that's how we became you know partners in a lot of this stuff and when I moved out here I moved from North Carolina to LA and I had three days off between moving and starting a record so I had to drive across the country in a day and a half so I got that done and then I landed I had to get a desk, an Argosy desk, move it in. I had to put all the boxes into the room and build the desk in the room because I couldn't put it outside. I couldn't put it together outside. It wouldn't fit through the door frame. So I had all these crazy tasks. And I knew that Jeff, had you always been in LA? No, you had just... No, I've, I'd been around like Southern California. I moved here, I think, like a year before you did. Yeah, so I think I had, no, I had known that Jeff had moved here and I just texted him, I was like, uh, you don't happen to live anywhere near here or want to like help at all because I didn't know anyone and he was like actually I live a mile away so I was like yes so from from very early on he was helping me with you know anytime I needed more work to be done at the end of the day anytime we needed edits he'd do them remotely he helps on you know obviously now we do all the mixes together but even early on he was kind of the person that helped keep my head afloat in a lot of ways on a lot of the, the demands for label deadlines, which are also oh fantastic. So I, could, I can say from working with you guys that, uh, Jeff, you are one super organized human yeah. being. Uh, it's been very, very easy. And definitely from just the email process, I, can, I was like, yeah, I can see why this guy works with uh, producers that are doing stuff. What's your, could you tell people your background some? Because, like, I've known you online for ages, and I know you've been around, but just for people who don't know you, can you tell yeah. a little bit of, because um, you've been around. Yeah, no, so I think the, the like, very steep forum, um, and that's where a ton of us, like, met. It's um, where I learned to do almost everything production-related. And uh, i trying to think. Um, on that forum at one point, I was editing drums, with uh, Ryan Harvey. He was the first dude who ever hired me to edit drums um, on an EP. And then that ended up cascading to like uh, 
got a recommendation from him to edit with Dave Otero. And uh, still really good friends with Dave. We'll do edits for him uh, on a dime if he needs it. Um, and I think the first one we did was an Elysian record for Metal Blade. Um, it was really cool. Um, so it was like first dip into label work and then worked with Dave a bit. And Dave then uh, recommended me to Joey. Um, I think the first one I did with Joey for drum editing was the Of Mice and Men record, Floods. And then, um, yeah, I would, uh, throughout like the end of high school and college, would just edit remotely for Joey and for other guys. Um, Joey is off to my right, by the way, guys. Which is a super camera. awkward to not look at him while I'm saying this. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, I'm trying to think. Um, so right out of high school, you were already working for Joey? Yeah, I would like at like 17, 18 start recording other bands because I was so much better at making good sounding demos than actually writing good songs. So like, which is also why we work perfectly together. Um, so I got really good at the technical side and just wound up editing through college. Um, after college, I um, tried to make a studio work out with um, Andrew Glover from Winds of Plague. We lived in Rancho Cucamonga for a bit. Um, that's where I know yeah, you're from. Yeah, I okay. think that's where it ended up coming down. Yeah. And uh, so that was really cool. Um, like I was living with them when Will Putney came out and did the, the most recent record for them. Um, so that was a really cool connection there. And then wound up moving back to LA. Um, I work a totally different job during the day. I work at a company called Nation Builder, which was founded by the drummer from Daylight Dies. So like, that's a weird thing that still connects here. Um, and I think they're from North Carolina. Are they? Yeah, they're from like Raleigh, Durham area. Huh. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then got cooked up with Drew. Three years ago? Yeah, I two and I've, a half? I've been here almost three years, so about two and a half years ago. Yeah. Yeah, and it works out great because, like you said, he has a day job, and and L.A. Is, it can be so financially taxing that it's hard to take on someone and be like, hey, I'll pay you you know, a salary, or I'll pay you, I'll guarantee you this amount of hours every week. And it's it's been very beneficial to have someone like Jeff who's kind of like hey if you don't need me for a month or two that's cool if you need me you know every day let me know and I can try to schedule it and him, between him living so close and him having that set up we really have this unique special uh, partnership that really helps the studio get a lot more done with a lot less stress like he and I are never stressed in the studio even if there's deadlines it's always just like all right well let's just get it done you know because between his job, my job, it can get very stressful, but it's it's kind of a yin-yang situation where a lot of the stuff that he does, I don't even want to know about. I'm just like, leave me out of it. I just want to come in and hear it. And the same with him. He's like, all right, you're good. You run with it. And it, it's very, it's like passing a basketball back and forth until it gets in the hoop. And you're just like, all right, cool, we're done. So, those of you who are speed mixing students or who have or know anything about speed mixing, you know that we talk a lot about either outsourcing or hiring a, an assistant or a partner uh, for these exact reasons, um, not just because of uh, efficiency reasons, but also because they might be better at things that you might not be great at and vice versa. Um, it's very important to know what your strengths and weaknesses are. So like Jeff just said, better engineer than a songwriter. And I know that Drew, you consider yourself more of a big picture guy than like yeah. a technical engineer. Yeah. So it's like a perfect partnership. Yeah. I'm, I'm always focused on like the, the sometimes, sometimes people think it's silly, but I'm always focused on the energy and the emotion of the part. Cause I think that is really the only reason why music is made, you know, whether it be a mirror, they're channeling aggression you know whether it be Coldplay they're channeling like positivity or things like that you know and I think if, the, if no one's focusing on that it doesn't really matter what the song sounds like but then once you get the emotion you need it to sound great to get the emotion through so they play together you can't have one without the other I think we've all heard a lot of songs that sounded good and you couldn't care less and that's because there's a lot of people that put a lot of time into mixing it but the songs just do nothing so those don't work and then emotionally yeah and then there's a lot of songs that had great emotion or had the chance to but no one knew how to get it to come through the right way so they also fall flat and so to me music is a complete marriage of like technology and like unexplainable energy that's what i think at least yeah and i think a big part of it for me is like 
just from the technical work demands, like from a fatigue standpoint, after I've been finished comping and editing drums, editing bass, reamping bass, editing guitars, reamping guitars, tuning vocals, I don't want to hear the songs anymore. Yeah. So like, if I can pass that off to someone else to do a lot of the like, balancing ear candy like post production yeah. stuff, like that's amazing because I get to take a break from songs I'm sick of hearing um, and come back to them after someone else has touched it. Yeah, and I think any anyone would be aloof to think that you can mix a song perfectly on the first pass, the second pass, or even the third pass. You know, I I I remember talking to Will Putney one time, or reading it, or maybe he posted it, and him just saying every time he would, every time he sits down, it's like you're mixing the song more and more because every time you sit down, your ears definitively have the ability to hear, like if I want to hear the guitars on this mix right now, I'm gonna only hear the guitars and I'm gonna only think about what they should be doing. If I sit down and I only wanna hear the drums, I'm literally gonna only hear the drums. So you can't expect your ears to sit down and hear every track, you know, whether it be 60 or however many tracks are in this, or whether it be 180, you know, if you're getting up into a lot of strings and synths and stuff. So you have to have multiple passes. And when you have someone like Jeff and I like working together, we're just able to cut that in half because I do a pass and then he does a pass right after me, but with fresh ears. So we're hearing all these things very, like much quicker than if I did a pass. Like, okay, I have to take a day off and I have to come back and I have to do another pass. Like it, it would take two, three times the length. And, you know, I think when you have that, you're able to refine quicker and more objectively. That's what I think. Absolutely. Sounds great. So let's uh, switch gears and start talking now actually about technical stuff. So I know you've got Cubase open, and you've got a session open. Can you talk us through uh, just how you lay sessions out? Like what's going on? Like just assuming that this is the beginning of the mix for yeah, the right. album, like what are you thinking? Like how are you starting? What's What's going on? I'll do the colors first. Well, so I think what's interesting about this is that the, this is not really representative of how the record was mixed. Um, we did the entire record in one giant session. Which, which is, is strange. We don't usually do that. I used to do it a lot and have like started to fall out of love with that workflow um, for a lot of reasons, um, but mainly just being like the differences Computer. between songs yeah. and how the pace of our work. Yeah. Um, so this was condensed from that. And the other thing is we had the MIDI kit running through the printing of it, so I bounced out all those stems. Um, there's a kick track in here that didn't exist in the real mix because I was just running the kick straight from the MIDI track. So there's stuff like that that's a little bit different. But the other thing that is worth mentioning there is that like the production tracks as we get down here, these were all done in writing sessions for the individual tracks mm -hmm. and then printed from those to send out here. Yeah. So like ticks, for instance, would be from a totally separate, like a, I think it's Groove at Agent SE. But it, it's just yeah. not, it would have been printed with like a waves doubler effect in some giant mid-range sucked out of it. Yeah, I, um, whenever I use ticks, uh, we'll just talk about that for a second. Whenever I use ticks, it's, it's more or less to put them in a song. I think in any, you know, people use tambourines, people use ticks. It's really just anything that is creating this kind of like metronome effect in your body that makes you feel like you're moving through the song, whether it be a metal song or a rap song or anything. Like those kinds of things are, are beneficial to keep a song from feeling stagnant or kind of like it's slow. And so for me, I don't really want those fighting with the things in the middle, like the kick and the snare and the vocal and the bass guitar and things. So they're almost always going to have a doubler, like the waves doubler thrown out. And um, yeah, sucking all the lows, all the mids, because you really, you barely want to hear it. You want to just feel it. I mean, that's different in rap, but in this song specifically, it's not like the most important thing. It's more of a nuance effects. Yeah. But yeah, if I'm setting up a mix, um, after we've got our tracks in place, so when I was, for instance, like compiling the major uh, full track session that we were mixing from, um, the first thing is that like all the consolidated tracks, as much as I love consolidating tracks for the like cleanliness of transfer, because my thing is that I've always worked in Cubase and worked with people who don't use Cubase, so it's waves versus um, versus sending sessions over. So I just have like a really bog standard strip silence that I'm going to use across all of these to just strip out the empty points so I can get a better visual. Um, yeah, that's cool. So you know where things are. Yeah, exactly. Because I don't want like. 
I know that the vocal I didn't even even know how to do that, so that's great. Yeah. Um, And then the next thing we're going to do is group everything. They've been color-coded, so we've got a really standard color-coding set. Yellow is drums, uh, bass is red, guitar is is, is blue, lead guitar is like a more purpley blue. Vocals end up being... Green, because that's where the money is. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Red on the lead vocals is like effects. Um, We've got our background vocals, and then some like sample vocal stuff. Production ends up being orange. I, and and I, really green because that's where the money is. Yeah, that's why I've had <laughs> Amazing. it. Amazing. I've, I've had the same color for my group since since North Carolina, like five or six years ago. And I don't think it matters what color you want. For me, I I I hear songs and it's um, synesthesia, I think a little yes. bit. And I hear songs in colors, yeah. so I kind of um, correlated I them to how I hear them. And I don't think it matters what color you use, but I do think it matters uh, to feel organized. So whatever color you want to use, or whatever organization tool you want to use is fine, but I think you should always have organization, because there's been times where things are colored differently or things are just not colored, and it just feels cluttered, and it makes it harder to mix a song, as strange as it sounds. I think it's 100% real that you have to have, like, set organization at least as you go through like records to songs and this and that so anytime i open a session i'm like okay yellow drums and i go up to the snare i'm like i need to fix that vocal i go down until i see green so it makes you quicker and it makes you more efficient and it also just feels a little bit more calming when there's so much to be done in a mix you know you're going to do thousands of moves before the mix is done so any little thing you can do to make you feel more like prepared for or more focused, I think is super important. Yeah, and what I've done there, just I've got a hotkey in Cubase to move everything into a folder. The uh, two favorite macros I have in Cubase are that, and then one that if I highlight a set of tracks, I can add them all to a group, and it'll just create a new group. I've got all those created because, um, I guess kind of getting into like how we would set these up after having the tracks imported, um, would be to set up our busing system. Yeah, it's which, like a pyramid scheme. Yeah. And I, I think a lot of you guys are familiar with like the top-down mixing, mm-hmm. is is what. I love Nolly. Yeah, people. Have been is that what we that. do? Are More we or less, down? it was. It just came out of like needing to access different parts of the mix at different points in time, like especially when it comes like stem print time. Yeah, I was about to say that really helps when when artists leave and they text me on tour saying that they didn't realize they needed this song or they lost this track. And you, in, in Cubase, at least, you can go in and, and choose which groups to export. And as you can see, we have drums, kick, snare, tom, cymbal, bass, guitar. So it's very easy just to ch- click, you know, production, vocals, leads, guitars, mm-hmm. bass, drums, export. And at once, they have all the stems that they need for their live show. Yeah. So a standard session of ours would probably start with no audio tracks. And then these buses pre-made and routed, um, which include, like, these top ones. And the reason I have them in the group's tracks or a group folder, is because this isn't where they end up in the mix. We distribute these out into their individual folders mm-hmm. above the tracks they correspond to. So for instance, like our room group ends up right above the room tracks. There we go. And then symbol group is above all the symbols. Toms goes above toms. Um, anytime you're seeing an all caps one on this is just a parent group. So like snare is gonna be the snare fader. You can think of it like a VCA. Cubase didn't have VCAs forever, so I never really learned how to use them. (laughs) Yeah, Um, yeah, ask either of us to use Pro Tools and we're useless. Yeah, Um, I I actually had to use Pro Tools in April in Japan and it was was a bit, it was a bit archaic for me, just because yeah. I didn't know exactly what to do. But well, we tracked that Kane Hill record at a studio that was all Pro Tools, and I remember I didn't know how to comp takes in Pro Tools, so I just added everything to a new playlist and then moved it into Cubase and did it there. The, the thing, the <laughs> thing about, yeah, the thing about if you get thrown into a situation where you're not having, where you don't have the DAW that you wish, is that it, it's not that challenging to operate. It's just not that comfortable. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's all, they're all seemingly similar sets of tools just with different colors and in different places. They all suck a little bit. Yeah. They're they all suck in different ways. Yeah, exactly. and none of them are exactly what you hope for. <laughs> so yeah. just find one that feels comfortable. The reason why I'm on Cubase is because when I was 14 at my parents' house, they agreed to let me get some drum microphones and let me get a computer. And the first interface I bought was a 
Personas Firepod, and it came with a really cheap version of Cubase. I, I don't even remember which one it was, but um, that was how I started on it, and I was just so obsessed with the ability to record things multi-track, because up until then, I just had like one mic on the drums, and I would record it, and that was everything. So I just would literally do nothing but record as a teenager, and every time a new Cubase came out, I would just buy it. So that's the only reason why I'm on Cubase and not Pro Tools, is just sheer access, and then learning so much about Cubase that there was, now it would I would have to spend so much time to be as efficient in Pro Tools as I am Cubase. Yeah, I got into it because it was easily piratable. Um, <laughs> just and to be totally, like SX3 was everywhere and like you could use it, but then no job I ever got demanded it. Like everyone I ended up working for was in Cubase. Dave was in Cubase, Joey's in Cubase. Yeah. I think half the reason we're still together is because you're in Cubase. Yeah. If you weren't, if you wanted to switch, <laughs> I would leave you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's, the other thing that I can say is if you work in Logic, if you work in Ableton, if you work in Pro Tools, if you work in Cubase, no one cares if your work is good. Like, that is just the fact. Yeah. yeah. Like, literally not a single person has ever been like, hey, do you have Pro Tools? <laughs> like, no one. <laughs> And no one's been like, I just want to make sure you work on Cubase. It's it's Dude, that it's only online. It's so yeah. it's like sometimes uh, when I'm weaker, like on my weaker days, it really pisses me off when people argue about it. Because yeah. literally never in my life, in a professional situation, you're right. I have never heard anybody give yeah. two shits about what DAW anybody works in unless. They work in some oddball DAW like Mixcraft or something. If you work, yeah. If you Digital work in a performer. if you work in a DAW that's not transferable, then yeah, that's bad. But all the main ones that everyone uses are all transferable. If you can adjust the volume, add EQ, and add compression, then your DAW is great. Like if you, that means you can mix a record. Like that's really what it comes down to. I've never lost a job or not gotten a job because I worked on Cubase or so didn't work on. Someone right here says they have gotten shit for working in Logic. And I'm going to just tell him that it was probably from... It's probably because you tried to edit in it. Well, probably from unprofessional people, too. Yeah. Probably from, uh, yeah. A lot, of, a lot of people that I know out here in L.A. and outside of the metal and rock world only use Logic. Like, Logic is... It's awesome for composing. Especially. Yeah, Logic is so much more used in, in hip-hop and yeah. especially, you know... Um, like dance stuff. I mean, I know Ableton is for sure like the winner now and dance a lot, but um, Logic is just as good as... Logic is much better than Cubase for like hip-hop and dance. And then Cubase, I think, is better than Pro Tools in other ways. It's, it's like we said, none of them are perfect, and they all do something really well, which is why they're successful. Yeah. I think it's important to not get bogged down on like a tool or like just being able to run with whatever shit is thrown at you yeah. is realistically going to be your most valuable like resource as an engineer to work with no context, not the gear you were used to and probably not a situation you're super comfortable in. Um, yeah. If you can run with that, then you'll be fine in any studio. It's, it's the same, it's the same thought that Joey and I were talking about yesterday about how Anytime I have the chance to buy some really nice gear, anytime he had the chance to buy some really nice gear, it always came back to, does the gear matter or should I just learn what I have and learn how to use it better? Which one's going to maximize my success as a, as a mixer or a songwriter or a producer? And so my, my setup is very, very humble. It's very lean and it's very good at what it does you know I, I didn't buy necessarily cheap stuff but that's because I've been really blessed and fortunate to be able to save up and, and afford a few things but I don't have a lavish lavish um, setup that is never getting used and I think if you're focusing on learning what the difference between 3k and 4k is and you're focused on learning what the balance relationships are between that you really don't need to buy any gear if you can just focus on that, you know, past a certain point. And when you focus on that, you'll start getting more projects and you'll be able to afford nicer gear. So it's this funny, like, positive catch-22 is if you focus on the craft and you focus on what is going to actually make the product great, you'll probably end up being able to buy those things that you wish you could buy right then. So... That's th very, very true. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so continuing on with... 
your it, setup. Top down mixing. Um, top down, yeah. So yeah, um, it comes from wanting to have access to like every individual part of a mix wherever you need it. Like I would find, I would read techniques of like, oh, sidechain this to that um, to be able to control a certain thing, like vocals to your instrument bus. And I would go to try it and I'd think like, oh crap, I have to reset up like eight things in my mix to be able to try that one technique. And realize that if I route it out in the right way, one, it makes me mix a lot faster because I'm dealing with fewer faders. Like you're dealing with groups, not individual instrument tracks. Mm -hmm. And two, if you ever need to hear that one part or affect that one part, you have it right there. So from the very top, and I've got it hidden, we've got our stereo out. It's just like the Cubase stereo out. There's nothing on, why are you over there? There's nothing on it at no, all. Get over here. And then the thing that feeds that first is a bus we need to rename. It's called Fake Mass. It's a fake master channel. Uh, this pl bus always has two plugins. So I'm gonna add them now. Um, it's a BX Hybrid 2.0. And we do two things in this. That's a scary looking plugin. Totally, because it's 32 bit, so it takes over your whole screen. And you can buy the UA version that's. UA is my favorite plugins for sure, and they make a version of this now that we should probably update to. But again, you don't have to buy, you don't have to go spend money if you just learn how to use what's there. Yeah. And so th what this is doing is um, making everything mono below like 80 hertz, and then a little stereo width. Um, We'll end up automating the stereo width in the song a lot of times. So, like, if there's um, like a big chorus, yeah, make the chorus a little bit wider than the verses. Just open things up a little. Or if there's like a down kind of quiet bridge, you don't need that to be wide. You kind of want to focus that in. It comes back to the emotion. If it's supposed to feel like a little more personal and a little bit more intimate, then you you might even dial it back to like. 90, like actually suck it in a bit, mm -hmm. so that when the last chorus comes back, it goes out a relative 30%, but it's all within the same region, so you're not... I think those stereo whiners can really destroy a mix when you go, when you go, you can pretty much just dial it and hear how bad it can get, but if you use it like that, it can become a really um, effective tool for impact. Yep, the next one we stick on is just Pro-L. Um, we usually just like default add a gain of volume. This keeps things from clipping. Um, we don't feed this super hot, so like when we're ready to print for mastering, we can drop that and it's ready to go. We usually leave the stereo width on in the master, which is why I said we need to like rename this channel because it's not really a fake master. It ends up being our second two bus almost. I was actually going to ask you about that. It seems like the the stuff that you did with the BX you would want to keep exactly before sending to the mastering guy. Yeah, and that's something that sometimes we'll just tell them, like, hey, we didn't have this on it. If you want to add it, yeah, go for it. And sometimes, like, we just finished um, a mix for We Came As Romans, and I, t I talked to the mastering engineer, and he has, a, like, a really expensive version of it. So I was like, okay, I'm going to take mine off. Let's let you do it. Um, so in that, in that case, we mm -hmm. took it off. But, yeah, you know, if yeah. it's something like that, you're going to want to have it. Yep. Uh, the next channel is going to be our, our two bus, so like the thing that you're used to. Um, and this one has become like a perfect marriage of, what is it called? Um, Multi precision. Precision multi -man. that's right. It's been like a marriage of the two bus that I've used for a while and a two bus that Drew has used for a while. Um, it's at the bottom. This is my, you. from the first time I ever had UA plugins, this is the sing this sounds like a plug. I wish I was endorsed by UA. This is the <laughs> single best plugin I ever bought for my two bust because it's you can go ahead and put like whatever the, what was the Oh no, the I have it loaded up as the okay. like our default instance of this plugin is our two bus setting for it. Yeah. So it's like when it's we actually play pretty it even across the whole spectrum. It's just it's so adding great. a little bit of gain. But it's so great. You can see the input level is pushed to two, so it's like forcing the compressor to work a little bit more. Yeah. What plugin is that again? This just is the UAD uh, multiband comp. It's just their version yeah. of a multiband comp, like a C4 or C6 from Waves. Mm. And um, I just got I got it at a point in my mixing career where <laughs> it just felt great. <laughs> it just felt like, oh my God, this makes me sound better. So, you know, if there was one single-handed plug-in that I truly have loved over the last six, seven years is probably this one. So that one goes on first. The next one is um, the VBC Rack plug-in. Um, and I remember when I came on board, Drew was really big on the RED compressor, which I like a lot. And what, that's why it has like the CLA Rock edited preset. Yeah. So this is where we started from on the RED. Um, 
I r love just SSL style compression on a bus. Um, that's what I learned mixing through and what I just like mixing through. So ended up having that as the primary compressor, but then the red is used mostly for its drive knob. It has just some really cool like smearing and saturation, a totally like a CLA ripoff trick. Um, and then the last one, this like, I believe it's a Fairchild. Yeah. Um, it's, All right, it looks like it's, no, it's pulled from a, like a very, like a manly very, very new. new. Yeah. yeah. Um, I like this one with a little bit of the mix on because, and I'll show you when we get the tracks mixed, I'll roll back the, the mix to like 100%. It does a thing where it sucks in the low mid range in a way that tightens up like every mix I've put it on in a really, really pleasant way just at the end a little bit. So we're only kissing it like maybe half a decibel, a decibel of gain reduction at a time. One with, small kiss. Yeah, pretty much. A kiss from a rose. Um, next one, tons of people do this one. It's just your Poltec EQ. So you have all these set now to defaults from the way that we had them. Oh, I've had that for a while. That's great. That makes me way faster. <laughs> yeah. So Cubase, you can so set. Can you what you? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Could you please explain so that to me? So with Cubase, uh, you can set just. You, and you can do this with every DAW. I'm pretty sure is you can save your current settings as the default preset when you uh -huh. instantiate the plugin. So like on all the wave stuff, I turn all the stupid analog modeling off because it's just noise. Um, it took me uh, about a year to realize that that's where all my noise floor was coming from. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of records out there that have that's those on. That's a lot of us. <laughs> it took yeah. a while to figure that out. Um, so the Pultec is just like a really gentle smile in the EQ. Um, I remember on this record, we wanted the low end compressed a little bit more. So the Pultec has this like boost and attenuation that you can kind of use like a, e you can EQ it into a compressed state almost. Um, so we just tucked a little bit on the low end and boosted more than we usually would. Um, you notice that's like 30 hertz and 16K, so it's it's beyond what you're really focusing on and it's more about feeling it. It's like if you if your dog loves a mirror, then you want to make sure the 16 to 20K range is, <laughs> is coming through well. Exactly. You know, so that they can hear the intensity. <laughs> and then the last one that we stick on, um, yeah, it's still called Virtual Tape Machines. Uh, the Slate Tape um, Emulator. Just sounds really good, it's strapped across a two bus. Makes it sound more like a record, so to speak. More buzzwords and stuff like that. I don't know. I've, I've used it for a while. I really like it. Yeah, they're, the people at Slate are great. Yeah. They were, um, I used their stuff really, really early on as well. I actually, the first drum samples I got, I bought the Slate CDs that oh, they mailed those. to me. Yeah, they had like a sticker over the box yeah, from they, the old product. It was very yeah. early in the Slate days, and and uh, obviously as as they grew and I grew, it was great, and they we ended up collaborating, and they gave us a lot of these plugins, and we use them all the time, and they're fantastic. Yeah. And they don't. It's not that any of them do a ton of stuff. It's that it's that puzzle building thing. It's like after a few small things from all of them, they really do help. Yeah. Especially when you're mixing in the box. It's very true. Uh, so yeah. That's our two bus, and you can see we've already got a little bit of flutter from the noise floor happening. Love that. Um, it just happens. Cool. So feeding our two bus is going to be two additional channels, and I refer to this stack of four as like our main parent groups. The inst the inst bus is just an instrument group, and I left the plugin on here because it's literally always on here. It's Fab Filters Pro MB. This is exactly what it sounds like. It's the instrumental bus, so all of the instruments get sent here. Um, and the thing I have on here, which we'll play with later, is just a side-chained uh, multi-band compressor on the entire instrument bus. It's slated from like 1.5 to 5, so like the cymbal, guitar, thrashy stuff. And I'll play with this in the mix and like judge where it's um, where it's going most. I love the Fab Filter plugins in general, but like the ability to solo just that range and hear where the vocal is crashing with the rest of the mix. Um, it's super nice. I'm only ducking like maybe uh, two to three decibels max in that range when the vocals are playing, and it's dynamic with the loudness of the vocals. Um, really helps get your center um, channel cleared up. So it's something. Is it something where like you're you're moving that? Yeah. Based on like the the timbre of the vocalist. So like Frankie's, it probably goes a little bit to the left. But if we have like a higher singer like Kyle from We Car, it goes mm -hmm. a little more to the right. Is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah, so it, well, it depends on like where the, the or where their frequency resonation. for the cymbals are based. Oh. So like where the cymbals and the guitars meet tends to be really clashy with vocals. So I'm going to want to cut out a little bit there. I'm lazy and don't want to automate that, mm -hmm. so I mm -hmm. side chain it to the vocal channel, which is why I have this separate vocal channel. So the vocal channel, you can see 
I'll send it here to the instrument pro MB. And then this will just feed that and consistently duck the volume on it. Oh, crazy. Do that in a couple of places. Yeah, I would love to hear an example of that. Um, let me hide the audio track so we're just looking at the group tracks. I do this a lot. I change my views a lot. And Drew and I use completely different like Cubase settings. So we're bouncing back and forth between those and key commands, which is really funny. Yeah, um, Jeff had to make two presets of key commands and preferences so that we could make records together. Yeah, so if we go to key commands, <laughs> there's Jeff Dunn and there's Wizard Blood. <laughs> and then if we go to preferences, same thing. Yep. So it's super easy to switch back and forth between the two. I'm pretty sure in the next version of Cubase they announced that they actually have a user profile concept, which like, maybe I need credit for that idea. But, yeah. But I'm definitely going to use it. Um, cool. So we're looking at groups. Um, Feeding the instrument bus, uh, that actually starts getting into like the rest of the the track mixing. So I don't know how far deep we want to get into that. Yeah, I guess we'll um, save we'll save that. I'm just I just I'm interested to hear how you find that. Find the find the relationship between the vocal and the cymbals and the bass that you were talking about, sweeping it. Oh, we'll get to that. That's yeah. like a final touch. I'm thing. excited for and that. And there's one more piece on the two bus that I haven't put on yet. There are a few people who know what this is. I'll put it on at the end. It's really funny. Um, and it looks like it's totally breaking the rules, but it makes the whole mix sound better. Um, and then, yeah, so feeding our instrument channel, we've got parent groups for drums, bass, guitars, leads, Vox Master, and production. Um, super cool in Cubase these days, you can go in and see what sources are from the tracks. So you can see um, Vox Master and Vox should not be feeding this bus. So I will adjust that. Oh no, that's going in. Did I look at the two bus? No, no, you were looking at the instrument bus. So yeah, so we just need to take those off of there. Get those out of there. Oh, it's because it's got a send to it. That's why. Oh, okay. I'm confusing myself with Cubase. Cool. So yeah, we've got just parent instrument groups. Um, some of those are fed by other subgroups. Um, but realistically, we've just got like what you would have as a traditional VCA channel set. And that means when we're viewing the mixer, usually in the we the setup that I keep is audio channels hidden in the mixer and group channels visible. So that way when I'm dealing with drums, I've got drums, kick, snare, tom, cymbal group, room group, bass, bass auto. Some of these groups show up because we're using like trigger on a group track. Um, so yeah, these will usually get loaded into the session with some plugins already on them. Um, like starting points. Yeah. Save a little bit of time. I think most people have at least starting templates or starting points and, you know. Yeah, exactly. Um, so on the drums, I think at this point it might be good to just play the unmixed audio yeah. for the drums. All right, so we're going to play the drums in full eight times <laughs> <laughs> so you can really get a grasp of it. <laughs> First one, literally because I was too lazy to set up a parallel compression bus on this record, and because the Slate 1176 has a mix knob. Um, so yeah, normally... I mean, that's what the mix knob's for. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. yeah so in this case... It's not lazy, it's efficient. There you go. Thank you. Um, so that's just parallel compression on it. Uh, we had a Pro L in here. I think it's just adding gain straight up. So it's a little bit like when people stick L1 at the end of a thing. We're yeah. just adding a little bit of gain. Um, I think that was mostly to balance it with the rest of the stuff as we had brought it in. Um, and the last one, I'm gonna leave that off for a bit, but we have this Oceanway Studios that is like really low mixed, but it adds, I'll yeah. just play it. Yeah. Mostly, I find around like the symbols is yeah. that it softens everything. Yeah, bit. it's 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 so subtle <laughs> that um, you could probably leave it off if you want. But 
uh, you know, it's one of those things that I enjoy doing, and I think it adds just like that two inch, two percent different on the symbols and overall vibe. Yeah, there's sometimes where you're like, you're at a mix and you've been going at it for a while. And you're like, how do I make this sound just two percent better? Yeah. So you start just throwing little things at it, and like one of those happens to be like yeah. making the drum sound bigger in general. Like that yeah. would be a cool thing to do. Ocean Way kind of helps with that. Yeah. Um, on this one, we also have a separate drum bus. Um, this would have been what we were monitoring on like the contact group that was coming out. Um, and I don't remember actually why we have these separate. In well, normal and, terms, well this, be... this is basically would be the drum auto. Because, yeah. yeah, so, so that's so, another thing to mention. You... Yeah, so he, he basically sets up, or, and I think I did it too beforehand. We have one, the top one that's drums in all caps is kind of the end all be all for whatever that section is, whether it be drums or whether it be vocals, whether it be bass. And that one doesn't get any automation. It's just simply for uh, plugins and it's simply for like finite levels. And then under it, we have usually, right now it's called drum bus, but it would usually be called drum auto. And that's why I do all the automation. And we don't really do too, too much like in terms of like finite things. No, snare automation is usually more on the, the like the close mics and the room group. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think what's worth mentioning there is like that's just another workflow thing, having those two tracks. I think everyone's gotten to a point where you're like, oh, I need the guitars to go up one dB, but I've already done a ton of automation. Now I have to click and highlight across this entire track to change one part. Yeah, it's Whereas, efficiency. Yeah, we just like, no, I want to reach for one fader, move it a little bit, and yeah. we're done. Um, again, it's very much like having a VCA group, but I know Cubase does have VCAs <laughs> now, but I can't be tasked to learn setting that up when I've got no, a working you. system. Yeah, no, thank um, you. Yeah, so we've got that one, and I'll instantiate those ones as we go as well. So C4 multiband. Gentle multiband compression, a little bit of a smile in the EQ. Um, and again, these are just your starting points. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In this case, um, these are pretty close to what ended yeah, up in, on it. Yeah, in this case, what the stuff that we brought here to Sphere is closer to what we have dialed in. So, like, as we go through the parts, we can show, like, why we chose this. But these are almost always the starting point plugins. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and for folks mad that we're not mixing from scratch, none of the tracks have plugins, so we're going to get there. Yeah. So, like, the individual ones have it. Yeah. Um, and the last one, I like this one a lot on the drum bus. It's just that um, Fairchild 670. A little bit more consistent, a little harder, like in the overall sound. Um, helps it kind of cut through. Just really helps the, the, the drum sound big and present in the mix and consistent. One, one of the big things I noticed when I was starting to learn how to mix drums is that I would reach for one plug-in and just crank it and like really want it to do everything for me, whether it yeah. be like I really wanted the snare drum. You know, I wanted my snare drum when I was making those heavy records to sound like Joey's and I was like, okay, I'm just going to find the one plug-in and I'm just going to crank it and it would never sound right. And so for me, and you can tell here, a lot of the plugins we're using are stacked, kind of doing just little bits and they're kind of making this little power team that ends up doing a lot. But the, I think there's something that I always enjoy about like taking it incrementally versus taking just like, it would be easy to just take one Fairchild and turn the limiter and the C4 off and just try to go for it. But I think you'll find that you have more maneuverability and you can really dial it in better when you let each plugin just do like a little bit of the work and kind of stack them together. Yeah, and that was a super interesting thing for me to get used to because I came from a school where I would come into the session and like, what the fuck are you doing? Why do you have four compressors across this drum track? And like, yeah. I remember there was a point in time where I'd come into Drew's session and be like, I'm taking that off and that off and that yeah. off. And then like, wait, but no, they all sound better. Um, most of them at least. Yeah, so, and that was just a personal thing for me. Yeah. And you know, and if you can find one plugin that gets you to the finish line, kudos. Like you're better than I was when I was starting, that's for sure. I just yeah. kept finding little things that did little bits that I liked. So I ended up having the weirdest stacks like that. I mean a C four into a limiter into a stereo comp is strange, but Which then goes into a compressor and another then, limiter. Yeah. But they're all doing like zero to three you know, amount of amounts of the work. So mm -hmm. it's not like it's compressing negative, you know, 30. Yep. Cool. So that's like our parent drum group. So I'm going to hide that for now. Um, the next one moving on to that would be feeding this would be our bass group. And the bass group starts with um, limiter, pin that shit in place, um, Pro MB, 
is this one is literally just um, pinning down this like weird 100 to 200 range in the bass. Uh, if we play this DI. Really represented of it because we do one thing with the, I'm gonna build out the bass tone later. Um, like the curve won't move the same as you're seeing here. Um, you'll notice this one also has a side chain enabled and it's for this band down here. Um, on that front, so one thing that I always have a problem with is balancing kick and bass low end. And we have heard that that was a challenge on this yeah. song, as yes. I would imagine, because mm -hmm. there's a lot of a lot of importance in both of those things, and a lot of them are, are fighting. Yeah, and so a trick I learned a while ago, and very, very common, is just to side chain your kick track to a multiband compressor on the bass to duck it, um, just in the low end. So like sub, what is it, 100? 120 or something. Yeah, sub 120, it's getting ducked every time the kick hits. It's only by like two, three dB, but it really helps. So you have it side chained just to the blue section? Yes, well I think it side chains it to the entire thing, okay. but, but you can control within it whether you're reading from the external ah. setting or from the internal one. So cool. that one's set for the external. Oh, cool. So like the, the bass side chain, bass kick side chain and vocal instrument side chain exists on all of our sessions. Yeah, and it's been like one of the biggest things to just get everything quicker. Um, yeah, so basically the, the thought is, um, what you're saying is it's just every time the kick hits, it's just bringing down the bass some, right? And that low, that low range, just enough, because it's just such a split second move yeah. that you want the bass to get right back in there. And then this one, I'll turn off to turn back on at the end. This was just a surgical EQ um, in the bass track. We ducked a little 210. There's a ringing frequency there. Um, so that's our bass. Uh, again, we've got our bass auto group. So this is where we do our automation. This one has a little bit of EQ, just killing super low, super high end. Um, Sun EQ, this one I never touch. Yeah, I never touched this one either. I think this was actually from Kyle O'Dell, my old engineer, and I just never took it off. Like I always just liked what it did. Yeah. So that's that. I think it's, it. I think it's more yeah. smile EQ, a little bit of top end, a little <laughs> yeah. bit of low end. Um, LA3A is one of my favorite compressors for just nailing down um, anything almost. Um, string instruments especially, it does cool things to the pick attack when you dig in. Um, so you'll see that make a return on the guitar bus as well. And then because we're insecure about our low end and we just want to add more at all times, we throw in our bass. Um, <laughs> yeah. A lot of times like you just need an extra sub support from something um, and this is a nice way to add a little bit of fullness. Um, it'll either be like our bass or max bass depending yeah. on which like whether we need more harmonics or not. I think those plugins are great when used in sparingly, like in terms of the amount, mm -hmm. and they have also destroyed some of my mixes when they are too loud. That's very true. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So that is our bass group. Let's fold these up. Uh, rhythm guitars. So rhythm guitars, here you're just going to be hearing the raw, uh, the tracks were from the Kemper we used. Um, in this case, it was a profile of a JCM 800 with one of those Soldano hot mod tubes in the preamp, and then a Mesa Cab 57 API preamp. Pretty standard for people who have been like hanging on this neat forum trying to get that tone for a while. And the funny thing about these guitar tracks is, I, if you saw, I think I put it in one of the questionnaires that Al sent me, is that we were two days from being done, and Josh and I decided that we, he had brought in a lot of these things, so we had kind of uh, kept some of his stuff and re-recorded some of it. We realized that we had so much time, because everything had gone so swimmingly, that he re-recorded the entire album in four hours. And he played it so tight. He played it so tight, he said, I don't want you to edit these, I just want to play it tight to where it's done. In four hours. Yeah. yeah. So I was like, ah, uh, yeah, okay, sounds good. So the whole record, was recorded on guitars, and it's the only stuff that's edited is like Look you can this. see. Yeah, we're not chopping out the silence yeah. on the guitar tracks. Literally, so that's one thing that's super funny to me on this record is that if someone had sent me these tracks, I would have been a little angry, just because like they hadn't done their due diligence of cleaning the breakdowns. But this yeah. turned out to sound fucking sweet. Yeah, and the thing about Josh obviously is that he's just the most 
the most talented right hand metal player I've ever worked with. So, you know, he did the whole record in four hours and he played it edited, basically. And you'll hear parts on the record that are specifically like chopped to be like in and out, like smoky and a few other spots. But you can see by that, like in general, this is literally Josh playing. Yeah. So yeah, we just wanted his hand and I I remember the process for this is really common for me with choosing guitar tones is we'll use like whatever amp sim we use to track or like the tracking tone through a lot of the mixing because we're building a lot of the other instruments. You'll see when we start doing balances, I start with drums and then bring in vocals, then bass, then production. Guitar comes in last for me. Um, Kind of because I'm a guitarist and I've always had that bias of like they're too loud. So to get away from that, I mix them last. Um, but in this instance, what it lets me do is fire up the Kemper, reamp the DI in real time, and listen to the other instruments in a mostly mixed state and pick the guitar tone so that I'm doing less EQ and less stuff in this. We ended up doing a fair amount of processing on these tracks just to get them um, a little more over the top. But what we were looking for in this tone was something super, super squishy in the pick attack um, and something that had like a, sounded like the strings were bouncing back at you, almost like he's playing a rubber band. So Also, it should be noted that this record was basically mixed when he re-recorded the guitars. So when Jeff was reamping, I remember you guys were going through, we have a, a ton of different uh, profiles that we've made through our Kemper and we were playing the otherwise mixed song and Jeff was just turning it and we were seeing which one was fitting in the leftover space for the guitar. Yeah. So when you listen to these guitar tracks by themselves, they're, a, they're pretty strange. Like they don't really sound to me. I, I remember Josh and Jeff and I laughing, we're like, this sounds terrible by itself. And then you would just unmute it and you're like, this sounds perfect in the mix. Yeah. And so that's one thing to, to remember is don't ever rely on what things sound like solo, like whether it be a snare drum or a kick drum. It's always about where it sits sonically, you know, in the in the spectrum. Yeah, like and, there's gonna be some nerd on YouTube who talks about it, but realistically no one cares about how your individual snare drum sounds because they're never going to hear it in that context. No, and also the the tones that you love on records that you love, they sound that way because of everything else around it. So say you love a snare drum, like say you love these guitar tracks and, and you had never heard them soloed, you would never think they sound like that. So it's tough to listen to a song and just try to emulate it by itself. You always have to do it in relation. Yeah, so that's raw guitars. You can hear like the messiness inside. I end up liking it. I think it I, that that comes back to the energy. For me, it makes the Emir record a little dirtier, a little grungier, a little like more abrasive and, and that that was the lens. So that was one of those choices where do for this band do I make it super chopped? Do I make it super clean? And the answer was no in most places. It was I want it to be like I want it to be a little grimier. I want it to to like scratch you a little bit more on the skin. Yeah. So this one we've got it a little bit reversed. And I think what happened here was I was actually running the reamp bus into the bus I had the reamp tracks I was monitoring on was also routed into the parent guitar bus, which had effects on it. So that's why you have this stacking effect here. Um, if we go into the normal guitar bus, the first plugin that we've got on here, and this is pretty standard, is just our uh, Pro Q2. The ones that start off from the get go are going to be like a high pass at 80 and a low pass around 13. Super standard on heavy guitars, you just want the hair yeah. and the woofiness out. Um, and then in this one, we've got the classic 3.7 to 4.2 dip, um, a little bit of top end added and then a little bit of a dip around the low mids. And then there was some ringing frequencies after we had um, like preamped and stuff uh, that were conflicting with the bass here. So I'm gonna turn this on and off and we'll hear. <laughs> cabinet woofiness. One thing you'll notice is I try not to have the like EQ plugin set to like the crazy max resolution just because I know that when I'm tweaking it, it makes me go way further than I intended to. So I try to keep it around the 612 dB range. That's cool. Just kind of influence yourself into 
more gentle moves. It's really easy to go overboard with EQ in the digital world. Also, one thing that Jeff and I do that we never really talk about is we always do deductive EQing. Very, very rarely are we just only boosting stuff. We're almost always pulling out what we want. It's like you should don't think about it. Yeah, it's it's funny. It's there's usually two schools of thought, and neither of them are wrong. It's just you can tell whether it be we like to use multi-band compression to to pull things down, or we like to take things out. There's two ways to go. If you hear something that you don't like, you can add something somewhere else, or you can take away something, and, and we always use deductive EQing. Uh, anyone who is from the Snape Farm remembers this, just C4 on the low mids. It really helps on uh, palm mutes especially. Since this record is entirely made of palm mutes. It what does it sound like without it real quick? Oh, let's, let's get to a... Yeah, if you if you watch the compression, it kind of looks like a kick drum because on this song the chugs and the kicks are very aligned, so you can tell it's really only compressing when Josh's hand is going down on the chugs. Mm -hmm. And then the EQ that I have used forever on guitar, I love the top end on this thing, and I remember finding out that you use the same stuff, so it was like yeah, yeah, it the API Waves EQ sounds really sweet for adding top end. Um, so if we listen there. So in this case, we're only adding um, from five up, a little yeah. shelf. Yeah. Um, analog stuff is turned off. For always. It's also, I think that EQ is great on guitars. We On the, the mix we just finished this week, we had to uh, kind of cut some of the low mids out of the guitars in some sections, mm -hmm. and it also does a great job there. I, I think it's smart when you're mixing to, instead of always having something like a GEQ 30 where you can just choose any frequency at any level, I like having to be boxed in a little bit because it makes it it makes you kind of commit in a way like to just go for something or to pull something out here and then adapt and move on if you have too many options that's where i think mixing gets really challenging yeah and that's part of why like we've paired the we talked about pairing tracks down before production and bringing them in like i don't want to have to deal with live midi tracks in a mix i don't want to have to deal with yeah. multiple tick tracks i just want like one. Something locked in. Yeah. It's funny you say that about GEQ 30 though, because it is on the bus where we did some of the automation effects. Yeah. Um, so we'll go into that as we get into them, as they get added, because a lot of those were added, you can see, um, for automated effects, the metal flanger in particular. A lot of people were asking about, like, oh, where did the flanger on it come from? They weren't in the guitars. So we did it with just a Waves plugin. Yeah, they're automated. So, question for you guys. Um, mind if uh, we do a little QA here? Yeah and then uh, come back to the rest of the top-down setup. Totally. Yeah. Cool, because we've got quite a few questions here. Oh, yeah, I'll see the time, too. Yeah. Um, people probably need to piss as well. <laughs> so here's a question. What are the advantages, this is from Tyler Wright, what are the advantages to throwing trigger onto a group instead of individual tracks? Uh, uh, because you can send to a group in Cubase. So it, it what it gives me is a single fader that has that sample on it. So when we're looking at how the drums are routed in here, um, like the snare top mic, uh, if I hadn't printed it, oh no, that, that was from it. There's no live trigger on the snare on this record. That makes more sense. So the kick sample in this case is fed by the kick drum. Um, the output is straight to the kick sample. So that means when I'm on here, I get just a single fader. It's nice when you've got like your real snare mics adjacent to sample tracks. Um, I can adjust my real snare versus a sample without having to worry about like the mix knob inside of Trigger. Oh yeah, that's uh, cool. The other thing is that um, Trigger doesn't have multi out. So if you want to get like a room mic separate from the shell mics, you run multiple instances of them and then you get a fader for each. Hmm. Very nice. So Geo Hugh is wondering, is the reason for splitting the mix into an instrumental bus and a vocal bus, is that for printing stems or compressing them differently or other reasons or all the above? I, I think it's because, like he was saying, we, we, well, for me, when I'm when I'm mixing, there's a lot of times where I'm like, ugh, I kind of need all the vocals up half a dB. So I'm yeah. just like, oop, doop, done, like backing, harmonies, all the automation, all the reverb swells, all the delays, is literally everything's done in two seconds. Because you can imagine doing an entire mix and having to just to think about that and be like, <sighs> it's gonna take five minutes, which five minutes doesn't sound like a lot, but it is when you're working on a mix, 
to just turn everything up half a dB. So I think it's one of those, one of those uh, efficient things. And then also he has, um, yeah, this thing going on. You take over for that. Yeah, it's just, uh, for me, I started it because I wanted to be able to route the entire vocal into the entire instrument bus for this purposes, or for the, the purposes of multiband compression on the instrument bus. Um, it works out really nicely that when we're getting ready to bounce tracks, that like we can just do channel batch export group channels, and suddenly we've got your instrumental mix, your acapella mix, yeah. your two bus mix, your drum stem, your whatever you need right there. Yeah, I mean that's fantastic. When you're when you're delivering records to a label, they're gonna want um, they're gonna want the main ones. Then they're gonna want vocal up usually, like a DB up in case any of them go to radio, then they're going to want acapellas, then they're going to want instrumentals, and then they're going to want the stems or the files from everything. So when you start to have to do that and after the first few times of realizing how soul-sucking it is, you kind of develop these little tricks that take far less time. So it's a little bit of all that put together. Yeah, I see a lot of guys post like complaints about bands hitting them up for stems, and like I totally understand that's a pain in the ass, but okay. I also know that it's just part of the job. Over it. Yeah, like you yeah. shouldn't be expecting yeah. that you're gonna have to print stem. Like, yeah. is the band going to play these songs live? If so, they probably want stems, so you should plan for that in advance. Also, if you want your recordings to be heard, yes, in the way that you put the time and effort you should not really care too much about that. Sure, it sucks, but just throw Game of Thrones on and, and watch it on Netflix while you export stems. Yeah. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, the, the That's one, what I'm doing right the now. The one I actually, uh, Chrome Remote Desktop, <laughs> I have tuned bass from abroad before from your studio because we didn't have a yeah. plug-in on it. I used Chrome Remote Desktop to open up my rig, tune the bass, send it back through Dropbox. Yeah. And so, like, you can, there's a lot of stuff you can yeah. do. But I think the the biggest thing that I noticed when Jeff introduced Jeff introduced the instrumental and vocal thing, which was great when he started working on my records, and I noticed that it was great because one, it was giving the vocals a little more room because of the the compression he was doing that was that the vocals being sent to the instrument bus, and then two, I noticed very definitive advantages by being able to. Um, either automate the vocals or just turn them up or down. Because sometimes at the end of the mix, you're like, okay, I'm ready to print, and you listen once, you're like, <sighs> I just need it up like half a dB. Yep. So it just makes it easy. So here's one from John Agnew. Where do you guys find FX for things like the ticks? What are you using for them? FX? Uh, the production effects, like the post-production. The ticks uh, and the... Oh, um, can you go and... down to them? And I'll try to think. I, a lot of the time, for me, I think production can be uh, basically, you can do production very bland and boring by just using stock versions of whatever you have to work with, whether it be stock Cubase stuff or whether it be stock Logic stuff or whether it be stock anything. So for me, I don't mind starting with things like uh, Groove Agent in Cubase, and then I have Sound Toys stuff, whether it be Decapitator, or whether it be uh, any of the other stuff that sound toys make and I'm always just taking things and and turning them and trying to make them something that no one else can get and you know I think we've all heard tons of the same you know whether it be samples or whether it be the same production stuff whether it be massive damage this stuff and we, those are all great tools but I think if you just spend time and you shape them and you turn them even five percent then they become a little more like ear candy and they become a little more unique and you kind of just take it and run with it so I think these are probably all coming from this is Groove Agent. This is Groove Tips. Agent. Also, one thing that I think with ticks is that you don't just want to have straight eighth notes or fourth notes or sixteenth notes. My friend who more or less only works in pop and, and hip hop, uh, but came from the metal and rock world, was like, ticks are the, the rap world's breakdown beats. So I always try to treat ticks like they're breakdowns. So if you play it, it just sounds like a double kick idea yeah. and what's funny is that if you look at the grid you'll notice that this is not on the grid yeah um, and i will push it back yeah it's that and we've got doubler two running so if we heard this coming out of the the sampler it would have been a mono centered track which is going to be a nightmare with your vocals and you're kicking your snare mm -hmm. so uh we'll throw and i can throw it's our default setting for waves doubler two yep um it's just the center track muted so you're making a fake left and right channel probably sounds awesome in mono. Um, and then it would have had decapitator distorting a little bit and then a giant sucking 
thing right here. Yeah, because there's no information in the low end to cut anyways. So you just take all that out and yeah. then, yeah. Basically use it like I'm in Decapitated or in Meshuggah and just make little rhythmic patterns that I think catch your ear a little bit more. Who doesn't love clap? Yeah, I think my first introduction to this kind of stuff was uh, downloading those Paramore Crush stems that were on the Guitar Pro multi-tracks that if people remember those, and hearing like all kinds of 808s and like backing drum beats and yeah. loops and. I mean, I think when you hear, even just now hearing that, my head was just like this. Yeah. You know, I think when you hear that, it's got this innate groove to it. And, you know, that's what you want, is for people to react to music. So all of these little things are playing into, like, the vibe. This song's very um, bragging. This song's very, like, um, avant-garde for Frankie. He's very, like, boastful. So to me, that's like a hip-hop mentality, because a lot of hip-hop comes from, you know, like boasting and saying like I'm great or I'm this or I'm that and that's what this song is. So that's why I wanted the song to have like a like a kind of like a I mean a definitive hip hop vibe to it. So you can start really anywhere you want. I start with Cubase a lot of the times in terms of ticks. Yeah, and I want to say the most the rest of these like dance kick is probably from Groove Agent. Um, What's distorted pad? So this came from a company that I was obsessed with when I made the Crown of the Empire record, Retrograde, um, called Spitfire. Yeah. And they make the craziest, in my opinion, they make the coolest, craziest, weird uh, sounds. And if you go to their website, I think it's spitfirelabs.com, but you can just Google it and find it. Um, they have everything from just weird sounds to like orchestra to pianos to this or that and I think this is just one of their pads that I had and again I just used a captator I used something and just really messed with it and, and created something that you can't recreate unless you go in and do what I did to it so I think production in my opinion is start anywhere you want and then make it your own to where everyone goes oh, I love that but I don't know how to create it and then that's how you create value as a mixer or a producer is by doing things that other people can't do or haven't done or can't figure out what to do. Great answer. So uh, we're gonna take a 15 minute break now. And uh, when we come back, they're gonna continue with the rest of their top down setup. And uh, we're gonna do the mix poll, reveal the winners and uh, keep going with uh, Amir's Flag of the Beast, the Drew Falk and Jeff Dunn, the uh, July 2017 Nail the Mix. We'll see you guys in 15 minutes. Hey everyone, it's John Brown here and I play with a band called Monuments. Nail the Mix is an online mixing school that gives you access to the sessions from world-class artists and live streaming classes from the producers who mix them. This month I'll be going on Nail the Mix to mix I the Creator by my band Monuments. I mixed the album with some help from E.L. Levy and I'm excited to show you how I mix this. Sign up to Nail the Mix now and you'll get all the raw multi-tracks, the same files that I used on the album and an online mixing class to show you how I did it. I mixed it in my very own home studio a long time ago. The setup I had was a lot more modest than what I have now, and it's very similar to probably what some of you guys have. In fact, some of you guys might have better equipment than what I had at the time. Why am I telling you this? Because that's the point of my class. I know you've heard it a million times already, but it's the ear, not the gear, and that is what I want to show you with my session. I've heard so many of you say, I can't wait to get this piece of gear, I can't wait to get this plug in, I can't wait to get these better monitors. But in actuality, none of that is going to help if you don't train your ear to work with what you've got. It doesn't matter so much what door you're using, what plugins you're using, what monitors you have, or even if your room has great acoustic treatment. What matters is, is that the source material sounds great and that you make the right creative decisions when you sit down to mix it. If you've heard my band, then you know that everyone in the band can play that instrument very, very well. The source material of the drums is recorded great, and especially the vocal performance is absolutely astounding. So here you have all these great raw materials ready for you to make a banging mix with. Banging. This session will prove that there is no reason why you can't get pro level mixes with the setup you have now. Every month on Nail the Mix there is a user judged mix competition where you can compete against your peers 
for real prizes from real companies. This month's sponsor is Line 6. First place will win a Helix Rack and Control, and second place will win a Spider 5 120 Combo Amp with an FBV2 and a G10T wireless transmitter. So if you want to get your hands on this session, access to my mixing class, and see the potential of a modest home studio, then click the link below and I'll see you there. Hey guys, if you're enjoying Nail the Mix, I want to take a second to tell you about how cool URM Enhanced is. Now URM Enhanced is going to take Nail the Mix and just bring it to a completely different level of depth. We got fast tracks, we have an entire library of videos covering everything from hearing compression, gain staging, all of the things that you really, really need to know that we can't explain to you in Nail the Mix in absolute detail, breaking them down into the lowest common denominators. Aside from that, at Enhanced, we have one-on-one -on -one sessions where every month, me, Joey, and Al, we do like an office hours kind of thing and we come in for a couple of hours every week and you guys can sit down with us on Skype one-on-one. -on -one. We can talk about your careers, your mixes, whatever you guys want to talk about. And the third thing we do is once a month we grab one of your songs and we do a mix rescue, which means we sit down like we're doing here and now and nail the mix with one of your songs and your sessions and show you guys how to rescue a mix. So don't take my word for it. Check out what other people have to say about you are If you guys want to fast track your audio game to the next level, head right on over to nailthemix.com slash upgrade and get enhanced. Yo, Drumforge Ultimate Sampler is finally here. Whether you're a songwriter, musician, producer, mixing engineer, or maybe you just love making metal renditions of pop songs on YouTube. Whatever the case, you need a great drum sound. Our sampler is hyper-optimized and lightning fast, so you can spend less time waiting and more time creating. Like, you know, your next cat video sensation. Harness your creativity with our award-winning sample library. Yo, shout out the Pro Tools expert! 60 plus instruments featured on records from bands such as Attila, Machine Head, Vinyl Theater, and many, many more. <laughs> Build your perfect drum kit creatively with a practical approach via the intuitive UI design. Change the engineering setups and select processed or unprocessed samples per microphone for maximum flexibility. Best of all, the mixer combined with powerful built-in DSP modules allows you to fully mix your drum sound from scratch without ever touching another plugin. How about that? Last but not least, it's actually affordable. Click below to learn more. We can all be mean queens We can all feel nothing We can all have big dreams, baby I can't give up my
the slur plugin accomplished a lot of what I was looking for in this specific song. It is very warm and it's subtle and it does have that stereo effect that really gives it an interesting organic feel. We can all have big dreams, baby. I can give up mine. Some days I want to be one of the many. Soar is a new kind of tape delay combining the lush analog tones of tape with the power and flexibility of digital processing. Featuring true analog tape modeled processing, tape control including repeats, age, and flutter, variable 15-30 IPS speed, ground-breaking tape health and contour adjustments, onboard mono and mix controls, and much, much more. With Soar, you'll have more control over your delay than ever before. Download Soar today at joeysturgistones.com. and brings new justice to the tired and worn out warriors. Shaping transience into excellence. Seeking victory with every twist of the knob. DF Trans conquers all who dare to challenge his might. DF Trans, flawless victory. Hey everyone, it's John Brown here and I play with a band called Monuments. Nail the Mix is an online mixing school that gives you access to the sessions from world class artists and live streaming classes from the producers who mix them. This month I'll be going on Nail the Mix to mix I the Creator by my band Monuments. I mixed the album with some help from E.L. Levy and I'm excited to show you how I mix this. Sign up to Nail the Mix now and you'll get all the raw multi-tracks, the same files that I used on the album and an online mixing class to show you how I did it. I mixed it in my very own home studio a long time ago. The setup I had was a lot more modest than what I have now and it's very similar to probably what some of you guys have. In fact, some of you guys might have better equipment than what I had at the time. Why am I telling you this? Because that's the point of my class. I know you've heard it a million times already, but it's the ear, not the gear. And that is what I want to show you with my session. I've heard so many of you say, I can't wait to get this piece of gear. I can't wait to get this plug in. I can't wait to get these better monitors. But in actuality, none of that is going to help if you don't train your ear to work with what you've got. It doesn't matter so much what door you're using, what plugins you're using, what monitors you have, or even if your room has great acoustic treatment. What matters is, is that the source material sounds great and that you make the right creative decisions when you sit down to mix it. If you've heard my band, then you know that everyone in the band can play that instrument very, very well. The source material of the drums is recorded great, and especially the vocal performance is absolutely astounding. So here you have all these great raw materials ready for you to make a banging mix with. Banging. This session will prove that there is no reason why you can't get pro level mixes with the setup you have now. Every month on Nail & Mix there is a user judged mix competition where you can compete against your peers for real prizes from real companies. This month's sponsor is Line 6. First place will win a Helix Rack and Control and second place will win a Spider 5 120 Combo Amp 
with an FBV2 and a G10T wireless transmitter. So if you want to get your hands on this session, access to my mixing class and see the potential of a modest home studio, then click the link below and I'll see you there. Hey guys, if you're enjoying Nail the Mix, I want to take a second to tell you about how cool URM Enhanced is. Now URM Enhanced is going to take Nail the Mix and just bring it to a completely different level of depth. We got fast tracks, we have an entire library of videos covering everything from hearing compression, gain staging, all of the things that you really, really need to know that we can't explain to you in Nail the Mix in absolute detail, breaking them down into the lowest common denominators. Aside from that, at Enhanced, we have one-on-one -on -one sessions where every month, me, Joey, and Al, we do like an office hours kind of thing, and we come in for a couple hours every week, and you guys can sit down with us on Skype one-on-one, -on -one. we can talk about your careers, your mixes, whatever you guys want to talk about. And the third thing we do is once a month we grab one of your songs and we do a mix rescue, which means we sit down like we're doing here and now and nail the mix with one of your songs and your sessions and show you guys how to rescue a mix. So don't take my word for it. Check out what other people have to say about you are enhanced. If you guys want to fast track your audio game to the next level, head right on over to nailthemix.com slash upgrade and get enhanced. Yo, Drumforge Ultimate Sampler is finally here. Whether you're a songwriter, musician, producer, mixing engineer, or maybe you just love making metal renditions of pop songs on YouTube. Whatever the case, you need a great drum sound. Our sampler is hyper optimized and lightning fast, so you can spend less time waiting and more time creating. Like, you know, your next cat video sensation. Harness your creativity with our award-winning sample library. Yo, shout out the Pro Tools expert! 60 plus instruments featured on records from bands such as Attila, Machine Head, Vinyl Theater, and many, many more. <laughs> Build your perfect drum kit creatively with a practical approach via the intuitive UI design. Change the engineering setups and select processed or unprocessed samples per microphone for maximum flexibility. Best of all, the mixer combined with powerful built-in DSP modules allows you to fully mix your drum sound from scratch without ever touching another plugin. How about that? Last but not least, it's actually affordable. Click below to learn more. We can all be mean queens We can all feel nothing We can all have big dreams, baby I can't give up my I think the Soar plugin accomplished a lot of what I was looking for in this specific song. It is very warm and it's subtle and it does have that stereo effect that really gives it an interesting organic feel. 
We can all have big dreams, baby. I can give up mine. Some days I wanna be one of the many. Soar is a new kind of tape delay combining the lush analog tones of tape with the power and flexibility of digital processing. Featuring true analog tape model processing, tape control including repeats, age, and flutter, variable 15-30 IPS speed, groundbreaking tape health and contour adjustments, onboard mono and mix controls, and much much more. With Soar, you'll have more control over your delay than ever before. Download Soar today at joeysturgistones.com. Welcome back to July 2017. Nail the mix with uh, Wizard Blood or Drew Falk, aka Wizard Blood. Jeff Dunn, I'm your Flag of the Beast. I'm Al Levy. To my right is uh, Joey Sturgis, Nick Pilata. To my left is Ben Ecker. And uh, do you go by John or Jay? John Maciel. So got quite a crew here, and uh, I'm gonna let you guys continue. Uh, they were going on top-down mixing, showing how. They set up their mix, and uh, yeah, you were up to guitar effects, right? Yeah. Yes. Thank you for the reminder. Cool. Uh, so I'm going to collapse these all again. Yeah, On um, so we were talking about our rhythm guitar bus. The lead guitar bus is nothing fancy. There's actually nothing on it in this instance. Um, in this track, there was one lead guitar, and if we listen back to it, it was something that Josh had actually brought pre-tracked with his axe effects and something that he had, he liked the effect that was going on on it. I'm remembering that's a total lie. That was a pod farm tone yeah. we really liked. It wasn't yeah. an axe effects. <laughs> yeah, we, we just made it. It was pod farm. Yeah. It's a great tone. Yeah. Yeah, so that's just in there. There's a tiny bit of EQ. I mean, I tend to low cut stuff in general. Yeah, same. Um, yeah. That one was super, super easy. Sometimes, I would say usually when I launch this up, there's an SSL e-channel, um, and it's just box standard channel strip. Just to have in case you need to, you know, add a little something, take a little something out, compress a little something, get a little something. Yeah. It's just like a, a And there's something about that box. SSL EQ that is, like, really musical, especially in the top end. I feel like I could mix a whole song with just that plug-in. Yeah. If I had to, and it would be okay. So the first thing we have is our vocal master track, and this is fed by our three other buses here, which are our vocal main, vocal backup, and uh, effects tracks. So in this case, the effects tracks are like weird interviews and shit chopped out of YouTube and like occulty sounding stuff. And then um, the vocal stack is pretty, pretty simple. On the master bus, um, let's start with the, the vocal main bus instead. So this one you can see... There's not much on it. <laughs> it's pretty stacked, actually. Um, and so one of the reasons it's pretty stacked is that if we go to our individual vocal channel... Not much on it. We're doing, a little, we're doing some compression. Um, but we're basically, like, compressing it. Compressing it more. Uh, this is a little bit of... Um, Lazy compression. And this is like... Yeah, and you can see the range we're keeping it to. It's only going to subtract or add it literally... A D, uh, 2 dB. So I like this as just like a pin it better in place, lets me do less automation. Yeah. Um, this is how you can get around like having to do like per syllable mid verse automation. Yeah, and also with Frankie's vocals, his vocals come in like bricks anyways. So, so this one does, this, yeah, this one makes it even easier, but uh, the vocal writer is a good plug in for, you know, when you have more melodic type singers. Yeah, so I'm gonna kill those. And we'll take a listen to the vocal as it came through um, before I add the bus ch tracks on it. So we'll And also, I should talk about the chain going in. Yeah. So the chain going in was a uh, manly reference mic, which Frankie blew the tube in. And the capsule. We, yeah, he blew the capsule in it. 
because he spit through the filter. He spit through the metal filter I had, through the filter on the mic, and, and got so much condensation on the capsule that it broke. And thankfully, Vintage King gave us a loaner, and we finished the record with that. But it was a manly reference through a, a Brent Avril 1073 with the EQ, um, which I think, in terms of all the 1073 options out there, that one is the closest to the original sound and while still being super reliable. Like you can get the old vintage ones, but they can break at any moment and they get really weird in some spots. And then a lot of companies make 1073s that don't really sound like 1073s. And that one, after my research, um, came out the winner. Through that, it goes um, into a distressor, which I'm pretty sure was at like a 10 to one with a distortion three button in, because I like how, I watched Michael Brower mix one time and he was mixing, um, I think Coldplay. And even he was putting a, the Distortion 3 on Distressor on because he liked how it adds this smooth harmonic distortion to the vocal. So knowing Frankie's voice, I was like, cool, yeah, I just want to like smooth it even more because he's such a crunchy vocalist. Uh, we did that, probably hitting around negative 10, so it was doing a good bit of work. And then I fed that into my gate stay level, which I hit that like negative 20 because that comp in my opinion is the most transparent yet strongest uh coolest vibiest warmest comp i've ever used so i go you know 1073 into a quick i think it was a quick like 1176 type setup on the distressor through a really slow la 2 a type type uh comp doing a lot of work so that's why when these tracks come in you can tell they're um they're very compressed and they're very pretty much where i want them so, yeah, so we'll go through the individual um, effects on the channel as we're mixing. But for the bus, um, like I said, we usually start with this. Let me hide these other buses. Um, we'll start off with SSL channel. Um, and this is just rolling off below about 120. Um, you see, we're giving a boost to 8K, uh, another little boost down closer to 1K. So we've got some body in there. Um, a little more of that mid-range sizzle. Sucking out at 300, just a tiny bit. Um, and that's about it. Yeah, for me, when I'm EQing vocals, the, the blue range is really where a lot of my focus goes because um, I'm usually going a wide sweep, like around 1 to 0.5 in terms of the curve. And then it's between 0.4 and 0.2 where there's a lot of information that I don't personally want in vocals because I kind of want to get either the body of the guitar or the body of the bass or you know some of the res anything in production like lots of pads and stuff I think have a lot of uh, value in, in that range more so than a, a, a vocal um, so for me the the blue range is usually where I'm dialing out a lot of that stuff so you can see it's kind of a broad a broad cut at like 0 0.32 there yeah yeah um, so this will start off with something just on the vocal bus. The other thing is some slight gating. It's really gentle. What more can I possibly say? I've got a blood. It's just kind of eases up on like what can be really, really drastic, like suck-ins or breaths or something like that. They're edited pretty tightly, um, but it's just kind of like a yeah. time saver. I do edit vocals for this record for sure. I edit vocals very tight because I think that's a hip hop type mentality is let the guitars be a bit dirty. That, I guess that's a producer choice is you can choose where you want to push and pull. So for me on the guitars, I wanted them to have a little bit of noise, a little bit of grunge, but then I wanted to balance that with a super clean edited. I get very meticulous on where syllables fall on time. So if you listen to any of the records I make, you'll notice that I, I'm almost always wanting them all to fall right on. Because I want, I want the person that has no rhythm and no timing to be able to hear the song and sing along with it and if it's off a little head or a little behind that just drives me crazy so it's a personal thing so you'll notice that all these vocals are very on time and they're all very edited because that's what i'm paying attention to so i want it to be dead on yeah the last thing on this plugin i'm noticing was on our end we should have turned this analog thing off it is off it was just turned it off yeah Got it. so oh my god you guys fucked up yeah mix is ruined <laughs> uh <laughs> It's over. <laughs> the next one, this is kind of unfair to plug in here, um, 
this ends up getting put in put on at the end of the mix on vocals usually because this is the EAR stands for um, exotic audio research. It's one of the hardware comps we're using here at Sphere. Um, at Drew Studio, we have a TSL three back rack that we strap across the stereo vocal bus or the main vocal bus. Yeah, it sounds. It just awesome. pins it in place. It sounds super smooth, professional. Like so it good. sounds. It makes it sound more like a record. I don't yeah. know other way to put it. Yeah, in terms of talking about not buying gear, that was the 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 N word connections back rack was a stereo limiter that my um, my rep at Vintage King was like, hey, take this, try it. And if you don't like it, just bring it right back. And I took it and tried it. And I was like, this is actually one piece of gear for me that locked in a main vocal that was just basically right in your face. And yeah. it doesn't move. And it's just crank, like the, it's limiting, what, negative 20? It's limiting, yeah, like it's- the meter is weird. It's between 10 and 20. Yeah, it's just going at all times and you would never know. So this is the strangest thing, kind of like how I feel about the stay level. Yeah, I mean, massive amounts of gain reduction, but with like a 1.5 style ratio is gonna give you a really gentle effect. Yeah, and also the, the back rack has, I think, like eight tubes in it, 10 tubes in it. So it's just this like gooiness. More tubes is better. Period. Yeah, it's just like the stay level has <laughs> tubes, the back rack has tubes, so in terms of the things I have spent money on that I noticed the most value for is things that had to do with vocals and things that have tubes in them for vocals. So if you were gonna spend money, I would say may, try to make your vocals yeah. sound great. I've got this uh, handy cam here. Oh. Could you shoot oh. the, uh, the oh, piece yeah. of gear you're talking about? Yeah, sweet. Shows. Yeah, yeah. We are. yeah, yeah we are. so if we and add that. What more can I possibly say? So that's, that's basically, basically it. it. Yeah, so it's something you would notice more on, like, when we, and we'll probably, we'll do the hand cam thing again when it's, like, in the, the final mix. When you take it on and take it off, you really hear the vocal kind of, like, kind of stand up straighter a little bit. Um, yeah, and, and this, this EAR is, like, a $10,000 comp, so I wouldn't worry about trying to pick one of these up. <laughs> yeah, to, to, I mean, what we ran for the longest time was the UAD um, Shadow Hills Mastering yeah. Compressor. You want this back? And sometimes in a pinch, I'll just throw like a Fairchild or a LA-2A across, like if I need to recreate a session on my rig to some extent, yeah, um, that's what I'll use. Uh, the next thing is Decapitator. Yeah, I wanted to smooth this vocal out even more yeah. after the harmonic distortion from the distressor, so I think the decapitator for me is a pretty much a no-brainer. I use the decapitator everywhere on every session. Yeah. So I mean, I think a lot of people do. It's not a, it's not a hidden tool. But yeah, no, it lives on our vocal main bus. It's fantastic. What more can I possibly say? I've got a bigger, a brighter than I be. So yeah. we're crushing it on this one. Yeah, and and this is a specific one because Frankie and I were talking about how do you want your um, vocals come through. It was another lens type conversation and uh, I would naturally go towards a cleaner vocal just because I am I just like vocals so I don't want to just crush them to bits. But he was like, no, I want this to be really abrasive but I want you to understand what I'm saying but I want it to feel like I'm just screaming in your ears. So this was a choice that went through that lens of, okay, this goes to the abrasiveness, the heaviness, things like that. So when you choose that, we had to figure out how do we dial in this abrasive distortion that you can still understand what he's saying. So that's where that one came from. We follow that one up with pretty standard de-essing. Um, and then these ones at the end. These are automated, right? These get automated. Except for the maybe the mono. Except mono? for the mono delay. Yeah. yeah, mono delay tends to stay on. It's um, not doing much. No, it's just the... the oh, it's not oh, even it's doing actually, anything. So this one is automated. Okay. So this was for some throws. Okay. Um, which is interesting because we do have a dedicated track for throws. Um, rather than doing them manually. So that's, that's another efficient tool. Yes. That I love. <laughs> um, on the chorus, it's just the Cubase chorus. Really gentle if we listen to that. What more can I possibly say? I've got a now, I think we use that in uh, some of like the call outs and the, it just, the mix yeah, parts down. It just makes his vocal sound a little scarier. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, if you listen to Motionless and White or you listen to any of the other like type scarier, darker bands that I've worked with, the chorus, I mean, you can go all the way back to Nine Inch Nails, Manson, Zombie, like any of the 
chorus it has a really haunting, dark effect to it when used in the right way. So that was a natural choice for me to to figure out how to make his vocal go through that lens more. You know. Yeah, and if we look at what we're automating, it's the uh, the mix in Echo Boy, which was the next um, one we were going to go to in the effect rack, and then uh, the chorus mix. Yeah. So if we look at effect rack, uh, it's just Echo Boy. So this is just Sound Toys new like engine for running their plugins. Um, yeah, and we usually use the effect rack because say we'll start with an Echo Boy and then say we want to put like a micro, micro shift. shift on it or something. This one we ended up just using an Echo Boy. Yeah, you know? I would say of these, like Primal Tap gets a fair bit of use. A lot, Radiator, yeah. Micro Shift, and the filter ones are really, really good. The, yeah, the filter one's cool. Yeah, I use a lot of crystal. Lot of these we use the crystallizer. I use the crystallizer Clean all guitars. the time. Crystallizer's great. Yeah, I love the crystallizer on pads because they just create like really uh, mm -hmm. ethereal type trails. So yeah, if we let's listen to it with and without the Echo Boy. What more can I possibly say? I'm gonna build a beacon. I'll put you on your feet. Yeah, so, so it's it's so it's yeah it's tight. It's, again, it's like when you listen to hip hop vocals, they're usually very dry, and I didn't want that to be completely this. But normally, the the feedback in a rock band or a metal band would be much uh, more heard. Mm -hmm. This one's more tighter, like he's kind of in a hallway. Yeah. Cool. So that's our main vocal track. Um, the other ones that we're going to be looking at, if we make these bigger. Um, if we go down, so just to explain, there were, I mentioned we have a dedicated throw track. So that's this one, this red Vox FX delay. And you'll see there we've got some effects that get like just adding weirdness to the throw, um, a delay, a reverb, phaser, a compressor for it. And we'll cut the syllable we want out, and then it's just set to delay just drag out. It down. I think a lot of people use that kind of workflow. Yeah, what it was is I, I kept, there would be verses where the, the ends of the lines I would want to hear just an echo on the last word or the last syllable. And so I would spend time automating it up and down and up and down. And I, I it was probably Kyle in North Carolina was just like, hey, we should just try this. So I just, I have, the Vox effects delay track is just a duplicate track that has the mono delay turned to 100. So it's at 100%. And what it does is, so on this one, I wanted a one and one. And when you play it, I literally just record the vocal and then I choose. Yeah, it's the so same it's end syllable. Sitting right? there, and I just drag it right down. And so when you play it, it comes as the delay to the main. But all you hear is the delay from it. What more can I possibly say? I'm gonna play. Oh, you hear it coming at the very end there. Yeah. <laughs> so it might have been it might have been on the on the mix, it might have been set to a one of two. So change the mon delay to, to one half instead of 1-1, one, one. and let's play that back. I might have just accidentally moved it. It's easy to scroll across things. Yeah. What more can I possibly say? I'm gonna build a beacon, I'll put you through your... So you can hear it's got the, the phaser, the, the verb, and stuff like that. To me, that's just another efficient workflow where I'm recording a chorus or recording a, a verse. I'm like, okay, I want this here, drag, 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 and it's just done. Yeah. You know, and we do low passes and high passes on it because you don't want your echoes to be as, you know, in your face as the main. You just want it to be like ear candy. So that track is super, it's, after you're making an album and you're doing all these delays, to me that track is like, saves hours. Yeah. The same thing with this FX Distort, it's just a radio effect. Yep. I have no clue what that track is normally. Yeah, that sounds What is same. that? Sounds great. I love it. What okay. is it? Oh, okay. Oh, that's so the evil. pitch shifted yeah. Antichrist line. So what I do in Cubase is I when I want to do that, I just use the transpose. Up, up here? Yeah. Yeah, there's this transpose thing, and very common to find is just dropping or raising yeah. by an octave at a time. Yeah, so 12 is an octave. So if I want to go down for a little bit, I'll go negative 12. If I want to go to the demon level, I'll go down to, you know, the that's where that one is, I'm pretty sure, because I just wanted to be down too far. Yeah, so that would have been negative 48, <laughs> but that that is another time saver where does thing. Demon level start. Demon level starts at negative 24. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you have entered demon zone. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got our effects tracks on the main. We've got um, some stacks of backing vocals. So you know, notice we've got backing one. 
through three left and right. I don't really have much use for single, like, I want my backings double tracked at all times, pretty much. Yeah. Um, and you'll notice there's no actual individual plugins on these ones. No, because they're when the, when those come in, they're still getting the distressor and the stay level, so they're still mm -hmm. getting comp pretty hard. But we do hit it with that same uh, preset from here um, that we have on the other vocal track, and then we've got Roland Dimension D. It's a chorus plugin. Um, I love that. It's I love really that cool. It adds a really cool roundness to backing vocals, especially um, the RE two hundred one tape delay mm -hmm, space mm -hmm. echo. Sorry, you're gonna get some very interesting texture on. Um, like you're just using different reverbs and delays on your backings versus your main, and in this case we had the backings a little more wet, um, and the end and EQ just really gentle, reducing. If you notice, that was a similar range to the that we were ducking out on the instrumental bus. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just getting it out of the way of the main vocal a little bit. Yep. And that that's a pretty standard stack for like what a backing vocal track would would sound like for us. And because that's got no plugins on these subtracks, it's. Yeah, see the thing the thing with this section is his main vocal is so distorted, so we couldn't just distort everything, otherwise you get all this noise and all this like ugh, gross stuff. Um, so those are very clean, you know, like a hip hop vocal, and they're spread like a hip hop vocal. So you're getting this intense main vocal that's distorted and heavy and aggressive, and then you're getting these m m like stacked clean hip hop style uh, vocals on the left and right, and so together they're making this hybrid, which is what Amur is. It's like a heavy hip hop thing. So you have to when you're making a record like Amur, you have you're having to constantly marry those two things because they're pretty much polar opposites heaviness and mm -hmm. like hip-hop groove and, and feeling and texture and so that's why that choice was made to leave the backings alone and the center super distorted and then we've got our just effect sample track so this was like interviews and stuff you know what you are you're the anti didn't make the record actually yeah that one didn't make the record but Frankie wanted that to start the the song, and it was from one of his favorite movies. So we turned it in like that, but it never came out. Yeah. So we've got like. What if you think you can be step up? It's extra weird, like Mad Doctor sounding. Yeah, he just wanted to stack. What if you think you can be step up to play? <laughs> it's crazy because that's how his voice sounds. Like. Yeah, it distorts like that when he does. Like it. it's just the strangest thing, and Joey can attest to it. It's like. What he sounds like on records is what he sounds like when he's recording. It's, he has like an internal distortion in his throat. It's so weird in yeah. a cool way. Like that's what makes him so unique is that's completely unaffected other than just like some echoes and stuff. Mm -hmm. His voice is just so strange in, in an iconic way. Yeah, so that's our vocal stack. And the last thing that's gonna feed this um, before I add the one FX bus we use on this mix, actually on most of them, uh, is the production bus. And this is just, all our production tracks get wrapped up into this like little glue box of the UAD multiband compressor. Love that. Um, more compressed in the mid range and a little bit drop off on the high and lows here. Um, this pretty much lives on most production buses that we have on records. Yeah. And then a little bit of EQ. It's actually doing a really similar curve to what's going on here. So clearly I like had issues with those areas and then still had issues with those areas and had to come back and do it more. Um, so we're doubling up a little, but that's, I mean, that's not the end of the world. Yeah. So that's everything stacked up. Um, the one effect track we do add is to have uh, an EMT-140, which is just the UAD um, plugin on a stereo bus. If you remember, we have everything routed through that weird uh, instrumental vocal bus. I ended up routing this one straight to the two bus because it's going to get both vocal and um, instruments sent to it. So I'll just call it EMT-140. Um, I actually have a channel preset for us in here. So if I go to track preset and it's visible on the screen, normally we have a wider or a two monitor setup. Yep, so EMT 140. Tiny dip here. These don't get saved with that preset for some reason. So I do a little bit of a high pass. Um, and then it's just like a 2.5 millisecond standard plate. Um, I like EMT 140s a lot. They just sound good. Yeah, they're nice. So yeah, we leave that as, a, as an effects track and we'll send stuff to it as we go throughout the mix. But um, yeah, that group setup is our top-down mixing layout. Um, those buses are consistent through most of our 
if not all of our projects. Yeah, 99% of what we do is filtered through this. Yeah, and the only other thing I'm seeing, obviously, visible on the screen that like also goes through everything are these 808 and swell tracks. These just stick at the top of mixes, and they're your standard, like your sub, bass drop, and like a swell. They're actually the same sample. Um, okay. One's high passed, one's low passed. Yeah, the reason that I did this is because I didn't want. I didn't, I, I used so many compressors on the two bus and, and the fake mass that it was ducking the 808s. And so what I did was the 808s and the swell bypass the Vox, the instrument, and the two bus, and the fake mass, and they just go straight to the stereo out. So nothing is touching these 808s or these swells. You can actually, you want to play one of the swells so they can know what we're talking about. Yeah. It's just impact hits. And half of you will recognize these samples. The building crumble effect. Yeah, so for me, I, I grew up, I listen, I grew up only listening to, um, you know, country music and, and, and pop music. And so I fell in love with pop music very early on. And people like Max Martin and Timberland, they use impacts on a lot of things just to kind of get through sections. And so for me, I'm like, well, you're making heavy music. It obviously makes sense. And a lot of people use these too. So it's not like we're the only people, but um, I think. They do the job of increasing the aggressiveness and increasing the impact of each part. So the swell is going to have a doubler on it. So that goes out left and right. And it's high passed. So that has a little, little bit of reverb so that it kind of trails a little bit longer. Yeah, and then it's super high passed because I don't want any of the low end to be thrown left and right. And then the 808. Yeah, so that's that. The 808, on the other hand, is, yeah, extremely low passed, so that that only comes down the middle. So I've basically separated that sample into like mid-side EQing, I guess, is, is basically what we've done, just in a, a visual way. So the 808 doesn't have reverb, and it has no high end, so you lose the whoosh but you, re you retain those. Because a lot of times I'll want an 808 louder than a swell, or sometimes I'll want a swell louder than an 808, so I like being able to separate those two. Yeah, and we'll use clip gain a lot to adjust those levels as well. They uh, really mess those up quite a bit. So Interesting. As much detail as you want to go into yeah, the sub drops and stuff, and uh, the, yeah. these things, like that would be great, because like, this was consistently botched and, yeah. To, to me, an 808 and a swell is not is never supposed to be the focus of a of a mix. It's always just supposed to be like, ooh, like I feel it a little bit more in my yeah. chest on that part. It's yeah. and and I know that that can differ from producer to producer, but for us, the <laughs> Josh, Frankie, everyone on this song is so heavy and in your face that I didn't need an 808 to carry the song. So it's really just for a little bit more impact and so. Yeah. They, they were doing like 808s featuring the song. <laughs> 808s what? Oh, yeah. Uh. <laughs> the other thing we're doing on the topic of like creating impact is that if we enable the automation on the two bus, I'm sure like we've seen this on a lot of people who've done Nail the Mix where you're just automating certain parts to be louder than others. So like our choruses are always going to be at unity on the fader, yep. but then like the intro is at minus two. This verse like cut out is at minus one. The interlude's at minus yeah, the, one the and a quarter. Yeah, and so well, that's just to add energy. Like I know some people like doing a constant slowdown, and I'll sometimes do like the, you can't hear if the volume drops half a decibel over eight bars. So yeah. like you can do that, but for the most part, we're just doing straight jumps. Um, yeah, I prefer jumps usually. Yeah, um, and I like this before the master limiter compressor because then that actually accentuates that a tiny bit. Yeah, I, I prefer jumps, but you can tell there's one main uh, slowdown at around 60. 60, yeah, so. And that was, I think it just sounded weird to do it abruptly. Yeah, that, that was about to say, that's a, that's a ring out, so you have all the time in the world. There was a ring out before vocal, so it's basically prime time to turn the volume down if you really want to. Yeah. So that was an instance where we did it. But if you can, if you look, there's plenty of little small jumps and stuff like that, and I think those are the kind of five to 10% extras that when you do them, they, they help the song jump out of the speaker more. Yeah, and the other thing these help with is that when we need to bounce the song out from a consistent point, we can just highlight that, hit P, and it separates the groups to the 
like the markers around the track? Yeah, we always do a start point and an end point with like after the fade out so that anytime we have to bounce something, we just choose those and loop it and then it's yeah. done. And the reason this kicks back up to Unity at the end is because we had another song in this session afterwards. Yeah. So. But normally it would look like that. Yep. Little time, a little time saver stuff there. Do we have anything else automated here? No. So uh, how close is this to your normal top-down setup? This is, this is exactly so this. this is it. Yeah, this, this gets is, repeated a lot. Yeah, we just did the We Came as Romans mix, and this looks exactly the same. Yeah, if you open up a session of ours and I have all the folders closed like this, which is, I just like my sessions to look like this when I come to them, um, they look identical. You've got, like, you know exactly yeah. where everything is. And I always yeah. equate it, I pick this up, there's an analogy, I think, from Chris Lord Allergy. It was like, if you're driving a car, you don't guess where the brake pedal is. You know where it is, and you put your foot on it, and you do it. In the mix, you don't want to have to guess where things are. You want to be able to reach for them and act on them. Yeah, that's why, like, when Jeff and I started working together, I was like, I really don't care, like, in terms of, like, key commands, stuff like that. But I was like, I want the drums to be this color, bass to be this color. Like, I just want it to be that way. So it's like, once you, we're both working on the same thing now. It's like you said, you're, you're, when you learn how to drive the same car, you can do a lot more with it. That's smart. That's how the smart people do. Yeah. So, um, excellent description of your template. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, and just out of curiosity, how, uh, yeah, so, so this is like a three year old template that's been kind of evolving yeah. over time? Uh I brought, I brought, yeah. <laughs> I brought the colors here. Yeah. I brought, um, I would say it's really gotten into the it's like final form, of so to speak, in the last year. Year, yeah. After we did the Cane Hill, is when we really like figured out a good gelling mix. Where like I think before that, I was doing a lot more button pushy stuff. Yeah, um, with the Cane Hill mix, we did a mix, and I don't think any of us liked it, so we just redid everything in terms of like I think that's when the instrument and Vox thing came mm -hmm. in. Uh, I think that's when you know a few other a few other uh, things came in, but. The, this final form has been here since about last summer. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess the point is it didn't happen overnight, and it's a, no. Oh, no. kind of like a living thing that evolves. No. I mean, technically, it started probably five years ago when when I was in North Carolina with my uh, old engineer, Kyle. You know, like, there's a plug-in on there that Jeff and I don't know what it does <laughs> on bass, but it's been there, so it, it does something, and we, we've never not liked it, so it's not it's still there. Um, yeah, I think it takes a year. I think it takes tons of bad mixes to find a good template. Yeah. <laughs> but, well, I think there's, uh, we push templates a lot, but the, uh, the proper way to do them, which is this. And, you know, Billy Decker, who did the Country Month, he, he's got an amazing template that he's been developing for 15 years. So yeah. uh, templates get knocked a lot because people think it's just, like, a shortcut sort of thing. But it's only for efficiency really it's not a shortcut because it takes you years to put together well, to get one that's this good or like billy decker's it's a years long project and a template is never done yeah you yeah. know tomorrow we might find something out that we like better and we'll add it to it and we'll yeah. change it and like there's a i know of a bigger like stack i keep them all saved in a cubase is really terrible in how it lets you save and recall groups in particular so i always save it as a What's it called in the menu? It's File Export Track Archive. Um, selected Tracks. And it exports an XML of the groups pre-routed and stuff. And I know I've got like one of those where it has deeper into vocals where we get like scream vocals, scream backing, scream effects, sing vocals, sing backing, sing effects. So there's stuff like that that's a little more spread out. But and this one, there's no singing. So this one's a little... I, I think our template is actually a little bit bigger because it is split, like exactly. screaming, singing. But this one, there's no singing, so you just kind of delete so, stuff out. So you've got alternate versions for alternate situations. Yeah. It's more that we have, like, one giant one that, that we, we start pare with. down yeah. as we go. Yeah, if we, like, drag and tracks, oh, there's no clean guitar tracks, I'm deleting the clean guitar folder. Yeah. There's no, like, there's barely any lead guitar in this song. There's barely any production in this song. There's no clean vocals, so, you know, a lot of things get kind of chopped. But there's always a drum kit. There's always a bass guitar. There's always some kind of rhythm guitar. Yep. Um, so it's better just to start with, like, this, you know, banner version of it and then just modify it based on the song. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. All right, so you want to... Uh... Start getting into the individual tracks. Yeah, let's do it. Before yeah. we do that, real quick, 
why don't we talk a little bit about the program drums? And I want to do that. Cool. I want to do that because uh, I know that program drums are kind of a controversial topic, but they shouldn't be because in this day and age, you're going to be working on program drums half the time, yeah. no matter what level you're at. You've, you know, um, you know, definitely when you're at amateur level, you're going to be working with them more often, but definitely at pro level, at least half the time, I think. Yeah. Something like that. Like a good solid two figure percentage of the time you're going to be working with program drums. So you should really know how to do them properly and get them to sound as real as possible and as uh, banging as possible. And I think that this is a perfect example of doing them right. So I want to talk a little bit about your approach to them and just how they came together, even before you start EQing. Totally. Um, it's, I mean, I think it's worth mentioning that every single one of our projects starts with program drums because we've tracked drums last. Mm -hmm. The workflow we've developed is it just works better to get the songs locked in a place. Um, and then at the very end, we'll track drums. We'll rent out. Uh, we don't have a drum room at Drew Studio, so we rent out a local killer place uh, for a couple days, bang out drums there, get them. The guys tracking to what are basically final vocal takes at that point. So yeah. like the feel is all good, um, and we delete the program drums and bring it back in. In yeah. this case, it didn't have that tie-in factor at the end. Like the record sounded so good from where we were getting that it made no sense to have the drummer fly out, learn tracks in a couple days, and yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, it's another lens issue with this one is that uh, program drums sounded more aggressive and more abrasive for these songs. So that was that was the reason why this choice was made. We could have their drummer's great. Like his name's Josh. Also, he's fantastic and he's doing great on. I mean, they're killing it on Warp Live. Um, but you know, with this one, it made sense to have program drums and you know, a lot of heavy bands do. And I think it's all about what gets the emotion out the correct way. And yeah, for exactly. this record, it was that. If Meshuga can make a record with program drums, yeah, then yeah. you exactly. can do it. I, I've never, I'm never ashamed of program versus real drums. And I think that there's no point. Like, if the people, if you like the song, that's what matters to me. I don't care if you recorded it in Thailand or you recorded it in a trash can or you recorded it, you know, if it's real or fake. I don't even care if it sounds like real. If the song is great and the drums serve the song, that's what you're after. Agreed. So. So yeah, we started off with. Uh, in this case, I remember we were talking earlier. This track was just a couple riffs. Riffs. Yeah. That ended up getting pieced together. So um, Josh had come with some program parts. So we had the core of of the drums there, um, like written out. And you'll notice there's actually not a ton of like automation on individual hits. Part mm -hmm. of that is due to the pace of the song. Like you're not really doing any of the like the upbeats on the cymbal. Um, so you don't need to get like that ghost one down here kind of thing. Some of them you'll notice like Crash L1 and L2, he's just hitting these for effects. So that's a little bit of how we get into like more into the hip hop approach to it. Like no, this guy doesn't have as many hands as he needs to hit these cymbals, but it sounded better to have left and right cymbals being hit at the same time for those particular parts. And that was like a conscious decision that Josh and I made was to give a guy an extra arm, that's so to speak. That's kind of funny that you did that, just because these program drums do sound pretty real. Right. That you still did Dr. Octopus stuff and got away with it. Yeah, and like in the fills, really anal about that. You'll never see it there. But um, yeah, sometimes coming out of them or like on downbeats, um, you know, it's the same kind of thing live. Like live, your drummer has to spare a hand to hit his SPDS pad to hit the bass drop. But yeah. we're not going to do that in a mix. We're going to give him his extra hand back. Yeah. Um, Three hands. So yeah, we kind of take advantage of like what we can with the program drums and what it doesn't limit us to. Um, but a big part of that is got to be injecting life back into the program drums because it can be really hard to spend a mix fighting the lack of energy that comes from a static overhead track. Um, so the main thing I do, uh, and I don't remember where I picked this up from actually, um, it was in, I used to use like the logical editor, if anyone knows what that is in Cubase, where you can like set up conditionals, like if the shell is this note, add this much to the velocity. The MIDI modifier tool in Cubase lets you do that just on the fly. So the two main ones, the only two actually, are there's a randomizer section here where you've got the ability to randomize position, pitch, velocity, or length. With drums, we only care about position and velocity. So 
I'm randomizing the position between zero and five. I don't know what unit of measurement this is in. I believe it's ticks. Um, it might be feet. Feet? Yeah, <laughs> zero to five feet. Yeah, so zero to five feet, and then minus four plus four degrees Celsius. Maybe. <laughs> Um, basically what this is doing is for every hit that's going to happen on the mini note, it will randomly move it between zero and five units, five feet, um, from where it was placed. What this means is that no, <laughs> mi no like kick snare or like kick symbol hit is going to happen at exactly the same time. It doesn't happen in real life, so that's good. And it also means that the velocities are never going to be exactly the same from consistent hits. So just strapping that across your MIDI track is going to get a more human sounding, um, program drum track. And the other nice thing is that you can kind of adjust the swing with this. So adding more or less. I think I've seen Joey do this. Yeah, too. the random positioning stuff. Like if you, I made it 10, it would be a lot more loose. The guy would have a lot more leeway with his hits. So maybe on a rock track, I'm like delaying it a little bit more. Uh, on this one, five is pretty tight. I would say I usually go between six and 10. Yeah, and, and it, what it does is it just saves you like an hour of moving stuff on your own. Like that's just another little, two to five inch like time saver. Yeah. So we can plot drums completely rigid, like just completely onto the grid and not feel bad about it because you have those little tools like that that, that really save so much time. Yeah, but then if we need like an actual real sounding part, we do get kind of granular in here. So yeah. like I got anal on this part and made it sound like a realistic snare roll as much as possible. It's just a little bit like in detail of what you were doing velocity-wise on that? Uh, let's solo the drum track so we're just hearing that. Um, I wish I was showing you through, like, through the sampler, but... I just keep some general rules in mind, like your right hand's gonna hit stronger than your left hand usually. Um, the downbeat's gonna be a little bit harder. Um, normally you get like a, a mountain type effect going. So in this, it's just, um, he's alternating which of his hands is doing the hard hit in this one. So we've got right, and then these two go little, and then left is hard. Um, and that just repeats throughout it. I think a lot of this comes from, like, again, I spent and still spend years editing drums, so I, like, know what the waveforms look like, which kind of influences how I can know where the velocities go. Um, and then there's definitely a fair bit of, like, Let's just highlight this and maybe make it ramp a little bit towards that. Like there's a couple of things you can do along that yeah. to make it I faster. I mean, it helps having experience with the real drums or it helps being a drummer. I was a drummer before I was a producer. So when I hear things, I can hear when they're not programmed in a hum humanistic way. But if you're not a drummer and you don't have experience with real drums, then it's smarter to focus on things like knowing what the drummer's predominant hand is and knowing that none of the hits like that are gonna be the same. They always have to be kind of moving up and down. Mm -hmm. And try to... How many instruments do you play, just out of curiosity? Uh, I play drums, guitar, bass, and sing. And pretty well. I've had to learn how to sing just from writing so many songs. No, but I mean all those instruments, like you're decently, like, yeah, decently well. Be well enough. Yeah, yeah. I think I just think it's important to point that out. That like, I think that the days of not being a musician and a producer are kind of over. Like yeah. a, to a degree, I think you. Sh I don't know. I encourage people to learn as many instruments as they can. So. Th for yeah. this reason. Yeah, like I feel like I'm at a disadvantage because I don't know piano. And so I'm actually teaching myself piano right now because I want to learn how to, I want to feel chords more because I think, you know, a lot of people I know that write songs write the chord progression with their left hand, they write the vocal melodies with their right hand. And if you can do things like that, then you write better songs. So it's the same thing every, whether it be drums, you can learn how to do this stuff more efficiently, whether it be a guitar, uh, you know, you can learn like where normal progressions sound better, where alternate versions of them sound good. And when you learn piano, you can learn how to write better vocal melodies. They, they all play together to make you a better producer or mixer or engineer. Yep. Cool. So uh, drum MIDI in this record fed a single contact instance, which had several libraries loaded into it. Um, the first one, I just knew I wanted a good, my whole like philosophy with, with program drums is to emulate a real drummer as much as possible and to emulate a real drum kit as I would be recording it. So like, I actually don't want things like individualized as much as they would be. So we created the outputs and contact to be like the 
mics you would get out of recording a real kit, even though there were four different pieces inside of it. Um, the kick I mentioned earlier was just straight from, if so, we... So do you mean that, like, if you had four layered snare samples, they would feed out of contact as one snare? Uh, no, sorry. So the best example is with the shell groups, so, uh, or the shell rooms. On this one, we used a snare from the uh, Get Good Drums first pack, um, or the first Halpern first edition of it, because I know they released an updated one. Um, we use that for the snare, because it's a really, really well sampled, lots of uh, hits per velocity snare to get a realistic bass for that. Um, but the toms, for instance, were in a different instrument. They were in the 4D Sounds Middle Farm Studios pack. So the snare and toms, totally different package and totally different instruments inside of Contact. But in Contact, my last two buses to route into Cubase were just called Room Close, Room Far, because both of those sample packages were recorded in the same studio and had the same close and far room tracks. So when we're listening to our close and far room tracks, it's both snare and toms. So the toms are a lot quieter in this one, and that was a choice we made when we were mixing inside contact to get more of the explosive snare room. Yeah, a lot um, of the snare sound comes from the room. The toms come more from the close ones. Yeah. And then the cymbals at the end. We had, I think, three different instruments for the cymbals in the end, and those all routed through. We got them through at the end individually, just because it ended up being easier that way. Um, we also have a shell overhead group, so if we listen to that collectively, That sound pretty realistic. Yeah, and the goal there was just that when I want to, I think these are actually subgrouped out a little bit more than I than I had it in contact when I bounced all the samples out. Um, I remember just dealing with a single stereo out from like what was my overhead track. Josh was very specific about every single piece of the kit. Yep. Um, he was very obviously specific specific about the guitar tone and the bass tone, but what was surprising to me is that he also had a very definitive vision for the drums and it took a lot more work to get these drums sound the way they did, but you know, they sound super cool and they sound super unique to them. So, you know, you have to put in the, if you want super cool, interesting results, sometimes you have to put in a lot of extra work. There was definitely two or three nights in a row that I would leave the studio after tracking Frankie or recording stuff and Jeff would come in and they would all, like one night they only worked on toms mm -hmm. for four hours. And the next night they only worked on cymbals and they would like choose a hi-hat from this pack and a ride from this pack because Josh, when you have a great artist, that's really one of the, the biggest advantages you can have of making a record. We've all worked with artists that have no clue what they want, no, no, no like certainty over what's good or what's bad and you have to make all those decisions but when you have someone like Josh he's like no not that <laughs> and it's actually so much helpful because like okay let's go to the next one so that's why this drum kit is such a strange build out but it just sounds so you know interesting on the record in my opinion yeah and at the end of the day like when I get it into the mix groups it's just going to be a kick a snare toms cymbal group and a room group yeah it's and that's the decision part like I want to make less decisions I want to as a mixer, I feel like we're asked to make way more decisions than we should for the most part. It's like passed on by tracking engineers not making decisions. Yeah. So I don't want to impact, like I know that I'm the one who has to carry that at the end of the session if I make, if I don't make decisions up front. So we just commit it. And if we play this together. And let me open up the mixer so you can see that we've got, let me show some audio tracks and we'll clean up the view a little more. Cool, so we're looking at our drums. We've got our, our drum bus here and that's set up. I'm gonna drop this down so we can see a little bit of the track as we mix. Um, first thing is gonna be the kick. Uh, I mentioned before that we had the MIDI track routed out straight to the kick. If I open up the MIDI, these sends are 100% because they were being sent first to contact and then to the kick sample. Uh, the kick sample is going to be... So this track here, um, 
is routed to the kick sample now. But if we turn on trigger, that actually doesn't sound that different. That's super interesting. Let's listen to this. Oh, is it not reading? It says muted, but that's just negative 15. Yeah. Weird. I think it might it's be printed. Weird. Oh, no, that was, I needed to unmute the camera. Oh, okay. That was a, yes. So, um, And the two samples we've got running on this one are this one called KD Direct, just a direct mic. I actually don't know where this came from. I think that's from Kyle O'Dell's. I think Kyle and I made some samples in North Carolina, so I think that's one of cool. those. And then this one is a Taylor Larson kick um, from yeah. his first pack. And it's tuned down 15. We adjust the tuning every time we open up a session to like add a kick sample. And it's really just fitting like where the like slappiness of the low end fits in with the rest of the overall instruments. Yeah. Usually tuning it down is where we end up going. I don't think I've tuned it higher. Especially for this record. Yeah. Yeah, so we just wanted something that was like almost like an orange in a wet sock. I don't know how to explain it. Like you smacking know, a the table. Orange. Let me just say also, guys, that in the mix competition, this is something that you guys consistently botched as well so please pay close attention to to this um yeah so that's that's the starting point of the sample which doesn't really sound that good by itself mm. right now <laughs> so you don't think it sounds that good right now what made you choose it like how do you know that this is going to work that's a good question. It's got, to me, it's got this sucking, it's that orange and the wet sock quality I was talking about that like, I know it's like a flap. I don't know how it's to- It's like a knock, it's like a knock on a wooden door. It's those two qualities that I'm looking for. It's like a little bit of a knock that I want to adjust and that's more from this Katie Direct. Mm -hmm. And then this like, almost like flap. Yeah. Like, it sounds like one of the old Dimmu Borgir kick yeah. samples that would float around where it's like, how is this a kick? What is the SSL doing? What did we do with the SSL? So with the SSL... Oh, we did a lot. We did a lot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And that's where, let's just listen to this. So, real quick. So you're looking for a combination of the door knock with the what? It's this, um, it's this like Andy Sneap, uh, Sukhoff style flappy kick where um, it's a little bit wet in the top end, like a wet slap. Mm -hmm. And that in the knock are like the two types of kicks I tend to like in heavy mixes. And we'll, we'll like balance between that. Part of me wonders too if we had the SSL on without the Taylor thing and then we added the Taylor in to this EQ. That could have very well been. Because we the case almost too. always have the SSL on and I feel like we added the Tay kick afterwards. So it might have been like a backdoor type situation so maybe if you mute that and play yeah play that what does that sound like i remember making this record when we were recording a lot of it it sounded like that and mm -hmm. it was just because we just wanted it to stay out of the way of frankie's vocals so it's just super clicky and super low and you had nothing in the middle Pantaric. so yeah what my guess is is that we were mixing and we needed more of like the mid range, so we added Taylor's in, and when you unmute oh, it, oh yeah, yeah, when you unmute it, and then you play it. Added information that just wasn't there before. Yeah, yeah. So that's how I feel like the take kick got in there, because that is some serious EQing, and I don't think I would have added those two <laughs> and then done all of that EQing. Yeah. Oh, that sounds right. Yeah. The thing I like about the, the door knock is it's more consistent so you can hear it like in a faster part, but yeah. the thwappy part and the slap, wet slap makes it sound more realistic. Yeah. So that's kind of what we're blending there. So, and you guys, so, and also the other point, I guess, that I want people to realize is that you guys know exactly what you're looking for in these samples. It's not, and you know where you're going to take it. So yeah, it's not like some it's not some random thing. It's some of it's a little bit like 
I'm not, sh I know, <laughs> I'll either know what it is or I know everything it's not. And that mm -hmm. lets me like listen through and be like, it's definitely not that sample, not that one. And then when I find the one, I definitely know which one it is. Um, but I'm not clicking through like 20 samples, I'm clicking through like four. It's another one of those things where I'm, I'm usually at least listening to the sample in relation to the rest of the kit or the rest of the song. So to me, like that sample by itself still doesn't even sound that good. But I know when I listen to the rest of the song, it, it goes, yeah, it goes where I want it to go. So let me also point out for the people in speed mixing that we were telling you not to waste your time with samples, like going through them. You should have them pre-selected. Like Jeff just said, he's not going through 20 kick samples. He's going through four that are already in what he's probably going to look for in any given mix. Yeah, like the... the the inner circle of choices. Yeah. yeah, and we've got like a ton to choose from, but like I've got my JTD samples, which has like just a couple. Um, and then there's, we really just have like a couple folders we reference in here mainly. Yeah, um, yeah that's the kick sample. There's some max bass at the end yeah, for a little that? bit of extra oomph in the upper mid range area. A lot of time, a lot of problems I find with kicks is like where you want low end information in the like 120 to 300 range is not the type of low end that was provided by the microphone or the sample. Yeah. So putting it back in with a harmonic designer like this is Where really does that helpful. one putting it back in at? Uh, 82. 82, yeah. So, so starting there and then. Starts at 82 and it's feeding up to like 160 and then 320. Yeah. When you put that on, then I feel like that sample sounds good. It yeah. like doesn't sound good until that thing does a little bit more to even it out. So it's like, that kick sounds dramatically different from what we started with. Yeah. So that's the kick. Um, think, uh, we can do a little Q&A now? Yeah. Come back after a break, do the snare and keep going? Yep. Sounds great. Cool. Um, all right, so... Here's a question. You already covered this. Um, Dave Watkins is wondering, what was the thinking behind the parts where the snare and kick play at the same time? I always thought that was a no-no. Which part? Which part? Oh, was it doing that, that. I would be willing to like bet that Dave Watson comes from a more traditional metal background if that's the case. And feel free to tell me if I'm just ask backwards on that. I used to have the same feeling where I would think like a kick and a snare at the same time is counterproductive to what you're trying to doing. I saw one. Keep going. Where was it? There. Okay, so what part is that? I mean, it's just... It's just impact. Yeah, for just, me it's just impact. It's. I got into... Once I started understanding the floor, four on the floor beat and why that consistent kick is so important and the energy of it, it started making me like less... Uh, more willing to put it into tracks. And you'll see that for the most part when I've got it at the same time, I'm separating the two manually. Um, so you don't get... The, exactly. The MIDI modifier helps with it, but like I've always found that the kick after the snare helps with that big sounding impactful hit. Yeah, a producer that um, has, was a really good friend of mine always told me that when he finishes a mix, he'll just start moving things a few milliseconds off, whether it be the kick from the snare, or the guitars from the drums, or the bass in front of the guitars. And to me, I think putting kick with snare, like if, if it makes the impact better, great. If it makes song better, great. That's all I care about. Yeah. So it's just an artistic decision. Yeah, I think it, it's just about does it make the does it make the emotion come through the way you want it to come through. Yeah, and, and I mean, like, imagine as a drummer, like, does that part make you want to slam your foot on the floor? Probably. Yeah. Like, when Josh plays that live, that's what he's playing. So, cool. Works. All right. John Agnew is wondering, on your effects tracks, on the throw and the distort, can you show us what your C4 looks like? Oh, yeah. It's the same C4 from the other vocal track that we had. So, we'll get into that a little bit. Um, that way, it's, yeah, I just... It's probably a preset. It's the same, yes, I use the pop vocal, but what I do is I mess with the third and fourth bands. Mm -hmm. They're almost, I think the preset puts them both at seven, and to me that's always just a little high. Right. So I bring it down to around four and five in terms of the gain on each, and uh, that's just what's on the main vocal. And it's the same with the 1176. I treat the affected vocal the exact same as the unaffected vocal. Probably don't need to, but it's just something I've done. All right, and Simone is wondering, so you still have the GGD kick on in the mix with the trigger one, or is it just for triggering? No, so there was never a kick sample loaded into the GGD instrument. The kick uh, 
There was no kick in contact. We sent the MIDI track straight to this kick sample trigger instance. Yeah. So this printed kick was basically just so people had a kick to work with. Yeah, it's Because I just... didn't want to send... Once you've got the MIDI modifiers, if I printed a track and then sent you the MIDI, it doesn't line up anymore. Yeah. So I printed out a kick so you'd have a trigger, something to feed trigger with. Yeah. Killer. Okay, so Jan Brasilovsky is wondering, you guys have mentioned that some effects were taken from YouTube. I always was concerned about the legal side of samples taken from YouTube or TV in general. What did you have to do to be sure that those are legal? Uh, the label has to deal with that, which is why the first one didn't get approved, but the other ones did. If you go go down and choose some of the other ones, um, there, there are lots of websites oh, where you can get royalty-free samples, and you can also create your own. So, what is this one? Satan was God and God was... Satan was God and God was... Um, not real. So that was from... Frankie has a hard drive that he keeps tons of weird stuff on, and that was just a, a speech that he had <laughs> recorded somewhere, or, or like a something that I he had found somewhere. What, what, what was the, the little... Uh, <laughs> The... God hates you, and he wants to kill your children. <laughs> so that one... That's another one from Frankie. So that... I actually know that story. A reporter called up a politician and left that voicemail on his phone. She had, like, a schizoid... Like, a, a paranoid break and uh, left it on a politician's... F like, after she hated something he did. Uh, it was really funny. What yeah. does it say again? It says, God hates you, and he wants to kill your children. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But in terms of getting it cleared... Um, yeah, if, if you're doing it for a label like this one was for Sharp Tone and we turned it in, we were like, hey, this this is this sample. And go to the go to the very first sample. That was from a major motion picture called Private Parts in the 90s. You know what you are? You're the Antichrist. What? Yes, that's what you are. You are the motherfucking Antichrist. So, oh, sure. It's the Howard Stern movie. Yeah. Yep. So that was Paul Giamatti? Yeah, uh, not Paul yeah. Shore. Paul yeah, Giamatti. Paul Giamatti. Very different Paul. Yeah. And we couldn't clear that, so they, they couldn't get it. Sometimes people are cool about it, sometimes they're not. So that one didn't make the record. The rest of them were just other recorded things. They weren't technically samples from movies or other things that had copyrights involved with them. So we were able just to use those. So the glitches in, the, in that first sample yeah, you that played? Was just handmade. He, did you guys make that? Yeah, I use, what I do is I just use the grid and I use the transpose. So, so if it was like Satan and God was... Da 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 da. I'll take. I think I took was, and I brought it down. Is so it's what 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 was, and then I do the transpose and I play with like negative twelve. That's one octave down, or twelve. That's an octave up, and I just kind of create like weird little vocal patterns with it. And so that was just. I like making them by hand because I think you can have a lot of happy accidents. You can end up with really weird. Uh, pitches or really weird um, timings that you wouldn't get otherwise. Great. John Agnew is wondering, could you clarify what you mean when you say throws in regard to vocal effects? Oh, that's probably one of those old school terms like molting that doesn't apply anymore, where technically the delay throw refers to having a physical send where you would... Right here. That's yeah. what these would be. So you would these would be... Throw you would... your vocal to the aux send. Yeah, so you would have like a... Um... Well, I mean, let's just go to it. What it is is we have what's on the what? What do we have on the the box main that we're throwing? It's basically just automating. So we have a effects rack. I think is the automation on. Yeah. So turn it on, and so right there you can oh, see there the, the little the little triangle. So what we do is you're th I'm throwing his. I'm throwing the reverb out. It's kind of like just throwing a ball. So the reverb goes out and it gets really wet and then it comes back. So it's basically like I'm turning the reverb up for this one part, mm -hmm. then bringing it right back down. So if you play that part, I guess play it without it first. Well, that one's the... Oh, that's yeah, that the echo the voice. Yeah. That's an echo, yeah. One thing to say! One thing to say! So it's very, very small, but it's there. Yeah, it would look bigger if we were using this as like the dedicated delay throw, where it would more like come up like this and then subside yeah where the delay needed to be throw just means when you're automating reverbs effects distortion or anything because you don't want to just have reverb on 
through your entire chorus, but at the end of like a chorus line and you want it to fill up some of that empty space, you throw the reverb out and let it basically take up the room and then you pull it back when he starts singing again. Same with an echo delay. It's used a lot in dance and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. it's just another thing that I used to own. I used to use reverbs and delays very statically and I realized that it was just making my mix really muddy and like weird and because if you leave a if you leave the wrong reverb going the whole time, your whole mix is sounds really tinny or really dull or really bright. So for me, I use less reverb statically, and I just always find where I want to throw them out. So that's that. So it's deliberate. Yeah. It's a lot more deliberate. Yeah, just use it to taste, and it feels more special that way. So uh, Eric Anders is wondering, is the KD sample for sale? <laughs> the KD sample for sale? Probably not. Uh, you can just have it. Just email me. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I know like twenty people. I don't even if know. Not the, the I know. Sample is just. I have shared this exact profile with people before using it on the record. So like that's out in the world too. Yeah. And that's just to say like I don't care if you have the tools like. Yeah. You're still gonna need to apply them in the real space. So yeah. it's not too big to me that someone else might have the same things we use. Yeah. The the sample is is a great a great tool and. Then you got about five five thousand more things to do to to make it sound like you know hopefully the way you want it to sound. So yeah, you yep. can have it. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So all right, we're gonna take a fifteen minute break, guys. When we come back, gonna continue with drum sounds, do the uh, mix poll, and I'm gonna tell you guys about the uh, URM Summit. So uh, see you guys in fifteen minutes. We'll continue with July 2017. Nail the Mix with uh, Drew Falk, Jeff Dunn, and Muir. See ya. Hey everyone, it's John Brown here and I play with a band called Monuments. Nail the Mix is an online mixing school that gives you access to the sessions from world-class artists and live streaming classes from the producers who mix them. This month I'll be going on Nail the Mix to mix either creator by my band Monuments. I mixed the album with some help from E.L. Levy and I'm excited to show you how I mix this. Sign up to Nail The Mix now and you'll get all the raw multi-tracks, the same files that I used on the album and an online mixing class to show you how I did it. I mixed it in my very own home studio a long time ago. The setup I had was a lot more modest than what I have now and it's very similar to probably what some of you guys have. In fact, some of you guys might have better equipment than what I had at the time. Why am I telling you this? because that's the point of my class. I know you've heard it a million times already, but it's the ear, not the gear, and that is what I want to show you with my session. I've heard so many of you say, I can't wait to get this piece of gear, I can't wait to get this plug in, I can't wait to get these better monitors, but in actuality, none of that is gonna help if you don't train your ear to work with what you've got. It doesn't matter so much what door you're using, what plugins you're using, what monitors you have, or even if your room has great acoustic treatment, what matters is, is that the source material sounds great and that you make the right creative decisions when you sit down to mix it. If you've heard my band, then you know that everyone in the band can play that instrument very, very well. The source material of the drums is recorded great, and especially the vocal performance is absolutely astounding. So here you have all these great raw materials ready for you to make a banging mix with. Banging. This session will prove that there is no reason why you can't get pro-level mixes with the setup you have now. Every month on Nail & Mix there is a user-judged mix competition where you can compete against your peers for real prizes from real companies. This month's sponsor is Line 6. First place will win a Helix Rack and Control, and second place will win a Spider 5 120 Combo Amp with an FBV2 and a G10T wireless transmitter. So if you want to get your hands on this session, access to my mixing class, and see the potential of a modest home studio, then click the link below and I'll see you there. Hey guys, if you're enjoying Nail the Mix, I want to take a second to tell you about how cool URM Enhanced is. Now URM Enhanced is going to take Nail the Mix and just bring it to a completely different level of depth. We got fast tracks, we have an entire library of videos covering everything from hearing compression, gain staging, all of the things that you really, really need to know that we can't explain to you in Nail the Mix in absolute detail, breaking them down into the lowest common denominators. Aside from that, at Enhance, we have one-on-one -on -one sessions where every month 
me, Joey, and Al. We do like an office hours kind of thing and we come in for a couple hours every week and you guys can sit down with us on Skype one-on-one. -on -one. We can talk about your careers, your mixes, whatever you guys want to talk about. And the third thing we do is once a month we grab one of your songs and we do a mix rescue, which means we sit down like we're doing here and now and nail the mix with one of your songs and your sessions and show you guys how to rescue a mix. So don't take my word for it. Check out what other people have to say about you are enhanced. If you guys want to fast track your audio game to the next level, head right on over to nailthemix.com slash upgrade and get enhanced. Yo, Drumforge Ultimate Sampler is finally here. Whether you're a songwriter, musician, producer, mixing engineer, or maybe you just love making metal renditions of pop songs on YouTube. Whatever the case, you need a great drum sound. Our sampler is hyper optimized and lightning fast, so you can spend less time waiting and more time creating. Like, you know, your next cat video sensation. Harness your creativity with our award-winning sample library. Yo, shout out to Pro Tools Expert! 60 plus instruments featured on records from bands such as Attila, Machine Head, Vinyl Theater, and many, many more. <laughs> Build your perfect drum kit creatively with a practical approach via the intuitive UI design. Change the engineering setups and select processed or unprocessed samples per microphone for maximum flexibility. Best of all, the mixer combined with powerful built-in DSP modules allows you to fully mix your drum sound from scratch without ever touching another plugin. How about that? Last but not least, it's actually affordable. Click below to learn more. We can all be mean queens We can all feel nothing We can all have big dreams, baby I can't give up my I think the Soar plugin accomplished a lot of what I was looking for in this specific song. It is very warm and it's subtle and it does have that stereo effect that really gives it an interesting organic feel. We can all have big dreams, baby. I can give up mine someday. I want to be one of the many. Soar is a new kind of tape delay combining the lush analog tones of tape with the power and flexibility of digital processing. Featuring true analog tape model processing, tape control including repeats, age, and flutter, variable 15 30 IPS speed, groundbreaking tape health and contour adjustments, onboard mono and mix controls, and much, much more. 
With Soar, you'll have more control over your delay than ever before. Download Soar today at joeysturgistones.com. and brings new justice to the tired and worn out warriors. Shaping transience into excellence. Seeking victory with every twist of the knob. DF Trans conquers all who dare to challenge his might. DF Trans, flawless victory. Hey everyone, it's John Brown here and I play with a band called Monuments. Nail the Mix is an online mixing school that gives you access to the sessions from world class artists and live streaming classes from the producers who mix them. This month I'll be going on Nail the Mix to mix I the Creator by my band Monuments. I mixed the album with some help from E.L. Levy and I'm excited to show you how I mix this. Sign up to Nail the Mix now and you'll get all the raw multi tracks, the same files that I used on the album and an online mixing class to show you how I did it. I mixed it in my very own home studio a long time ago. The setup I had was a lot more modest than what I have now and it's very similar to probably what some of you guys have. In fact, some of you guys might have better equipment than what I had at the time. Why am I telling you this? Because that's the point of my class. I know you've heard it a million times already, but it's the ear, not the gear, and that is what I want to show you with my session. I've heard so many of you say, I can't wait to get this piece of gear, I can't wait to get this plug in, I can't wait to get these better monitors, but in actuality, none of that is gonna help if you don't train your ear to work with what you've got. It doesn't matter so much what door you're using, what plugins you're using, what monitors you have, or even if your room has great acoustic treatment, what matters is, is that the source material sounds great and that you make the right creative decisions when you sit down to mix it. If you've heard my band, then you know that everyone in the band can play that instrument very, very well. The source material of the drums is recorded great and especially the vocal performance is absolutely astounding. So here you have all these great raw materials ready for you to make a banging mix with. Banging. This session will prove that there is no reason why you can't get pro level mixes with the setup you have now. Every month on Nail the Mix there is a user judged mix competition where you can compete against your peers for real prizes from real companies. This month's sponsor is Line 6. First place will win a Helix Rack and Control and second place will win a Spider 5 120 Combo Amp with an FBV2 and a G10T wireless transmitter. So if you want to get your hands on this session, access to my mixing class and see the potential of a modest home studio, then click the link below and I'll see you there. Hey guys, if you're enjoying Nail the Mix, I want to take a second to tell you about how cool URM Enhanced is. Now URM Enhanced is going to take Nail the Mix and just bring it to a completely different level of depth. We got fast tracks, we have an entire library of videos covering everything from hearing compression, gain staging, all of the things that you really, really need to know that we can't explain to you in Nail the Mix in absolute detail, breaking them down into the lowest common denominators. Aside from that, at Enhanced, we have one-on-one -on -one sessions where every month, me, Joey, and Al, we do like an office hours kind of thing and we come in for a couple hours every week and you guys can sit down with us on Skype one-on-one, -on -one. we can talk about your careers, your mixes, whatever you guys want to talk about. And the third thing we do is once a month we grab one of your songs. 
and we do a mix rescue, which means we sit down like we're doing here and now and nail the mix with one of your songs and your sessions and show you guys how to rescue a mix. So don't take my word for it. Check out what other people have to say about you are enhanced. If you guys want to fast track your audio game to the next level, head right on over to nailthemix.com slash upgrade and get enhanced. Yo, Drumforge Ultimate Sampler is finally here. Whether you're a songwriter, musician, producer, mixing engineer, or maybe you just love making metal renditions of pop songs on YouTube. Whatever the case, you need a great drum sound. Our sampler is hyper-optimized and lightning fast, so you can spend less time waiting and more time creating. Like, you know, your next cat video sensation. Harness your creativity with our award-winning sample library. Yo, shout out the Pro Tools expert! 60 plus instruments featured on records from bands such as Attila, Machine Head, Vinyl Theater, and many, many more. <laughs> Build your perfect drum kit creatively with a practical approach via the intuitive UI design. Change the engineering setups and select processed or unprocessed samples per microphone for maximum flexibility. Best of all, the mixer combined with powerful built-in DSP modules allows you to fully mix your drum sound from scratch without ever touching another plugin. How about that? Last but not least, it's actually affordable. Click below to learn more. We can all be mean queens We can all feel nothing We can all have big dreams, baby I can't give up mine mm I think the Slur plugin accomplished a lot of what I was looking for in this specific song. It is very warm and it's subtle and it does have that stereo effect that really gives it an interesting organic feel. We can all have big dreams, baby. I can give up mine. Someday I want to be one of the many. Soar is a new kind of tape delay combining the lush analog tones of tape with the power and flexibility of digital processing. Ooh. Featuring true analog tape modeled processing, Ooh. tape control including repeats, <laughs> age, and flutter, variable 15 slash 30 IPS Here. speed, groundbreaking tape health and contour adjustments, onboard mono and mix controls, and much, much more. With Soar, you'll have more control over your delay than ever before. Download Soar today at joeysturgistones.com.
And welcome back to July 2017, Nail the Mix, with uh, Wizard Blood, a.k.a. Drew Falk, Jeff Dunn, M. Your Song Flag of the Beast. I'm going to take a second to talk to you guys about something really, really cool that URM is doing at the end of this year, 2017. In December, we are throwing our first summit. And uh, those of you who follow me and have known me for a while and know enjoy for a while know that we used to do boot camps where maybe 10 people would show up to a studio somewhere uh maybe orlando or detroit or portland or cleveland did them all over the country and uh we taught you how to record for four days so this time we're doing something a little bit different we've got a bunch of our friends coming down we've got kane churko we've got billy decker Got Fluff from YouTube, uh, got Brian Hood, Andrew Wade, and uh, of course myself and Joey Sturges and Joel Wanasek are partners in URM, and then we've got our friend Finn McKenty, who's a marketing wizard, and uh, we're all going to uh, show you guys how to live your lives better and uh, improve your audio career. Uh, it's called the URM Summit. It's happening December 11th through the 14th, and we're all going to be staying together in a resort and uh, hanging out, making connections, and everyone that I mentioned on that list is going to be having uh, presentations and master classes. Like, for instance, Kane Cherko will be live producing your songs. So a few people from the crowd will be uh, selected to give him their pre-pro, and right there on the spot, he's going to uh, make changes and show you how he produces Billy Decker is going to do a speed mixing seminar. You follow Brian Hood. Uh, he's going to be doing some sort of amazing presentation on how to make more money through your studio. Fluff is going to show you how to master multimedia in 2017. It's going to be some killer shit. And like I said, all of us, including all our guest speakers, are going to be staying the entire time in the resort together. So... Uh, it, not just us, but um, the entire URM staff will be there. So everyone you know from the internet, not just me, Joey, and Joel will be there. So uh, if you want to come be part of the community and really uh, be part of a once-in-a-lifetime experience, go to urmsummit.com. You can get early bird tickets and uh, check it out. And, of course, if you have any questions, ask in the chat or email me at al at urm.academy or ask in our private groups. But... Uh, Start planning for that because it's going to be four days that could change your life. If uh, you want to ask some people who went to the boot camps about whether it changed their lives, look up a guy named Tiago Canadas, who's in the Private Producers Club. He will tell you about how he went from local artists to working for Sony, all after what he learned at the boot camp. All kinds of cool stuff has happened for the people who have gone to those. So uh, come hang out with us and uh, level up. And with that... We're going to go back to uh, Drew and Jeff and uh, continue with uh, the Snail the Mix episode. So, yeah, what were we on to, Snare? We were on Snare. We were on Snare. Cool. <clears throat> let's, way. let's go. Sweet. So from the contact kit we printed, we've got <coughs> two tracks right here. This is going to be Snare Top and Snare Bottom, and this is, again, from the Get Good Drums uh, Halpern First Edition Pack. I think this is the mid-tune snare. So there's one thing I need to do, and that's drop this snare sample track. Um, you'll notice that it's routed to this snare GGD track. This is super standard practice for us. We've got our two snare mics. We don't want to treat them differently in every regard. So normally I'll have this named snare reel. I forgot I had caps lock on, so. Um, snare reel is different from snare sample in that it's real. So on the snare reel bus, we normally do some processing. Um, it's not done on this one. so. I don't really like to mix snare on its own, so I'm gonna solo the rest of the drum bus and check this out. Um, just gonna add plugins, basically.
as kind of fishing. Uh, snares are notorious for having really shitty stuff after the bump. Like you want the bump at 200-ish for low end, but then there's always this weird ringy thing. Often there is a weird ringy thing. So I'm a little bit fishing down there. I'm gonna solo it to check it out. That. There it is. I don't like a lot of that, so I'm gonna duck that. Now that I've soloed it, it's a little more papery than I'm super into, um, but I'm just doing some basic EQ here. Uh, next thing I am gonna go for is compression, and I fell into this habit a while back. Why isn't it doing the stereo button? So when you're EQing this bus, you're EQing the top and the bottom together, right? Yeah, that's okay. correct. And so I've already kind of like preset a balance. I didn't mention that. There's a balance I've got going between those tracks. Um, if we open up the mixer, where snare bottom is a little high in this case because it came out of the contact. Came out of contact yeah. um, lower. If we look at the peak. I'm getting a fair bit of like the actual smackiness, or not smackiness, but like the, the top end. The snares, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and this song, we kind of needed a little bit of that rattle from the snare drum to like cut through a bit in the drums because they were so round and, and like pushed out. Mm -hmm. uh, my favorite shell compressor, period, is this API 2500 comp. I know that it sounds nothing like the real thing. Uh, that's not what I care about. In this case, it adds an insane smack to the front end of drums, similar that you'd get out of like Metric, uh, Metric Halo Channel Strip or like the SSL compressor. But for some reason, I just find this plugin to sound really, really cool. Um, so standard settings on a, a shell for me are going to be like attack at 10 or 30, ratio between 4 and 6, quick release. Um, I'm looking for pop. Um, and one trick that you can use to get this, like to find where your attack and release settings are giving you a lot of pop, is to solo the snare mic. Let's not make this always on top. Um, so we'll solo the snare mic. I'm gonna set the ratio to infinity as high as it goes and just adjust where I'm getting the most insane peak. Um, you'll hear the 30s sounds like they're hitting harder, but it's really pokey um, to my ear, so I'm going to back off that. I find 10 to be perfect on snare, 30 to really work on toms, so that's a thing I do. Um, and this compressor, I'm going to be aiming for between 6 and 9 TV of gain reduction. Most of the shell mixing is going to sound very familiar to anyone who's like watched anyone who learned on the Steam forum. duck the room mics because that is so much of what we're hearing right now. Mm -hmm. And what I'm hearing now is that my snare sounds pretty good. It's got the attack I want, um, but it doesn't sound, doesn't have enough high end like in it. Like a crack. Exactly. So for that one, I've still not found a better plugin than any kind of SSL style EQ for adding top end crack to drums. Um, so we'll do that. So that's already sitting a lot better to me. Most of what I'm doing there is top end in the snare um, a little bit. So like between five and eight, we're boosting, ducking a little at 300. 
boosting again at 200, but with this filter up to about 140. So we're really just focusing on that like 150 to 200 and then five and up. And at this point in time, with how that snare sounds, um, but I know that it's not gonna be. It's not gonna compete with the kick yet. Yeah, so that's, that's a big part of it, is we've got our kick sounding insane. Like, um, it's really overbearing right now compared to the snare. So we need to get something added onto the snare drum to make it sound more explosive. And that's where we're gonna reach for our samples. And the first thing I'm gonna do is just, um, you'll notice that my snare reel bus is routed out to the snare sample group. And so the snare sample will take in that and has trigger on it. So we'll open that up. The thing I want to talk about is that I'm running audio into trigger. I don't, if I'm blending, I really, really, really do not like running MIDI into trigger. And I know that that sounds anti everything that a lot of people work with. I ran into a case where I found that MIDI is not a sample accurate protocol. It's tick based. And you can actually, especially if you have changing tempos, you'll have a hard time getting your MIDI to be phase accurate with your audio. Um, so I just like to reference, I'll print fake trigger tracks off of MIDI and then trigger off those um, rather than doing it another way. I like to feed off the actual drums because I find trigger to work really well on the drums. Um, but if it's running off MIDI, one of my samples somewhere will be screwed up and I don't want to lose sleep over trying to chase it down. Yeah. So I just go off audio. So in this case, we're running off the audio from the sampled kit, um, which is more like how you would want to run off like, uh, instead of sending the same MIDI that was feeding contact, I sent the contact instrument to trigger. So I know that that's going to be locked in. It's also going to pick up on some of the cool velocity stuff that the contact instrument is helping me with um, because of how well it was multi-sampled. Um, so across here, you'll see that we have this pretty stacked as far as samples go. Pretty much just all Taylor stuff that we used on this. Yeah. On the sample. Um, and he's got, some of this stuff, so like the mic is the direct mic. The butt was something underneath the drummer. He's got room and verb samples as well. Um, let's just listen to this track on its own. Immediately that like warehouse yeah. snare. I, I love how those samples sound together in that formation. I think it's really hard to get samples to sound like that. Mm -hmm. So that's why I liked... Um, it's hard to get real drums to sound like that? Yeah, both. Yeah. I, mean, I think it's hard to get samples to sound like that and still sound like real drums, too. Like, what he has in there just sounds so great. And so to play some of those individually, we've got, like, a direct mic. Oh, it's room in the back. You can hear how quiet that is. Yeah. That one's doing a lot of the work. So it's like they're all different sections of a snare drum in terms of a room. You're like, you have this part of the room, you have this part of the room, and they're all like creating one really good sounding sample in my opinion. Yeah, there's one where we don't have the license file from our normal sample drive, so it's not firing. Yeah. It's a, a Bendeth Ocaltree top mic. It's really, really ringy. Um, it sounds super realistic, which is why I end up having it usually yeah. in some of the spots. It's not gonna be a deal breaker on this by any means. Um, but yeah, that's something we do have in there. I wouldn't say that this is normal for us to have this many samples. No, this is actually surprising to me to see this. We usually have three. three. Yeah. Three. Yeah, I think in this case, the reason you're seeing so many is because we would add like mic room verb and have those. Instead of using reverb. But then we using, were, yeah. we then decided to throw another snare in there in its full form. Yeah. So you'll notice they're all tuned up 15 cents. So I guess I lied earlier about, so kicks I never really tune up, but snares I will tune up. That was a discussion with Josh, the guitar player. So he wanted to make sure that the, the snare drums on this record weren't a lower type beanbag uh, snare. He wanted this to kind of cut through a little bit sharper in your face, like a little bit more, I would call it 90s hardcore, like Turmoil and, and those kinds of bands. But um, I'm assuming most of you probably don't listen to Turmoil. So it's just kind of a ringy, aggressive, like thrashy snare is what we were after there, which is kind of the opposite of uh, what they've done sometimes in the past and what a lot of other heavy bands do. So it was an interesting thing to try to chase after.
Yeah, and let's bring the real snare back and listen to this in some context. So I'll start with the the um, real snare up and then bring in the snare sample. The sample gives it weight, like a pillowy, rounded weight. You're still getting that, the main thing from the real snare, and then you're getting this like 360 feel from the sample. Yep. So it's not like a world's difference, it's just a better version of what we had. Yep. Um, and then on the SSL plug-in here, we're adding top end, we're sucking out of this weird ringy section, yep. we're adding a little 200. So yeah, same same thing we were doing before. Thank God analog is off here. We were smart. Um, and then that feeds our snare bus. So we've got like three faders to play with here where we're balancing our real snare and our snare sample. And that gives us like access in the mix when you need to automate like the real snare up in a roll versus the snare sample. You have access to that right there. And that's another reason why I like um, trigger on its own uh, send rather than on a track insert. Yeah. So then in here, um, we've got a UAD Fatso compressor on the snare. This, right. is, this is also one of my favorite plugins. Shaving off a bunch of the ring. Yeah, what it does is it keep, like it, before it was very pokey and cut through, and this one kind of like glues it into the kit a little bit more. You'll hear how it evolves with the SSL EQ and the 1176 after it. It basically just gives it some nice warmth to it, and it it controls it a bit and sets it up for the 1176 to smash like the directness of it better. Yeah. And what's super funny now that I opened this SSL EQ is if anyone was paying attention while I was EQing the real snare before. It's like the same Almost the exact things. same thing, yeah. I'm just gonna open it to see how close that actually was. Yeah, like so I'm, I'm clearly listening in on the same types of frequencies yep. and just realizing that I might have needed to be more aggressive or just know that I need to stack my plugin so that I can get that aggressive without going haywire on one of them. Because who knows what that much top end would have done on this track alone, but once we add in this one, it's like, okay, we actually can stand to add a little bit more. And to tell me this is a logical place to talk about this. Um, snare sounds great, by the way. Um, lots of people messed up the balance between the kick and the snare, that relationship. Like, they either had kick featuring the band, or they had snare featuring the band, but they didn't have, like, a good, solid flow between the kick and the snare. Right. A lot of the balance came from the rooms. Okay. Yeah, um... So it would probably be, I guess that's the right time to, to now bring up the rooms and show just, this is a unique song in terms of um, how much work the room is actually doing for the snare. The snare. Full album actually. Yeah, so maybe play it and put the rooms at zero and then. But the thing is it already sounds a hundred times more balanced. Oh, even okay. without the rooms than ah. any of theirs. So I guess what I'm wondering is what are you listening, if you could describe it, what are you listening for when you set those initial levels between the kick and the snare? And then, yes, of course, then go into the room, but, like, just this already sounds better than any of the mixes I heard in terms of balance. Um, I think one thing is that we're, like, we are compressing the shit out of the snare. It is really pinned in place. Yeah, the snare is very pinned, so it doesn't move much. So... The kick is more important than the snare in this song because it's a hip-hop song. It just happens to be a heavy hip-hop song in terms of the way I'm looking at it sonically. And actually, can you turn on all the stuff on the kick? So that's what I was going to say is the kick is also at this point a little overbearing. And the yeah. next point I would have after mixing snare would be go over to kick. Let's, comp let's, let's get those on real quick and then I'll be able to, to give a better... And then there is one trick I think that Ale is getting at that there's one thing I keep in mind. Yeah. Um, so if we EQ on the kick, we're noticing, I do this a lot, this notch at 120. If I reverse it, it'll be a beach ball. Um. 
So I suck that out, gets super tight. And I'm just ducking a little bit at this 1.2 kilohertz. It's probably where Frankie's insects. vocals were sitting a bit too. It's a little bit of that and a little bit of getting more of that wet slap back into the yeah. top end. Yeah, because the knock is usually like 800 to 2K-ish. Yeah. Um, yeah. Next thing we've got is the glue, which is my favorite cheapo, like, rip-off SSL plugin. It's I great. I like it better than the Waves version. We use um, it all the time. Yeah. So this is just some soft SSL-style compression on the kick. It sounds much better already now. Mm -hmm. And then uh, one thing I did not add on the kick sample one of my favorite things to do to a kick's top end, and I ripped this trick from, I read that one time Machine said that his favorite kick compressor was in a 2A. Which is strange to me because it's so slow. Totally, but that's what I want out of it. Yeah. Um, a lot of guys will automate the top end of their kick drum and fast parts um, to be less uh, aggressive. I found I can do the same with a compressor that has a slow release, so I'll make it so it's kissing at like one to two dB of gain reduction, and the top end, especially in double hits like the dot, tends to come out more. It sounds more realistic to me. When you do that, it pulls the low end out a little bit, but still kind of controls it. So exactly. you're, you're retaining the high end and you're increasing the, the power of the kick a little bit more yep. with something like that. And then at the very end on the kick, we've got this API. Oh, it's interesting. And we're ducking some stuff here because yeah. in the mix, it got super gnarly with the piercingness of the kick. So okay. we're cutting at 10, we're cutting at 1.5. So again, more knockiness out, a little bit of the peakiness of the attack needed yeah. to be rounded out. But then we're adding more at 50 hertz. Yeah, because before it was basically like kick drum featuring the band, like you were saying, in my head, listening to it. And so I'm sure we got to a point to where we had the snare pinned and we felt like the kick was just uh, kind of too much of a front runner. Mm -hmm. So I, I mean, I, th in terms of finding the balance between them, I think you kind of, I think we at least, choose one or the other. In this case, it's, it was probably the kick drum because it's more important it than the snare. Anchor. Yeah, it was the anchor of the song. We got it the way we wanted, and then we had to basically just spend time making that snare sound like they were in the same room. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a hard thing to just um, you know, get. It takes trial and error, even if you've done it a hundred times. But um, yeah, I mean, the balance comes from being able to make them sound like they're being played by the same person in the same room at the same time. Yeah. It really gives it this forward motion. Like that's, that when you nail that balance, it's kind of what makes it sound like it's pushing forward and like yeah. rolling along. And that's what a lot of these other mixes were just missing. Right, otherwise you're stumbling every like up, downbeat or upbeat on the kick or the snare. Well, and also I think snare is quieter than people think it is. Mm -hmm. That's one thing that I've noticed recently in my own mixes is I used to think I needed snare really, really, really loud because I thought that was powerful, but really it, it, was, it was taking me out of, out of the kit in a negative way. So, you know, I would say if you were gonna air on one side, the, in this kind of song, a metal song, like the kick is gonna always be the, the dom a little bit more of a dominant one, and the snare should be doing that kind of like pillowy outside edge room, like that's what makes it sound big. A kick sounds powerful and a snare should sound big. Mm -hmm. And bigness comes from width and power comes from center. Yep. So The other two things I really like to keep in mind here is one that frequencies sound, they're perceived louder to you depending on if they're low end or high end frequencies. So like the fader is not a true representation of the volume of a kick drum because of how much weight it has in the low end. Yeah. So one thing I find really helpful just in balancing period to give yourself less, less distractions of what you're focusing on, and this happens all the time in the studio, I will turn my monitors to mono and then kill the left one so I'm just listening to one side. So to approximate that, I'm gonna pan hard right, hit the mono button. And that's just kind of forcing like a super crunched version of the mix of like what um, 
Or like worst sound. case scenario, what the label puts on YouTube as the reference or something. Yeah. Um, or in your friend's awful car. Yeah, uh, and it, that I find helps me get like my main core instruments. Like if I'm going for kick, snare, guitar, bass, vocal balances, I'll always go to that because I find it less distracting. There's less to focus on, and it's more representative. Like what's actually important to this song. Um, so that's that's a big part of the balancing. Yeah. And I think a lot of it is just trial and error too. It's not like there's like a textbook answer to getting your balance right. It's really just going for it and then listening to it in other places or taking a break and then coming back and be like, oh, this isn't right. Yep. And it's it, even after making tons of records, it's it's still, uh, I'm never 100% sure if the balance is right and only time and feedback will tell if, if you get it close, far, on it, not on it. You know, I I think it's... it's um, at least in my opinion, something that you, it will always be a challenge because there's always a different kick and always a different snare and it's always for a different purpose. So yeah. it's just minimizing the uh, the range of error. The two-person thing helps too because when I leave for the day, I'll bounce a reference and I'll listen to it in the car ride home and then text you like, I bounce this mix, this is what it needs when you go in next. And I hate listening when I leave. I don't. I refuse <laughs> to listen when I leave because it's, it'll be the only thing I think about. So yeah, having two people helps. So basically, you know, like because your ear is trained and your sensibilities are trained, you know when the balance is right because the music feels right. And I think that that's something that a lot of these guys mixing need to train their ears for yeah. more. Like they, I think they don't know what they're listening for. And so they set these balances all crazy. Um, and I think that's kind of what's happening. But you guys know because your ears are that much more developed. Yeah, and I think that just comes from time and, and practice. You know, I, I, I've had tons of people ask him or I, you know, just about mixing in general. And one of my common phrases is I just try to suck less and less each time. I do a mix because every mix I did early on was terrible and then the only thing I wanted was to just be a little bit better so it's just it's inching you know if you want to be great at anything it's going to take time and practice whether it be tennis or golf or you know mixing it's it's not a it's not a read a book and you got it kind of deal otherwise anybody could do it so it comes from learning to trust your gut developing what you think is good and then putting it out there and seeing what other people think mm -hmm. you know because I could put out a mix and Jeff could be like, this is fantastic. And Iowa could be like, I don't like this at all. And both of them are technically right because it's just opinions. You know, it's it, it past a certain point, it's if it's, like he was saying, balanced and if it's got the emotion that you want, then stand behind it. You know, otherwise learn from what you do and don't like about it and try to change it as you move forward. And I bet you've got good taste in music too. We listen to totally different music. Yeah, completely. I don't listen to anything that he listens to, and he doesn't listen to anything that I listen to. Good. Yeah, I'm definitely more on the metal side of things. I don't listen to metal. Yeah, I listen to metal and like shoegazy, depressing emo. <laughs> <laughs> it's my jam. Um, cool. So before we move on to rooms, let's talk about toms a little. Um, I have a pretty straightforward approach to how I process toms. Um, so I'm just going to loop this section. And we'll listen to. I love those toms. There we go. They're real low tuned. That's literally all that uh, we were aiming for on this. We wanted it to be super low. The get good stock toms were not low enough for what Josh wanted to go for, especially on the floors. Um, so we opted for this 40 Sounds Middle Farm kit, which Josh brought. It sounds awesome. Yeah, Josh actually um, brought a lot of samples, and we tried a bunch. So yeah. he was very helpful in that regard of like, saying, hey, I want this, also let's try all this. So that was really cool to have an artist kind of bring in, you know, new, unique things that we didn't even have. Yep. Um, I'm guessing just off the top of my head that these were recorded with an, either an MD-421 or an ATM-250 because they sound kind of boxy but still have good attack. Um, so the, the thing with these toms for me always starts with EQ. My utility EQ is Pro Q2, um, so I'm going there. And I love it. It's kind of cheating on toms because you get the visualizer. It shows you where your root note is. You basically want to, I'm boosting at the, um, the core frequency of the low end, so like the bass note. Uh, with a rack tom, I'm going to cut off some top end. Um, 
Let's look for where the attack is. Cool. So about seven, seven to eight is usually where I find rack toms, and then they kind of cascade like down by 500 per tom from there. I know I want a little bit more top in there. And then key thing is just getting rid of that boxiness down here. Yeah. Cool. So that basic EQ curve is going to do me pretty well across the toms. And this is when I just take it, move it to the next tom, adjust. Uh, oh, I don't want to stretch it. I want to move it. Adjust the frequency down. It's a rack, it's a floor tom at that point, or not. It's a lower rack tom, so we want the cutoff lower. Cool. We get our tom three doesn't appear in this part. This is so funny. Um, so I'm just going to move that down and then move that down a little bit, and that will work for that tom as well. Sounds nice. Yeah. Already less boxy. Um, and then I just want a little more... Uh, sometimes I don't use compression on toms. Sometimes I do. On this one, I wanted them more pokey. So starting from that same snare setting, I'm going to jump the attack up a little. Um, ratio is fine at four. But on the threshold, I want to be around six. I find any higher than that, and you start to get into, like, um, your first hit is super loud, but your second hit is not. Um, and then on the thrust detector, this I find this to be, like, how much thwack it's adding at the front end. On the toms, I don't want it to be as thwacky as the snare. So I'm gonna reduce that. And I'm just gonna copy that across all of them. It's a little bit cheating because we've got programmed drums, so we know they're consistent. Yeah. Might need to adjust the thresholds per tom a little differently. But that's a positive to programming. Yep. So now. Cool. There's still a little bit of like weirdness in the low mids, yep. I'm looking there. And just the same ones, just real gentle. Two, one, two. There we go. And that's strapped across the whole bus. So that's doing even more of almost the same thing to everything. Mm -hmm. And then uh, just as a safety measure to get keep things from being super peaky, I'll set a, an L1. And that'll just be kind of like a safeguard if things get too over the top as we're going. So we'll sell everything. Yep. Cool. So aside from like room balance, that's mostly where I want the toms. And that means it'd be great to go into the room. Yeah. <clears throat> Time for the rooms. We'll ignore the symbols for now. Um, rooms are my favorite part of drums. Rooms, I think, is where you generally get the most of your drum sound and like can shape the tone of the record. So I was very happy in this one to have the amazing farm, middle farm room to so work from. Is the shell overhead sit, sent to the rooms? No. Oh, you're right. That needs to go yeah. to the cymbal group. Good eye. Rooms, like, and this is another thing where drum, program drums help. The things you're fighting in a, a room track, you don't have to deal with in a program track. Symbols. Symbols. They're really annoying. Um, Too so, much kick. So a lot of time on my room bus, you'll see the same EQ, but like a weird dip here and another one here sucking out cymbal grossness. I don't really have to mess with that too much here, which is really nice. So what I'm focusing on is the explosiveness of the snare and then a little bit of the same thing on the toms. Um, I have one... Uh, one compressor I've always loved to death on sh uh, drum rooms, and that is the Cromer Pi. And that's because it sounds awesome when it's super distorted. They have some really nice presets that I always start from. The closed room comp gets me mostly in the ballpark. I know I'm going to want the threshold a little lower. Turn off. This is the loudest plug in that other is than the H loudest delay. One. Yeah, other than H delay, yeah. this is the loudest analog plug-in. So definitely notice that. Um, and I want more like five to one. Well, 
Anytime now. Oh, sorry, I started from the beginning. Yeah, come on. You can hear how it's just lengthening out that snare. Yeah. I'm gonna do a similar thing to this bus. So those two together, let me bring up the mixer to balance those two. Um, I really love having a close and far room channel to work with. Um, whenever we track drums, um, we I'm always that's close. Yeah, yeah, close and far. far. Really nice to have that. Like tons of early reflections here. Um, Which plugin were you just? Oh, uh, Kramer Pie. Kramer yeah. Pie, yeah. Yeah, yeah the, the, the close rooms are giving you that wompy, woofy, like, chest part, and the, the far rooms are giving you that cracky, like, Ambient. brightness ambience yeah. to it. So I'm going to start with that at Unity, and then I'm going to solo the drum kit. Turn that uh, ocean way on. Oh, yeah, we can, I mean, I guess we can, yeah. let's drop. Show what the ocean way does. You're just saying that's mostly on the snare. It's almost imperceptible. Just almost like yeah, it's almost like it gives it a breath, like a like a sense of time and space on the snare, which sounds stupid, but it's <laughs> real to me. I mean, all we're limited by is time and space, right? <laughs> Aren't we? Let me get my room balance as far as like which of the room mics I'm gonna favor. And then it gives me this one fader to control that overall balance with the rest of the kit. Yeah, so you can tell the drums sound, and this song specifically, the drums sound dramatically different without rooms versus with them. And when you listen to the finished mastered product, those rooms are the biggest like component to that drum sound. Yeah. Most of our drum mix. Yep, that's the, I mean, that's the last thing we need to address is just what's going on with some of these individual the symbol symbols. Group. You'll notice none of the symbol groups are panned at all. They came pre panned out of um, contact. They were stereo buses from contact, so they were panned within the actual um, instrument they were in. And then I've just adjusted the volume. Most of them are at like minus eight, um, some are higher than others. Um, there's no EQ or compression or anything on the individual channels uh, when we kick it off on the symbol side. Let's solo that group. There we're just sucking out a little bit of this woofiness from the snare attack, a little bit of the harshness in cymbals that just exist in the two to two and a half region. And would fight with the vocals probably too. Yep. Yeah. Um, we're low passing to about 300. It's not the super aggressive Sneep 500 one, but uh, we're getting a little more body in there. And then um, we're just dropping off a tiny bit at the top. Um, there's a hardness sometimes to program cymbals. Things just sound differently. Like if you imagine hitting a, a cymbal like that versus like that, there's a different attack to it, so we want to soften a little bit of that off the top end. Um, and then, we're super common for us is to use a reverb on the overhead track. Um, yeah, and I like to EQ, or we like to EQ the uh, the reverb out, so you'll see the little EQ section right there uh, to the right of the middle. Um, we, we engage that, 
And then it's nice because it just has like uh, lifts or, or dips, I guess, on each one. So we have the, the bottom end rolled off around 6 I dB. Where that ends up being. I mean, it looks like it's wise. probably around like 500. Yeah. Probably around if halfway is whatever. Yeah. So it's somewhere, <laughs> the, somewhere where it felt great. And then I like to boost um, the high end on the cymbals just in terms of the reverb because it's kind of like this this space, um, just adding more space to this drum kit. So we just have that boosted like 8 dB at, you know, 15K, 10K around there. Like somewhere where it's so high that it's not fighting with anything, but it, mm -hmm. it gives you that kind of like finished product feel. Yep. You know, when you can get like a nice, a nice really high end, like between 12, 15, 16 K, it's the difference between having like a dark mix that's almost there and having like a finished product that's, you know, ready for iTunes. So, um, yeah, I, I love, I think re reverbs uh, are, were for me at least, the single most detrimental plugins that I used until I learned to EQ the reverbs themselves. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you don't EQ your reverbs, that's something I would recommend just playing with. You know, I think that you can really tuck them in in right ways, or if you leave them static, they can really get in the way of other stuff. Yeah, so let's listen to this with and without. Well, sounds like we mixed yeah. in a little room track with it. Yeah. Um, and it's important to note that we've got the overhead channel from the toms and snares routed in there too. Um, it'd be cool to have the kick in there, I guess, for realism, but... Uh, we didn't need it. We didn't need it. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll do that, like, we do that on real symbols too, so it's not just a program symbol thing. Um, that ends up being the I drum think, Yeah, mix. I think that's most of the drums. Cool. All righty. Yeah. I like that. Sounds pretty tidy. Um, from drums, we would generally go into, um, when I'm mixing, I'll go into bass, because um, that's next, the like, next thing I'm building in the rhythm section. If I'm setting balances, it tends to be that I'll go for vocals. So there is this aspect of that, uh, we'll get the mix done, and then we'll drop faders and bring things back in yeah. at levels we want them. Um, but like on the master, so like drums, bass, guitars, not like kick, snare, etc. Yeah. So we'll close that up, leave it soloed, and bring in the bass. And the first thing that I can tell you right now is that we're gonna duplicate this, we're gonna molt this bass track out three more times, or two more times. So I'm just gonna double it, and I'm gonna rename the tracks. This is a really standard setup for us, where we have the bass track separated out into bass fuzz, bass mid, and bass sub. Yep. And then, I have this pre-cut um, for our needs, but what we also do is suck out certain regions depending on where in the song we want the fuzz track to be added. Yeah, it's almost like hitting a distortion pedal. Yep. Um, we did that a lot on, on the We Car record that we just mixed. Is, there's a lot of sections that were very dreamy and they were very uh, quiet and melodic and so you don't, you don't need like a ripping bass guitar going through that. And instead of automating a, a bass you know, pedal or making him record it and stomp it in and make him do all that stuff. We just made a fuzz track or a, a distort track, whatever you want to call it, and you can do things like that where you can even do it where you have a distortion pedal and then say you want a little bit more distortion in the chorus. You, you do the same thing. It's just, it's basically like manual automating that makes it super easy. Very similar to when we do vocal delay throws where we just bring it down and it throws out. It's just convenience and it's a nice visual representation of being like, okay, there, that's where the distortion is on the bass. I actually don't like that, so screw that. Okay, I love that. I kind of want to go longer, pull it over. It's For me, it's a very nice visual attachment to, to the song being mixed as it goes. So across those, um, and this is like the most preset-y that our mixes get, is that on those three tracks, there's a standard bass stack that I'll load up that we start from. In this case, I went ahead and saved the Amir bass stack. Uh, bass stack, cool. And that is three amp sims. Let me look at these. I guess I can get rid of the drum for now. All right, now we'll leave them in. Huh? Well, let's shore up everything but the drum bus itself. Boop. Cool. 
So we're looking at drums and bass. Um, we've got our auto automation group feeding our master group, and then we've got our um, fuzz mid bass subtracks. So listen to these individually. The fuzz track. Um, and to, again, we start from like these pod farm starting points that are similar, where like this one is a really ratty sounding power ball. Um, it's a very strange one for sure. Yeah, this one ends up being more of like your standard Ampeg style tone, clean bass. Um, it's a rock classic and an 810. And then the bass subtrack, um, I think is the 810 again? It's just a, oh, no, no it's, it's just a sub with no the cab. Sub so it's literally just like similar to having like just a trillion sub under it. Yep. And um, we comp the hell out of that. Yeah, so for me, it was I always struggled with getting a bass tone that had the the low end I wanted with that notation. Like I think it's important that a bass guitar has uh, melody in it, if possible. Like, and that comes from the mid to the or the mid lows to the mid highs, and that's the hardest part, in my opinion. And then also I wanted the distortion to be exactly how I wanted it, and it's it was really tough for me to dial those in. So, you know, I looking at plenty of other people that did this that made the most sense to me so it's almost like we multi-band EQ'd our bass into the high end is distortion the mid-range is like for the notation and the melody and then the sub is just low end but they're all I'm using different amps to achieve all that to have one good bass tone so let's listen to the fuzz track on its own That like real dark glassy style rattiness or maybe sand zampy just sounds kind of shitty. Sounds abrasive. Way. Yeah, it yeah. sounds angry. Our mid tone. And our sub. into the specific pod farm settings more? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Cool. Um, so once we've got all this together in the bass phase, which, um, Great. And it's also because of Josh's hand. Yes. Like Josh's hand makes every instrument he's touched sound mad. So <laughs> like I couldn't play that bass and make it sound like that. No. It comes from practicing your instrument. So, you know, Sometimes if you want the right tone, you gotta have the right person playing it. Yeah. In this one, the idea was just like create a fucked up sounding bass tone. This is based so, off of an HM2, yep. a Boss HM2, which was called a heavy metal pedal, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's it's just a and, entombed classic Swedish. Yeah, heavy metal and they tone. they stopped making them. But my favorite heavy band of all time is Converge. So that was the first time that I heard it, and that was the first time that I fell in love with it. If you, they go on Craigslist for like 60 bucks to 80 bucks and they are awesome. We actually have a real one in the studio just to mess with random stuff with, but um, we're just running that through like a, It's an a pretty old... clean app, so if we turn off the pedal. It just sounds like the world is ending when that pedal's on. And if you do buy the real pedal, just turn every knob to 10 and you'll have, <laughs> the only thing that that pedal does well is turning everything to 10 and then it sounds insane. And then you can see we're really notching where we're accepting like that kind of rattiness into the mix. Yeah, we don't really need above 9, 8K for in any information for the bass right now. So that's why I say this is, you know, compartmentalized to here. And this is all we want. This is all we're going to compress. This is all we're going to use. This is all we're going to let come through from this distortion. Yeah, like this low cut is probably not doing anything. <laughs> because we're EQing yeah. so much there. And then the compressor on it, a 76 on bass. I mean, can you go wrong? One thing that's worth noting here is that we're compressing the bass after we're distorting it. You're gonna get a very different quality of the saturation, um, the order of which you put those two, if you can imagine. Um, one is gonna basically accentuate the distortion with your pick attack, the other is gonna make the whole thing more staticky fuzzy. Uh, on this fuzz track, that's what we want, staticky fuzzy. Yeah. On the bass mid track, um, you'll notice we're already sucking off the subs here in the channel EQ, and then we're notching out some problem frequencies um, and some grossness around 3K. If we open that up, 
We've got our SVT Classic head and an 8x10 with a 47. Significant amount of gain coming from that. This head driven that hard probably wouldn't sound that great if it was your main tone, and that's why the low end gets sucked off, because the low end yep. is actually really square and blocky and gross. Yeah, both of these tones, we didn't want any of the problem areas, and that was the low end. You know, so that's why you basically get your tone, per se, and mm -hmm. then you just add a subtract to get the low end where you need it to be in relation to the kick drum, which he'll probably jump into when we get there. And then we know we've got some woofiness around the 800 region that we're sucking out here, so. And the top end just needs a little more. Yeah, what's so funny about, it's not funny, but what's great is that the bass and the guitar, when you'll hear, that's just the first instance that we've touched that shows um, the marriage of the bass and the guitar. They get blurred on this record because it's just Josh playing everything. So the goal was to just make it sound like one power instrument. And that, that simple EQ adjustment, you would never do if you wanted separation between the guitar and bass. But here, we actually wanted that high end to marry with the guitar so that was a conscious choice for that lens to just make it sound like one thick like wall in your face. That's part of the balance actually is making like seemingly strange EQ choices knowing that it's going to basically fill the hole of something else and that was the bass to the guitar. Yeah, the bass is like our center guitar channel. Yeah. Um, on the sub low one, let's just look at this pod farm one. Can't tell anything if we've got the uh, low end cut that much. Really warms it up. I think maybe the REQ2 is doing it too. Oh yeah, REQ is definitely... Yeah. So let's disengage that and listen through. Yeah. So we're just sucking off like extreme frequencies there. We've got Compressor. Pretty aggressive. 10 dB at 8 to 1. We're locking this then in place. Yeah, and I, I'm, I don't know if anybody's wondering why we're choosing like a UA1176 and then a CLA76, and I don't think there is any reason. I think it's just. I need 1176, and then it's just whichever one comes into our brain, brain quicker. Yeah, I don't have UAD plugins at home, so my default is the 76 and my from CLA. Yeah, my default's the UA. So yeah. the only time we've ever made a conscious decision on one over the other is whenever we run out of UAD power. And we have to, yeah, we have slots, to use the waves. Yeah, we'll kick the wave ones over. I really don't have a preference. One of them probably does sound better. But um, yeah, I mean, what's interesting is they both have a black, they both have a blue. And then I think UA just released like an anniversary one and then yeah. a few others. It's like, I can't tell. It. I mean, I can kind of tell a difference, but not enough that would warrant choosing one over the other. They're I both... can't tell a difference in like the process. Of, like when I'm picking, I would never like, I can't consciously say why I would choose one over yeah. the other. They're both great. Like in the heat of things, so to speak. In the heat of the moment. Yep. Shout out. Um, so yeah, uh, in our bass bus now, we've got this REQ that's giving us a little more um, low pass, high pass. Let's find out what this thing does. Let's find out what SonicQ does. <laughs> Top end. Yeah. yeah. So it's giving us rattiness in the top end and a little bit in the upper mid range, which makes sense. We're driving a little bit up top, a little bit of mids. It's basically just a boosting everything and then also attenuating the low end. Think, so. It's kind of like a pull tech style. Thanks, Kyle. Ooh. Yeah, that was a good find. Um, this one. It's, it's just like it's just like having like a, a little like bumper lanes on your pulling alley of like a bass. It just like keeps you in line a bit. It's not doing too much. I've got this sucker. That does that. That's all our consistency like, yeah. on the floor. That, that was also a really hard thing for me early on was trying to find low end that was consistent and, and that, that plugin really helped me a lot. So 
if you don't use that plugin, I would definitely recommend messing with it. What is this limiter doing? This limiter is on there specifically because when the fuzz track gets added, it's a little bit chaotic. So it's just to keep it from uh, from going over that. Yeah. Can you show us the difference? Yeah. Like what you mean by chaotic? Oh yeah, so if, if I move this, you'll notice the the fuzz region is in view. But there, it starts hitting a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Can you turn it off, off and on? Let's see this. It's yeah. more that I'm feeding it into another compressor, and I don't want so to worry leveling about it beforehand. what might happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because okay. this sense. is the one where I'm ducking based on the kick. So if I solo the drums here. this band move with no bass playing and that's the kick drum it's just feeding off the kick drum it's ducking a little bit um, and that really 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 clears things up so the last thing we've got on the bass bus um, is this little bit of notching again a little more beach volley in here yeah so I'm going back and cutting that out yeah and that's our, our rhythm section it sounds so weak without that fuzz track on this song particular mm -hmm. it's so interesting listening to how that one is a very vital part of the overall tone. Exactly. It's part of the guitar tone, really. Have you also covered the pod farm settings for the sub yeah. track? Oh yeah, sorry and, I didn't open that one. And um, turn on the automation for the bass auto, because that's a good one too. Yeah, Yeah. so we kick that one on. Um, do I have anything else automated on here? No. Mm -mm. Cool, bass sub track, sorry for not explaining that. Uh, line six has this one amp called a sub drop. Sub dub. Sub dub, sorry. Well, a love dub subbed up. Yeah. Um, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, this one just really rounds out top end, low end, and we don't have a cabinet on it. Yeah. Because so, we don't want any high, we don't want any um, articulation. Yeah. Oh, other thing worth mentioning is the bass was tracked through our Avalon DI. And that, that, was, that was a great, great, great tool. purchase. <laughs> so the Avalon DI, my friend Dan Corniff actually told me that uh, I think, I think I, I don't remember if I was there. For motionless or if we were catching up anyways uh he said that the avalon di is basically like five di's in one because there's a tone knob that it's far left means it's off it doesn't do anything and as you turn if you get the guide or you can google it you can look at what they do and so some of them are like pre-cutting so i think two is the one that we usually use for bass because it's cutting um, a lot of the stuff that we would... 200, 300 range? Yeah, it's cutting a lot of that, that like woofiness that you don't want to have a bass guitar anyways, and it's kind of scooping it a bit, which is great. And then if you turn it over to five and six, it's actually high-passing the low end a bit, which is great for rhythm guitars. It's great for, uh, you know, synth sometimes if you just want it to be like a loud, like in-your-face lead. Um, so the Avalon DI, I think I bought it used off of Craigslist for like 400 bucks. And it's, it's, it's crazy how much it can shape your DI when it goes in. So this one, the bass DI is on a, a tone two of Avalon U5 is what it's called. And then all the guitars are tracked through tone six, which is um, the one of the ones for the guitars with the highest pass. Um, so that's a really instrumental tool actually that, that we use all the time. Cause we're always tracking DIs first and then reamping later. Whether it be this record, Motionless and White, any, anything that we've done, it's, it's going through that first and that really helps just give you a head start on the tones that you're after. And again, it's these incremental decisions that you're making that are gonna add up. Yeah, and it's not like they make or break, it's just that they build. Great, so uh, let's do some Q&A. Cool. Sweet. Um, so, Basically, back to 
samples because you started this uh, the session on the, some of the samples. Martin was wondering, can you actually hear the subtle differences when tuning these samples? These scents seem to me really hard to adjust. Tuning. Sure. Let's take like let's just look at the snare. Um, if we're looking at the snare sample. Sure, the tuning is linked across all of them. I don't need to show with them all tuned up. Let's go to the kick drum. That'll be more obvious. Or what if you made a second trigger and put them all at zero? That might be annoying. Um, no, that wouldn't be too hard at all, actually, because it's just doubling the track. I'm a genius. <laughs> which click in trigger? Which button do you hold to make it go back to zero? There it is. You whatever. double click? That's the first time that's ever happened in a plugin. That's great. Normally it's control click. All right, cool. So, so we've got the no tune, or no tune. And then we'll just make sure that the snare reel is also going snare sample no tune. And we'll bring open that snare sample no tune. Cool. So I'll just make that more obvious. Yeah. There we go. Clear difference. Yeah. I don't know if anyone else is. I'm, I mean, it's 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 another one of those things that you feel it. You know, you mm -hmm. have to learn to. I mean, I hear that for sure. Yeah, I hear it too. Yeah, we're also sitting in you know an incredible studio. So, <laughs> yeah. I, I, depending on what you're listening to, I still feel like you can hear it. It's almost just like the no tune sounds uh, darker and kind of gets out of the way, and we wanted the snare to come cut through more, so we needed to turn it up. So that that high frequency, that resonating ding, was coming through. So it's another one of those. I mean, 15 cents up on six samples is is a lot. Yeah. So I feel like it's I feel like it's uh, in terms of a mixing world, it's a massive difference. Yeah. Let's just do this back in context quickly, like. The tune snare has better posture, if you can imagine. Like it's it's sitting up, it's a little bit more bouncy when he's hitting it. Like yeah. you get a different feel from it. It's yeah. feeling a little lighter. Hearing it in the song, you should definitely be able to hear it because you hear or with the with the bass. Because uh, the higher one gets out of the way of the bass guitar, and the lower one's kind of in the way of the bass guitar, so it's yeah. muddier. Yeah, and when we're picking the sweet spot, we're adjusting it with the rest of the stuff in context and thing like, oh, that gets it more into where like it needs to be in my head. Yep. So your answer is, yes, we can hear the difference. So, um, Gio Hewitt's wondering, do you guys have any advice on a system of sorting through all the different samples and different possibilities to avoid getting lost in a sea of so many different options? That's a good question. Um, I think we have. it's another trial and error one, so I don't think it's a quick thing, but yeah. I think that it... As you make songs, you'll realize that there's things that you prefer out of them and there's things that you don't prefer out of them. So for me, I, I like, I just personally, right now, want a snare drum that has a little less low end and a little more crack and a little more knock. So I'm just naturally looking for those. And I used to only want things that sounded like deep, thick snares. So I was only looking for those. But it started with me identifying what I wanted. So I think you have to start with, okay, I like, I listen to these songs or I want to make this kind of record. And then you identify what you're after. And then that eliminates 90% of the samples you're going to hear anyways. And sometimes you're not going to get it in one sample. You're going to have to get your bottom mic and then you're going to get the chest from another one. Then you're going to get another one to get the crack. So I don't think it's quick. I don't think it's easy. Um, but I do think it's possible as long as you set your, you know, what you want out there, then you just build it and you save it. And then that is snare one of your like top five choices. You know, we've been getting samples and trying different ones for 10 years now. And just now are there maybe five or six that we've made or collected or built in where I'm like, okay, let's just start with these five. And nine times out of 10, we're like, cool, got it. 
Yeah, I would say I have kind of two schools of thought on it. Um, one is that I have some samples that I know are go-to samples for specific elements, and these are going to sound familiar to everyone. So, like Fat City, Rim Center, there are a few of those. Like I put Fat City all over that week car record. Yeah, I think it's perfect I think we for use, that. Um, it does a lot wacky of wacky low end, and yeah. I know what it's going to do. So if I know I need more body in the low mids, that sample is going to be great for it. But it also relies on like the original snare tone being good because that sample can't be used as a replacement because it doesn't have any dynamics. It's just yeah. gonna be that one aspect. So I've got groups of samples and either like the one shot I'm looking for this type of snare and I've got the ones where I'm like totally replacing the instrument and those ones I'll generally actually go to like the get good the superior those full libraries because I think they're better in that aspect um, but at the end of the day I in the last two years I think we've put 10 different samples on different records yeah like they don't vary that much because the goal is to augment the initial drums. We've been lucky enough to work with awesome sounding drums for the last year or so. Yeah, and also uh, if your if your production sucks or the the song sucks, you could have the best snare in the world and no one cares. So at some level I stop caring. You know, I that's just me. I start thinking about the song again. Whenever I spend too much time thinking of a guitar tone or a snare tone or this, that, um, I just always fall back to but first, is the song good? And if the song is great, then I continue on and kind of tweak a bit. But more often than not, if I find myself looking for a snare sound or a kick sound, it's because the song is not good and I'm trying to improve <laughs> it. So um, just keep that in mind of like question the song before you start questioning the elements of the song too. Makes sense. Yeah. So uh, guys, and about the mix pull. We have a, a tiebreaker for second place of the top 20 poll. So uh, we need you guys to help us decide this. So please go to the Private Producers Club. We're about to take a break. During the break, please go vote on which of these two mixes you want for uh, second place. And uh, if one of these mixes happens to be yours or you know whose mix it is, don't say it or we're going to disqualify the mix. So, uh, yeah, please go and vote. It's between Mix 104 and 351 for second place of the top 20. And, uh, yeah, we'll see you guys back here in 15 minutes. We'll continue with uh, July 2017 Nail the Mix. And what when we come back, we're going to do guitars? Yeah. yeah guitars yeah. will be next. That's what's next. So see you guys in 15 minutes. Hey everyone, it's John Brown here and I play with a band called Monuments. Nail The Mix is an online mixing school that gives you access to the sessions from world-class artists and live streaming classes from the producers who mix them. This month I'll be going on Nail The Mix to mix I The Creator by my band Monuments. I mixed the album with some help from E.L. Levy and I'm excited to show you how I mix this. Sign up to Nail The Mix now and you'll get all the raw multi-tracks, the same files that I used on the album and an online mixing class to show you how I did it. I mixed it in my very own home studio a long time ago. The setup I had was a lot more modest than what I have now and it's very similar to probably what some of you guys have. In fact, some of you guys might have better equipment than what I had at the time. Why am I telling you this? Because that's the point of my class. I know you've heard it a million times already but it's the ear, not the gear and that is what I want to show you with my session. I've heard so many of you say I can't wait to get this piece of gear, I can't wait to get this plug in, I can't wait to get these better monitors. But in actuality, none of that is going to help if you don't train your ear to work with what you've got. It doesn't matter so much what door you're using, what plugins you're using, what monitors you have, or even if your room has great acoustic treatment. What matters is, is that the source material sounds great and that you make the right creative decisions when you sit down to mix it. If you've heard my band, then you know that everyone in the band can play that instrument very, very well. The source material of the drums is recorded great and especially the vocal performance is absolutely astounding. So here you have all these great raw materials ready for you to make a banging mix with. Banging. This session will prove that there is no reason why you can't get pro level mixes with the setup you have now. Every month on Nail & Mix there is a user judged mix competition where you can compete against your peers for real prizes from real companies. This month's sponsor is Line 6. First place will win a Helix Rack and Control, and second place will win a Spider 5 120 Combo Amp with an FBV2 and a G10T wireless transmitter. 
So if you want to get your hands on this session, access to my mixing class, and see the potential of a modest home studio, then click the link below and I'll see you there. Hey guys, if you're enjoying Nail the Mix, I want to take a second to tell you about how cool URM Enhanced is. Now URM Enhanced is going to take Nail the Mix and just bring it to a completely different level of depth. We got fast tracks, we have an entire library of videos covering everything from hearing compression, gain staging, all of the things that you really, really need to know that we can't explain to you in Nail the Mix in absolute detail, breaking them down into the lowest common denominators. Aside from that, at Enhanced, we have one-on-one -on -one sessions where every month, me, Joey, and Al, we do like an office hours kind of thing, and we come in for a couple hours every week, and you guys can sit down with us on Skype one-on-one, -on -one. we can talk about your careers, your mixes, whatever you guys want to talk about. And the third thing we do is once a month we grab one of your songs and we do a mix rescue, which means we sit down like we're doing here and now and nail the mix with one of your songs and your sessions and show you guys how to rescue a mix. So don't take my word for it. Check out what other people have to say about you are enhanced. If you guys want to fast track your audio game to the next level, head right on over to nailthemix.com slash upgrade and get enhanced. Yo, Drumforge Ultimate Sampler is finally here. Whether you're a songwriter, musician, producer, mixing engineer, or maybe you just love making metal renditions of pop songs on YouTube. Whatever the case, you need a great drum sound. Our sampler is hyper optimized and lightning fast, so you can spend less time waiting and more time creating. Like, you know, your next cat video sensation. Harness your creativity with our award-winning sample library. Yo, shout out to Pro Tools Expert! 60 plus instruments featured on records from bands such as Attila, Machine Head, Vinyl Theater, and many, many more. <laughs> Build your perfect drum kit creatively with a practical approach via the intuitive UI design. Change the engineering setups and select processed or unprocessed samples per microphone for maximum flexibility. Best of all, the mixer combined with powerful built-in DSP modules allows you to fully mix your drum sound from scratch without ever touching another plugin. How about that? Last but not least, it's actually affordable. Click below to learn more. We can all be mean queens We can all feel nothing We can all have big dreams, baby I can't give up my I think the Slur plugin accomplished a lot of what I was looking for in this specific song. It is very warm and it's subtle and it does have that stereo effect that really gives it an interesting organic feel. 
We can all have big dreams, baby. I can give up mine. Some days I wanna be one of the many. Soar is a new kind of tape delay combining the lush analog tones of tape with the power and flexibility of digital processing. Featuring true analog tape modeled processing, tape control including repeats, age, and flutter, variable 15 30 IPS speed, groundbreaking tape health and contour adjustments, onboard mono and mix controls, and much, much more. With Soar, you'll have more control over your delay than ever before. Download Soar today at joeysturgistones.com. and brings new justice to the tired and worn out warriors. Shaping transience into excellence. Seeking victory with every twist of the knob. DF Trans conquers all who dare to challenge his might. DF Trans, flawless victory. Hey everyone, it's John Brown here and I play with a band called Monuments. Nail the Mix is an online mixing school that gives you access to the sessions from world class artists and live streaming classes from the producers who mix them. This month I'll be going on Nail the Mix to mix I the Creator by my band Monuments. I mixed the album with some help from E.L. Levy and I'm excited to show you how I mix this. Sign up to Nail the Mix now and you'll get all the raw multi tracks, the same files that I used on the album and an online mixing class to show you how I did it. I mixed it in my very own home studio a long time ago. The setup I had was a lot more modest than what I have now and it's very similar to probably what some of you guys have. In fact, some of you guys might have better equipment than what I had at the time. Why am I telling you this? Because that's the point of my class. I know you've heard it a million times already, but it's the ear, not the gear. And that is what I want to show you with my session. I've heard so many of you say, I can't wait to get this piece of gear, I can't wait to get this plug in, I can't wait to get these better monitors. But in actuality, none of that is going to help if you don't train your ear to work with what you've got. It doesn't matter so much what door you're using, what plugins you're using, what monitors you have, or even if your room has great acoustic treatment. What matters is, is that the source material sounds great and that you make the right creative decisions when you sit down to mix it. If you've heard my band, then you know that everyone in the band can play that instrument very, very well. The source material of the drums is recorded great and especially the vocal performance is absolutely astounding. So here you have all these great raw materials ready for you to make a banging mix with. Banging. This session will prove that there is no reason why you can't get pro level mixes with the setup you have now. Every month on Nail the Mix there is a user judged mix competition where you can compete against your peers for real prizes from real companies. This month's sponsor is Line 6. First place will win a Helix Rack and Control, and second place will win a Spider 5 120 Combo Amp with an FBV2 and a G10T wireless transmitter. So if you want to get your hands on this session, access to my mixing class, and see the potential of a modest home studio, then click the link below and I'll see you there. Damn 
Hey guys, if you're enjoying Nail the Mix, I want to take a second to tell you about how cool URM Enhanced is. Now, URM Enhanced is going to take Nail the Mix and just bring it to a completely different level of depth. We got fast tracks, we have an entire library of videos covering everything from hearing compression, gain staging, all of the things that you really, really need to know that we can't explain to you in Nail the Mix in absolute detail, breaking them down into the lowest common denominators. Aside from that, at Enhanced, we have one-on-one -on -one sessions where every month, me, Joey, and Al, we do like an office hours kind of thing, and we come in for a couple hours every week, and you guys can sit down with us on Skype one-on-one, -on -one. we can talk about your careers, your mixes, whatever you guys wanna talk about. And the third thing we do is once a month we grab one of your songs. And we do a mix rescue, which means we sit down like we're doing here and now and nail the mix with one of your songs and your sessions and show you guys how to rescue a mix. So don't take my word for it. Check out what other people have to say about you are enhanced. If you guys want to fast track your audio game to the next level, head right on over to nailthemix.com slash upgrade and get enhanced. Yo, Drumforge Ultimate Sampler is finally here. Whether you're a songwriter, musician, producer, mixing engineer, or maybe you just love making metal renditions of pop songs on YouTube. Whatever the case, you need a great drum sound. Our sampler is hyper-optimized and lightning fast, so you can spend less time waiting and more time creating. Like, you know, your next cat video sensation. Harness your creativity with our award-winning sample library. Yo, shout out the Pro Tools expert! 60 plus instruments featured on records from bands such as Attila, Machine Head, Vinyl Theater, and many, many more. <laughs> Build your perfect drum kit creatively with a practical approach via the intuitive UI design. Change the engineering setups and select processed or unprocessed samples per microphone for maximum flexibility. Best of all, the mixer combined with powerful built-in DSP modules allows you to fully mix your drum sound from scratch without ever touching another plugin. How about that? Last but not least, it's actually affordable. Click below to learn more. We can all be mean queens We can all feel nothing We can all have big dreams, baby I can't give up mine mm I think the Slur plugin accomplished a lot of what I was looking for in this specific song. It is very warm and it's subtle and it does have that stereo effect that really gives it an interesting organic feel. We can all have big dreams, baby. I can give up mine. Someday, I want to be one of the many. 
SOAR is a new kind of tape delay combining the lush analog tones of tape with the power and flexibility of digital processing. Featuring true analog tape modeled processing, tape control including repeats, age, and flutter, variable 15-30 IPS speed, groundbreaking tape health and contour adjustments, onboard mono and mix controls, and much much more. With SOAR, you'll have more control over your delay than ever before. Download SOAR today at joeysturgistones.com. and brings new justice to the tired and worn out warriors. Shaping transience into excellence. Seeking victory with every twist of the knob. DF Trans conquers all who dare to challenge his might. DF Trans, flawless victory. Hey everyone, it's John Brown here and I play with a band called Monuments. Nail the Mix is an online mixing school that gives you access to the sessions from world class artists and live streaming classes from the producers who mix them. This month I'll be going on Nail the Mix to mix I the Creator by my band Monuments. I mix the album with some help from E.L. Levy and I'm excited to show you how I mix this. Sign up to Nail the Mix now and you'll get all the raw multi tracks, the same files that I used on the album and an online mixing class to show you how I did it. I mixed it in my very own home studio a long time ago. The setup I had was a lot more modest than what I have now, and it's very similar to probably what some of you guys have. In fact, some of you guys might have better equipment than what I had at the time. Why am I telling you this? Because that's the point of my class. I know you've heard it a million times already, but it's the ear, not the gear, and that is what I want to show you with my session. I've heard so many of you say, I can't wait to get this piece of gear, I can't wait to get this plug in, I can't wait to get these better monitors. But in actuality, none of that is going to help if you don't train your ear to work with what you've got. It doesn't matter so much what door you're using, what plugins you're using, what monitors you have, or even if your room has great acoustic treatment. What matters is, is that the source material sounds great and that you make the right creative decisions when you sit down to mix it. If you've heard my band, then you know that everyone in the band can play that instrument very, very well. The source material of the drums is recorded great, and especially the vocal performance is absolutely astounding. So here you have all these great raw materials ready for you to make a banging mix with. Banging. This session will prove that there is no reason why you can't get pro level mixes with the setup you have now. Every month on Nail the Mix there is a user judged mix competition where you can compete against your peers for real prizes from real companies. This month's sponsor is Line 6. First place will win a Helix Rack and Control, and second place will win a Spider 5 120 combo amp with an FBV2 and a G10T wireless transmitter. So if you want to get your hands on this session, access to my mixing class, and see the potential of a modest home studio, then click the link below and I'll see you there. Hey guys, if you're enjoying Nail the Mix, I want to take a second to tell you about how cool URM Enhanced is. Now URM Enhanced is going to take Nail the Mix and just bring it to a completely different level of depth. We got fast tracks, we have an entire library of videos covering everything from hearing compression, 
gain staging, all of the things that you really, really need to know that we can't explain to you in Nailed Mix in absolute detail, breaking them down into the lowest common denominators. Aside from that, at Enhance, we have one-on-one -on -one sessions where every month, me, Joey, and Al, we do like an office hours kind of thing, and we come in for a couple of hours every week, and you guys can sit down with us on Skype one-on-one, -on -one. we can talk about your careers, your mixes, whatever you guys want to talk about. And the third thing we do is once a month we grab one of your songs and we do a mix rescue, which means we sit down like we're doing here and now and nail the mix with one of your songs and your sessions and show you guys how to rescue a mix. So don't take my word for it. Check out what other people have to say about you are enhanced. If you guys want to fast track your audio game to the next level, head right on over to nailthemix.com slash upgrade and get enhanced. Yo, Drumforge Ultimate Sampler is finally here. Whether you're a songwriter, musician, producer, mixing engineer, or maybe you just love making metal renditions of pop songs on YouTube. Whatever the case, you need a great drum sound. Our sampler is hyper optimized and lightning fast, so you can spend less time waiting and more time creating. Like, you know, your next cat video sensation. Harness your creativity with our award-winning sample library. Yo, shout out the Pro Tools expert! 60 plus instruments featured on records from bands such as Attila, Machine Head, Vinyl Theater, and many, many more. <laughs> Build your perfect drum kit creatively with a practical approach via the intuitive UI design. Change the engineering setups and select processed or unprocessed samples per microphone for maximum flexibility. Best of all, the mixer combined with powerful built-in DSP modules allows you to fully mix your drum sound from scratch without ever touching another plugin. How about that? Last but not least, it's actually affordable. Click below to learn more. So uh, yeah, welcome back to July 2017. Now the mix. Uh, Nick is drunk, uh, <laughs> and he's 19. So I don't know how it happened, uh, but uh, we have a we have a special guest visitor. So Bo Burchell is over to my left. Hi, Bo. What's up? Bo decided to come visit us. Maybe you can see him. He's somewhere. In he's somewhere in there. Somewhere come in say hi. Here. There oh, there he is. There he is. Cool. Yeah, he decided to come say hello. Um, if you guys haven't seen his month, Seo Sin month, it was great. Nick, you're drunk. <laughs> All right. So, uh, hello, Drew and Jeff. How are you guys doing? Great. Food come up. Food come up. Yeah. And uh, energized. Cool. So, what are we up to? Guitars. Yeah. Cool. Take it away. Dope. That's These good. ones are real easy because this guitar had, or this guitar, this song had so many guitars. It had one on the left and one on the right and one in the middle, yeah. which is my favorite kind of track to work with. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. I think uh, on this front, there was no desire to quad track it with as much character as Josh's hands has have. I really like quad tracked guitars in a lot of instances, but I find it to kind of be like when a singer isn't super sure of himself, he'll double track to smooth out inconsistencies. Same thing's cool with guitars, but you do lose a little bit of that like individual like pick on the string sound that you get from double tracking. So that was a conscious decision to not like go overboard with the quad track here. Um, also because we, the bass is part of the guitar and the guitar 
the guitar is not part of the bass, but together they make one big instrument, so there was no need to get more low end out of the guitar when we were just trying to marry it to the bass. Yeah, and I'm gonna take the processing that I had added before off, um, <clears throat> just so we hear raw guitars across the mixed drum bass tracks that we had before. Yeah. Already off the bat, we really need some help from that high pass uh, and some of the ducking we did in here. Um, just to go over the CQ. Everyone knows the story there. Um, with this low one, it's just cabinet weight, like cabinet resonance weight. You hear it get woofy and beach ball-y. the move I feel like really brings the guitar and bass marriage together. Yep. Sucking that low mid out, that like super standard Sneep Yeah. Open the C4 again, because I was going to say, I was never on the Sneep form. So, so yeah, this is tweaked from it. I think his is lower a bit. Um, yeah, it's just we're bypassing everything except for a low mid uh, compression thing that's basically keeping the, the pick attack you know, from getting too out of out of range. We talked about it a little earlier today, but it basically looks like it's a kick drum because they're basically married the kick drum and the chug. So every time he's hitting that palm mute, it's basically controlling the low end that can come from the overtones. Bring the drums back in. I want to take a look and make sure that we're taking all the guitars into account and go down to where we've got this guitar center track. Mm -hmm. um, this is like a lo-fi guitar, so I did leave the processing that we had on it, um, especially because there's a bunch of automation attached to these plugins. Um, it's mostly on the Meta Flanger, so let's listen to that one on its own. like really happy with how that's sitting yeah um, and so when you yeah when you start going down that this is the meta flanger here is where it sounded like you guys were asking about the the effects on the rhythms and we did the same thing here we didn't have um, just flanger tracks we just did automation with you know when I wanted the, the flanger to come through to create just a bit more weirdness with his vocals so, so yeah it was like another lens choice where uh, he would be saying something that was a bit weird or he'd be saying something in a weird tone and all I wanted to do was emphasize that kind of emotion that he was putting out. So uh, a flanger is just kind of a weird off-putting, a little bit new metal type effect that uh, kind of goes with his rappy abrasiveness. So you can, you can see now um, the second one is where it's kind of going in and out. So let's check that out. Really go wrong with Meta Flanger. Nope. Um, Did you guys automate it at all? Yeah, so you can see this lane right here is where we're automating just the mix. So there's no real tweaking happening on it other than just bringing it in and out at slightly different percentages. Yeah. And then we've got a low frequency of the SSL channel automated here. So I want to bring in the SSL channel. Um, 
This was what I mentioned before, where we had been monitoring the reamp tracks through a bus that was, uh, unbeknownst to us at the time, routed through our normal rhythm guitar bus. Um, and it has that same SSL thing we're doing, where we're getting a little bit of that cool 8K, 10K top end out of it. Um, that's really all it's doing. There's a tiny bit being removed in like the 1K region. Let's listen to that. This adds a little air to the guitar. It didn't really need that much. Because like we said earlier, we actually had this whole record mixed when we decided to re-record the guitar. So when we were reamping, we were reamping into a mixed song. And all we were doing was finding which imp, like which uh, Kemper profile worked best with the already mixed song. That's why the tone is a bit like strange by itself. But when it's played together, it just kind of sinks right into where we wanted it to go. Yeah, and the last thing on here is just this GEQ, which uh, this is more of that like bass guitar melding where we're really just touching like 60, 80, 100. And these are frequencies that are not that, like they're, it's mostly cabinet weight you're getting down there. So we're more just really sculpting that guitar tone around the bass tone. Yeah. So yeah, so when you hear that together, it just sounds like one instrument, kind of. Yeah. And that was the goal, since they're a four-piece, they have one guitarist on stage, um, you know, and they the bassist and the guitar player play a lot of the same thing, and the lens was abrasive in your face, aggressive and heavy. The whole goal of the strings was to make it sound like a wall of aggressiveness, so. Yeah, and I, I, I'm always trying to be a little bit conscious of the fact that I've got that mono maker on the two bus, under 80 hertz, so trying to not have a ton of low end in my left and right channels because that's gonna fuck with your perception of phase as it gets filtered down. So if we can cut that like on the guitars, you really don't need anything below 80. Yeah, so we've really the, uh, cleared those off. Turn the GEQ on and let's hear like the before and after. just tightens the guitars up and lets the bass kind of come through a little bit more. It's another one of those 5% moves that really does a lot at the end of the day. Cool, that's really the guitars. Like at the end we've got this one that automates panning a little bit as it does the little um, side like assist chugs. So it would probably help to turn on the automation on this yeah. track. Right now we have the guitars turned up so you can hear them, but in the mix, the guitars were the least important thing. And were the lowest volume. Yeah, yeah. and they were probably three, four decibels quieter in the final mix because it was, um, you know, like a heavy hip hop song more than anything. Between the kick drum, the bass, low end, and the vocals, that really got us to the energy that we wanted, and the guitars are just kind of there to fill out the space that's left. I think that uh, people are kind of uh, impressed by how much the bass is driving things. Yeah, the bass is the bass is the arguably It's a secret to a good guitar tone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And especially with this thing, there's not a lot of tapping, there's not a lot of lead stuff. It's really just a, a meat and potatoes type string section in a good way for this music. So it's like if you can get the bass to do a lot of what you want, then the guitars are really just there to fill in the holes in terms of the the impact of it. It's like mid range wash. With, yeah. a, with a note definition, and just to like it. Uh, like scratchiness, like abrasiveness, like anger. Mm -hmm. You know, the the bass gives you the weight, and the guitar can give you like a little bit of that like uneasy feeling. And together, it just makes this wall. That yeah, great. Yeah, the other guitar in this mix is the lead guitar we talked about before. Just um, a little simple sample that we made. Yeah, and the only automation going on here is just on volume a little bit, dipping at this intro. Um, Odd farm tone that we had made that has like a whirly speaker. What do they call it? Yeah, the whirlitzer that Pod Farm has in there. That's right. 
It's uh, it's or maybe it was a speaker horn. That's it. It's like a super high speed rotated. Sounds kind of warbly, circusy, evil. Yeah, it's just meant to sound dark and meant to go with the you know the emotion of the song of him saying like, he's saying a bunch of evil stuff. He's saying a lot of dark, sinister stuff. So. You know, all the lead choices had to really reflect that, otherwise it wouldn't make sense. So we made it sound a little dark, sinister, evil. Yeah, and if we're talking about like what kind of EQ settings we would have had on that, it would have been, and I remember this from bouncing, it was like SSL channel, you're doing um, a little bit more aggressively than you would on the rhythm bus, so up to maybe like 250, um, and then filter out a little bit lower than you would on the rhythm bus. That lets you be a little bit more aggressive in the top end, um, but uh, a lot of, the others would be sucking out like five to eight hundred. Some woofiness can happen there with leads. Um, but yeah, not a whole lot. Most of it's inside that pod farm with the weird warbly effects. Yeah. And at the end of the day, the more fucked up that part sounds, the better. Yeah, it's funny because a lot of people hear, you know, the the record or this song and they think about Josh Travis and they think about guitars. And they were probably thinking, man, they probably spent so much time on guitars. And that really wasn't the case because Josh himself is really smart to knowing that... Um, this record or this song or the the album in particular was not a guitar driven record like if you listen to a lot of Josh's older stuff it's a lot more technical it's a lot more this or that and for this stuff he knew that it was more of a backing section which I have to compliment him for because a lot of people that are that talented in that realm just want to show off which he there was spots on the record where he did but he knew that the drums, he, we spent way more time on the drums with him. We spent way more time on the bass with him. And then we spent way more time on the vocals. And like we were saying earlier, he just sat down and did the guitar for the whole record in four hours and it was done. Reamped it through the Kemper that we liked, done. So it, it goes to show that it's not just one piece, it's not just one player, it's thinking about the overall energy that's coming through. And that's what Josh did. That's why it works so quickly on guitars. Yeah, it's definitely a testament also to like an amazing person being able to underplay in a really, really effective way. Like no one wanted the Frankie Danza tap dance extravaganza. That's yeah. like a thing to happen. So it's oh, it, Josh being able to play far beyond his, um, like his actual abilities are far beyond what's represented on this record, for instance. And that probably did it well. He it was did. able to do the job he was meant to do in such a great way. And it didn't bother him the least bit. It wasn't like he was like, ah, oh, this sucks. No ego about it. He was just like, no, this is the band that I, this is the record I'm making. This is what's best for the song. And every decision always came back to that lens in the song, which is great. Which brings us to, do we want to do production first or Frankie first? Let's do production first, cool. yeah. So on production, the very first thing we're going to bring in, which is going to change the track, I think, um, is going to be these ticks. Four. Yeah. We're going to turn the guitars down a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, they were closer to seven decibels quiet on the real mix. Yep. So the ticks are adding a ton of movement to the track. Yeah. Um, the only thing processing we're doing is subtracting a little bit of volume. Um, I mentioned this before, when these would have been printed, it was a doubler two setup like this if you want a screenshot. I think it's the default setting, but just with the top one muted. Yep. Um, and then giant slice down here, um, just to suck all of the, you're not wanting to fight with anything else. Yeah, it's, it's percussion just, based. Yeah, it's just supposed to be a little sprinkles, you know, in the ear and you want to kind of feel it more than hear it. Yeah, so if we're like bouncing that from the get-go, it would have been very common to play the track with them dropped and then bring them in until you hear them a lot and then duck it until you're more feeling them. Yep. A decibel of where we had it before. Yeah. So that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Decibel left 
or quieter. I'm 0.75 quieter yeah. on, on this uh, free bald version. And so those, th those things are things that you could easily leave out, but when you put them in, it's that extra 10% that helps a song kind of feel like it's thought out or like it's executed better or it's, it has a little bit more of a lasting... Like you might not hear that until the third, fourth, fifth pass and then someone that really likes the song or someone that really likes this band will appreciate hearing new stuff as it goes on. And I think that's... I think that's no, I just, I just think that's super important. We've got a dance kick in the interlude, and that's really just to reinforce the original kick. It needed more of like a heartbeat thump. I gotta say something. Yeah. Also, uh, but since I was already pointing out stuff that people botched, uh, yeah. they botched this stuff too, in that the uh, ring out. made it way too loud and boosted the highs too much and it was almost painful in a lot of these mixes you see here in this it's very very scooped and pretty damn subtle yeah the uh the goal with this was i wanted it to kind of feel like a heartbeat because what frankie was about to say was very personal like it was very um he talks about like you know critics he talks about the past line up he talks about all these things that are very um it's like the center point of the song in terms of what he's saying and what he's trying to get across so the goal here was to give it a kick that sounded kind of like someone's heart racing a bit so that was simply why there's no high end and it's very kind of tucked back because when you hear a heartbeat it feels like it's under you know 10 blankets it doesn't feel like it's right in your face so um it was basically to just set up the emotion of what he was about to say The other pad that's persistent across the whole track is that super distorted Spitfire one we mentioned before. Adds a real eerie, creepy vibe to it. Yeah. So. just like a, as a suggestion that the place is haunted it's kind yeah it's kind of like a in terms of yeah it's exactly what i was gonna say it's like a horror movie where they're just walking you know through anything and there's just something like i follow composers almost a lot more than i follow producers because i want to know how do they heighten the emotion whether it be tense like tension or whether how do they heighten the excitement how do they heighten all of these things um because that's always the paramount thing to me so it's easy, in my opinion, when I hear a song like this and he's talking about all these dark, demonic things, I just think about what do horror movies do when people are walking around and things like that. And it's always something that's almost white noise based with half note changes and things like that. And that's literally to do nothing but to make you feel tense and to make you feel darker since that's what he's saying. So it's really pulling from a composer's handbook of just literally following, following the lyrics. like. Okay, saying something dark here that needs to sound like this, needs to feel like this, so that the emotion comes through clearer. That was as simple as that one was. And the very last two are actually backing synths for the main lead guitar. So, so a lot of people thought this was a synth, I remember when it first came out. Uh, <coughs> they're not entirely wrong. synth that is? I don't remember what synth that is, but I remember just wanting to rip off Rob Zombie. <laughs> so all I did was just get something that had a glide so mm -hmm. that it sounded kind of, you know, when I heard Rob Zombie as a kid, that was just the playfulness and how dark it was was just so creepy and scary to me. So that's all I wanted out of that. Right. I think it was probably from Waves Element. I remember using that a lot on that record. And then again, just probably putting a bunch of different stuff on it and moving it around. Yeah, Waves Element is an awesome synth that likes to break all the time. Yes. Um, so the Pan Man plugin is just doing more, like, mess with your ear stuff. Yeah, just tension building. Uh, 
And then there's one labeled ambience, and that one's a little bit I mean, I think I worked with, I've worked with Motionless for so long that stuff like that I just kind of learned from Chris because the singer of that band is a genius at what he wants to come out. So uh, I probably pulled that just from working with him so much, just learning that the way that you stack synths can really change. It can go from sounding like uh, Rob Zombie to, to Mew, Demi Borgir to awful to great so I think that was probably just I wanted some some pick attacks on the notes and that's really all that's doing with a little bit of decay behind the the Rob Zombie synth because I just wanted to cut through kind of gives that lead just a little bit of a larger than life, like it pushes it out to the left and right a bit so that it sounds more boastful, which is what Frankie's lyrics are. So it was all a decision of wanting it to feel bigger and kind of like more bombastic. I think it was the move for that. So they all just stacked together. Lead, two synths, and we had this weird larger than life but guitar-ish sounding synth that worked. So I think that's most of the production. There's really there really wasn't much production or lead guitars on this song. Yeah. It was really focusing on the meat and potatoes of it, the drums and the bass and the vocals. Yeah, it was probably the most stripped down song on the record. Yeah, that's true. The single is the most stripped down song on the record. Go figure. Yeah. Cool. Uh, that takes us through our instrumental. Um, there are some things I'm hearing that I want to like tweak through and just adjust. And um, the main one is the balance of the snare at this point. It's super, super pokey and loud now that we've got everything else in it. Um, so I'm going to bring up the mixer and do that thing I mentioned about throwing the thing into mono and killing a speaker. And just, I don't think you'll be able to, you're pr probably just going to get panned hard right audio right now. So you yeah. can see, I don't know how well you could hear that. Um, basically what I'm doing is a very common practice um, to balance is just getting that into mono. Um, you would hear how pokey the snare is, and once we brought it back, I was instantly back into like album mode where I heard the album again and how big that drum room was af only after dropping the snare mic like 8 dB on the fader. Um, so that definitely don't underestimate changing up your listening environment um, in that regard, even with the same speakers. Yeah, a lot of a lot of mixers that I'm friends with, or a lot of producers in general, or general, keep a pair of Apple earbuds just at their side because yeah. you know that's how most of us, myself included, are listening to music right now. So it doesn't hurt to have you know alternate things like you know cars, headphones, Apple earbuds, especially in my opinion. Um, more often than not, no one's ever going to hear this song on these massively nice, expensive mains. So these are kind of just for fun. And if you can find different ways to listen to your mixes as you're going, I'm sure everyone said that in the past, but that is a huge thing, I think. Yep. Cool. So do we want to go into vocals or? Let's do it. Cool. 
What do we have time-wise until the next uh, QA break? Like yeah, 30 much? minutes. Oh, cool. Yeah. Okay, That's great. definitely enough time to go yeah, through yeah, locals. Yeah, good time. yeah, we can do this. Cool. So let's start with the main one. Um, we saw before it's got kind of, it's going into a pretty stacked vocal bus mm -hmm. already. So we'll leave some of that on. Um, but let's just take a listen. Distortion coming from the vocal main bus. Um, there's some compression on it, but you're noticing there's not really much EQ other than SSL channel stereo. So when we start getting into um, the tracks on the individual vocal track, the first one is going to be the C4 that we talked about. What more could I possibly say? I've got a brother, baby. I'll buy so that one does a lot. Yeah. Uh, that's a big one for Frankie's voice because he comes out so strong and he comes out like very chesty that um, this plugin did a lot more on this vocal than it does on some other people's vocals. And so you just have to adjust based on who's singing. But um, this one really cleared up a lot of the stuff that I didn't want out of the vocal. I really just wanted his, you know, intensity and I didn't need the chest as much because that's coming from the bass and the kick drum in this mix. So just starting there improved it dramatically in my opinion and i think after this we have an 1176 on to start controlling it more yep we go straight into a uad one yeah what more could I possibly say? so we're not doing like the usual nail it to 10 20 yeah. um thing that 76s are known for on vocals where it's four to one and maybe taking off five at the top end uh, and that's because it was smashed on the way in. Like yeah. We had the distressor in the stay level already, um, and we're going into, from there, another dynamic control plugin, which is Vocal Rider. Um, I mentioned before, I use Vocal Rider and Bass Rider on vocals and bass in the exact same way, where I'll set it up as two as my max and minus two as my min. So when it's going through the track, it can't really add or remove that much. Um, and that just helps get away from some like minor automation. What more could I possibly say? I've got a brother, baby. I'll buy you some. You see it lifting with some syllables, ducking with other syllables. Um, it's a really handy thing to have. Yeah, and a lot of people are afraid to commit on the way in. Speaking of compression and how we smashed it, I'm personally not because it's committing in a way. Obviously, I, I love my mic, I love my compressors that I have, so it's, a, it's an easy thing for me to do, but I didn't do that for a long time because I was afraid that I would regret it in the end. But for me, committing really just took out one decision I had to make later in the process. So, you know, depending on what you're using and how good you feel about you know, your, your takes and your performances, my opinion is, you know, don't be afraid to commit because it kind of, forces you to get creative in other ways and forces you to kind of uh, learn to trust your gut and learn to trust your ear and learn to trust your instincts and kind of just move on. And once you start developing that, you'll start committing to more things and your mixes will start to take like a shape of their own that is styled by you. So yeah. I, don't, I don't think it's bad to commit. And if you're outsourcing your vocal edits or if you're doing them yourself, even more importantly, I don't know how many other people find this, but I find that compressed vocals on the way in respond way better to editing and tuning. Um, I get way fewer glitches, the, I can get away with more like format shifts than I'm normally able to, and it just being able to see the waveform without having to zoom in for his little whisper thing is really, really nice. So. Yeah, I mean, I think it's just when you're compressing on the way in, you have more information to tune and to time. And so if you do it bad, it's going to show up more. But if you do it right and you spend the time, I think you have more of the, the sounds, more of the notes, more of the melodies from the vocals. So, uh, you know, even a small bit of compression, I think, goes a long way for, for tuning and timing. Totally. The last one on the vocal channel itself is an L1. I'm pretty sure this is straight out of the, like, I watched a CLA mix video rule book, and he puts L1 at the end of everything and pin it into place, right? Um, not even close to hitting. Yeah. So realistically, this is not doing anything. Yeah. I'm going to take it off. Um, there is a second vocal track. This is mostly because the guy uses long lines. Yeah, so, so Frank... copy that over. Yeah, so Frankie would... Frankie did seven songs on vocals in two days, and he just had me run the song, 
and he would do any collection of lines he had, and then he would have me start the song over, and he would fill in all the holes, and he would be done. So I think we did four songs in like three hours the first day, and then he just wanted to chill. And then the next day we did four songs in, in three or four hours, and then he wanted to chill. And then the rest of them he had to write, so we finished those up at the end. But um, this is the one. This is one of the ones that we wrote early on, and he just banged it right out. These vocals were probably done in a total of 30 minutes, and it's because he just knows exactly what to do, and he knows how to do it well for himself. So that's why you'll notice it's just two two tracks, and there's a lot of lines up top, and then just little punch ins at the bottom. That's how we did everything. It was crazy. We've got one track for some talky stuff. My God, God, forget it, call it foot. Say I'm getting older, running forward to be a giving rock. See, in that section, I wanted to keep the breaths because I wanted it to sound frantic, and I wanted it to sound kind of like a horror movie where people are breathing heavy and people are kind of like pushing out that, like the franticness and just being a bit scared since the next line was all this dark, evil stuff. So that was one of the rare moments where I kept the breaths and I kept all the dirtiness in it. So it comes back to think about what your vocalist is saying, think about what he's trying to get across, the emotion, the energy, and let every choice like enhance that, not detract from it. Cool. Yeah, the backing vocals are pretty much exactly what we were talking about earlier. They're cleaner, so they have like more of a rap-ish feel to them. Yes, I'm surprised to be, you just can't relate. But that's all for the show or never. But! So I'll call it good, I'll call it karma, so make so some of this is like layering of gutturals under other screams. A lot yeah. of it's layering talking. Mm -hmm. It's very much like the hip hop dub 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 layer over it. And that Roland D is doing so much on this backing yeah, vocal. Yeah, it's like making the backing vocals feel like they're kind of floating and like more haunting that way versus if it was off. For me, what the Roland D does is when it's not on, I can hear the left one and I can hear the right one. And when the Roland D is on, it's basically blurring them into this like blanket of backing vocals. So and if I'm doing a purely melodic song, I usually don't want a Roland D on it because I want it to, to feel like this array of, of singers stacking to a main. But with this one, I just want it to sound like one big monster. So I just kind of wanted to blur it. And that's what the, that's what the Roland D does really well. So the, the last part that we haven't done is this hardware compressor. Um, looks like we've got some high-end EQ on these effects tracks, so we'll stack that back on. Um, but you'll notice the vocal volume is low, and that's because we don't have that last plugin on, and we don't have our the vocal master master thing initiated. Um, so let's solo that. What more can I possibly say? That's the hardware compressor. Um, here we're running that um, esoteric audio research one. At home we've got the uh, VAC rack. It's yeah. this just giant gluey, tubey, gooey thing. Yeah, it's stereo, stere stereo limiter. It's not a compressor. Yeah. Yeah. It's a stereo limiter, so once it just hits a certain peak, it just straight up says no. So. We keep that on our, our main vocals just to basically make it like a rock that everything else rotates around. And this was the closest thing that we could find here. And what it, it doesn't really, in, in the mix when the vac rack's on, it doesn't really change the volume as much as it just solidifies everything in the most pleasant way. Mm -hmm. And, sorry? Got something for you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, what more could I possibly say? Let's 
Cool. Yeah. So that's that's one of the rare instances where I felt like it was worth the money to buy a piece of outboard gear. Otherwise, my setup's pretty lean. Yeah, and the last thing is to add on this. Um, I mentioned before we sometimes will run the Shadow Hills mastering compressor in place of it, like if we don't want to patch the hardware in. That's why this isn't on this one. Um, but the only thing we're doing to the all the vocals is one giant move here. You'll notice we're on 60B, so we're not doing like crazy sweeps. Yeah, it looks huge, but it's it's not. If you put it at 30, 30. it's... Like the it's, default yeah. view that people have yeah. looks a lot more reasonable. Yeah. Um, There's an L1. Again, I don't know if this is actually doing anything. No, so that was one of those ones where it's like on our default preset as a safeguard in case things get too crazy as you're coalescing all of your vocal tracks. Yeah. But in this case, it's not touching it. Yeah, it's just like a, uh, you know, a little safety measure. Yeah. And then really at this point, we get to the point that we wanted to talk about before on side chaining your vocal bus to your instrument bus. To me, this is a, a really cool thing that that I didn't even know about until the last year. So this was a huge help in getting the clarity between the vocals or getting the music to work around the vocals. With the Fab Filter plugin, I can solo that range. And because I'm soloing it on the instrument bus, you'll hear the vocals in their full effect, but the instrument bus toned down to where the conflict zone will be. And you'll see as I sweep back and forth, you'll hear it attack more with the vocals and clash more and then less as it goes around so At this point in time, we've been adjusting a ton of stuff without looking at what it's been doing to our two bus. Um, I would be checking it a lot more regularly throughout the mix, um, were it like a start from scratch thing. Um, in this case, we kind of started with what we knew were the end ones. So just to go back and touch this up, and this is a common thing at the end to make sure everything's like gain stage correctly. Um, I know that I like my SSL compressor hitting it like minus five on heavy parts. So I'm gonna make sure it's knocking about there. That's awesome. It's hitting right in line with it. Yep. Um, and I had mentioned in the beginning that I use this MU compressor to tighten in the low end. So pay attention as I adjust the mix knob. You'll hear it start to like flub out on itself, especially in the low end as I remove it. I'm going to adjust the threshold so you can hear what the compressor does. So it's just kind of, it's just soliding it up. You take it off, Bo? Yeah. So yeah, a little bit of kiss there. Um, let's look at the Poltec. This will be pinned. And on our Pro L, this is a nice check at the end to make sure that we're hitting something. Um, we're going to do two things. We're going to jack the gain up to make sure that the mix holds up as we crank up um, some 
compression. And then we're also gonna make sure that we're at a good level. Cause at the end of the day, like if your mix is great, but you send it out with not enough or way too much headroom, you're gonna run into problems. So. Pretty low. Like I'd be comfortable setting that out. I might leave this as is. Mm -hmm. um, let's see what happens as we go. Yeah, I'm hearing it stay pretty consistent. Yeah, it feels um, pretty good across the board on that. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, that ends up being the song mixed. Um, we sent it off to Mike, and Mike murdered the master, so. Yeah, and there's murdered a lot. Murdered in a good way. Yes, in there's the best a, way possible. There's a lot of automation through a lot of the buses that we do that are just, like, broad strokes. Like, yeah, let's turn on the drum automation, for instance. Let's make everything a little bit bigger. So the drums, we're doing a little bit of level automation here. Yeah, you're just, like, you know. Since the fans who feel cheated and venues I damage the people who left me and want to I banish Fuck it, I'm done, I've got one thing to say Maybe if it makes you feel bad Yeah, so it's, it's, I mean, I think I automate the guitars more than anything else yep. and, Or the vocals, I guess, for sure, but um, yeah, if you if you go through the guitars, you'll see that I'm turning them up and down constantly. By quite a bit. playing with about a decibel and a half of change between parts where there are vocals and parts where there aren't vocals. I'm trying to find the perfect balance between getting them out of the way without, but without you noticing that they're getting out of the way. Because it's easy just to turn them way down and then it sounds awkward and you're distracted from the vocal and then it's easy to just not move them and they get in the way of the vocal. So you have to play with it and kind of find that bliss point that's between half a decibel to a decibel and a half usually of of change to kind of like ebb and flow. And a lot of the ways we do that is literally just like looping the section. Yeah. Listening to it. And, oh, that's too loud. That's too quiet. Yeah. And then the vocals are always, the vocals are just automated. Usually while you're writing. Like usually yeah, as by the time a, I come in to do it, the mix, vocals are, they've the been vocals automated. Are, yeah. I'm automating the vocals as I'm recording them because usually the drums, bass, and guitar have a pretty good foundation. And, um, I'm, I start mixing as I'm recording the vocals, really. That's usually the first part of mixing, is while I'm recording vocals, I'm doing the effects, I'm doing the automation, I'm doing the layers, I'm making those choices, so that when Jeff comes in, he's balancing lead guitars or snare drums or toms or anything like that. Yeah, um, that the vocals are ev or what he's supposed to work everything else around. You know, I think in any kind of commercialized music with a front man, you know, that is the most important part. Yeah, I think that's a really important part of how we work well together is that I'm definitely more of an instrument-focused person in general. Um, and vocals are something that, like, I was... I like them, but I can't crack them as often as I would like to, as, like, nailing the part. Whereas Drew, every time I feel like, nails it. Thank so, you. So the fact that I can rely on you to hit that and know that I can just do the instruments is perfect. Yeah, I mean, it works out because... I, I, he, he focuses more on the instruments, like you said, and I focus on the vocals naturally because that's just what we both enjoy the most. So it's not a, you have to do this, I have to do that. It's just a very harmonious kind of like, I like this, you like that. If we do it together, then we'll have one, you know, product. So it comes to be if, if you work with people or, you, or you're friends with people and, and they love other things, it could be a sign of, you know, having someone to work with, to collaborate with the sum of parts can be better than one, you know? I just realized we did a bunch of volume automation. We turned off all the automation in the project at the beginning. Um, it's all, yeah, most most of it, other than the guitar flanger stuff, which you saw, um, and the guitar levels. The most interesting automation stuff outside of just natural level changes is in the guitar. I don't think every, I think a lot of people leave their guitar static, and I think a lot of people leave their vo no, their vocal static sometimes, but 
all these little moves are what give your mix life. It's what gives them, if you leave everything static, it's going to be boring, subconsciously or consciously. You don't know which one, depending on how good the song is. But when, whenever you're moving things, even if you're moving the room mics and the drums up and down and mm -hmm. the bass up and down, and the guitar is up and down based on parts, it's, it makes the song feel alive and it makes it feel like, like it's just kind of ebb and flow, like a wave, you know, and that's kind of... That's what music is, is, is wanting to make people feel something. So when things are moving, you're always catching people off guard, consciously or subconsciously. And I think automation is the difference between someone that really cares about the mix of a song and someone that kind of cares about the mix of a song. Yeah, and this is a song that's pretty straightforward. Like, it's got a busy part with vocals, a breakdown with vocals, a breakdown without vocals, and a busy part without vocals. Yeah. This so for if us, it was more one. varied, like you would see these kind of parts, but then crazy variants at like other instances. Yeah, like this one doesn't really have that much automation, it just has normal level changes, but um, we just did a record for a band called The Plot and You, and there's a few songs where it this <laughs> different the, drum kits. They just go way left and there's automation of everything. It's just one of the hardest mixes we've ever done. But it made the song what it was, and you know, without that commitment to seeing the song through, the song will fall flat. Yeah. So we automate, and we automate more, and then we quit. Yeah. <laughs> and then we try to do better the next time. Yep. So I mean, I think that's that's more or less, you know, the overall impact of the song. Sounds great. Yeah. Well, it, uh, I just want to compare what we did to. I have the original mix in here, so maybe as a comparison and the, is this the mix this is what we sent to mike yeah. okay this is what we sent to the mastering engineer whose name is mike i don't know how to say Collagian? Collagian. his name is mike k <laughs> he's, he's been on our podcast many times he's nice. great and he's great and he's an active member of our group yeah we love him yeah mike's great I made the volume louder than the original, and if we bring this back to... I think we're at four or three usually with that one. Yeah. were a little louder yeah so the only thing that's a little different is the the mix that we sent out was a little bit more scooped in terms of we spent a little bit obviously more than two hours uh, making sure the relationship between uh, the bass and the guitar was right like the one that you're hearing here has a little bit more woofiness and before we sent it out we would probably shave that down a bit but it's within 95 percent of it i'd say yeah and it could even be like playing with the mix now on that mu compressor just a tiny bit yeah yeah but now you can hear like where where the the smack of the drums, and you can hear where the the bass guitar and the guitar have this really interesting relationship to each other, and then the kick drum and the the snare being like bolted in to their tiny spots in the mix. It's basically that there's a defined space for every song, and you have to choose which space each thing gets, and you have to commit to it. So it's the snare soloed by itself is very tight in but then the rooms come out around it. The kick is very tight in with no rooms in it. You have to make all of these decisions and you'll see like as the mix goes, you might be losing it and you have to start over and that's okay. We've done that a hundred times, but when you get it right, remember what you did and continue with it, so. Killer. So I wanna take a minute to announce our winners for the uh, mix poll. So uh, the moon has arrived and uh, we have a tiebreaker winner as well. So uh, here goes. We're going to announce these, and then we'll do a Q and A, final Q and A, and wrap this bitch up. So, uh, so top twenty poll, first place, winning the DF one sampler and the DF bundle is mix number one thirty five, Connor Reebling. Congrats, Colin. I mean Connor. Sorry, sorry, sorry. And then the second place is mix number three fifty one, Marco Collins. Uh, you won the DF bundle, and then the secondary poll, uh, winning $99 in plugins from either JST or Drumforge. First place is mix number 201, Eric Carlson, 
And second place is mix number 10, Staz Sambu. So, man. <laughs> Sambas, I can't do it. Just mix number 10, you win. Staz, S-T-A-S. I, I can't do that last name. I, I want to, but I can't. So, uh, we'll, uh, I'll go again. So, first place, top 20 poll is uh, mix number 135, Connor Reebling. Second place is Marco Collins. Uh, secondary poll is uh, first place is 201, Eric Carlson. Second place is number 10, Staz Sambazis. I don't know. <laughs> maybe I got it, maybe I didn't. So uh, let's do a little Q&A here. First of all, where does wizard blood come from? Wizard blood comes from, I was in a band as a teenager on a record label called Tragic Hero. And we were called Yosemite Mudflap and the Fireball Wizards. And it was a joke band because we always thought it was so funny how so many bands, particularly in metal and rock, took themselves so seriously every time we would go to local shows that we decided to make a fake joke band and write the exact same songs that they did but put the dumbest lyrics possible <laughs> over it. And we started playing shows and we actually got a record deal with Tragic Hero and we played and we just had the weirdest merch and we did all this fun stuff and then we broke up and I kept you know producing and writing and stuff like that so Wizard Blood is just like kind of a reminder to not take anything too seriously in music because it should be fun and creative first awesome yeah so Tony Lundberg's wondering how long did it take to mix this song in real life and what's your average time to mix a song for an artist um I think this one took probably an average time, and our average time would probably be three to four hours on your end per song, and three to four hours on my end, or uh, probably two to th uh, yeah, three to four. So probably about seven to eight hours a song, so about one workday per track. Yeah, to kind of go into that, like in an album setting, what it would be is that I would get the single or like whatever we song we decide is the flagship to do the template around. Mix it up to a good point, get the tones decided, reamp, choose samples, that kind of thing. Um, I would get a new place to be like, cool, Drew, I'm really happy with this. Take it, run with it. Um, Drew would probably change all the drum samples I chose. Um, <coughs> change some of like, the automation balances, bring out a lot of ear candy stuff. Um, and then I would come back in, see what he did differently, um, adjust it a little bit if I thought something needed changing, yeah. and then apply that template to the rest of the song. So like yeah. day one probably takes eight to 12 hours, so like a day and a half to get it in its good place, and then the rest get applied with that template. Um, and they take probably two to three hours. And then each. another two to three hours of tweaking, yeah. handing it back and forth. Like yeah. he's got a couch right behind the mix console, I'll sit on it, noodle on my phone, we pass off every 45 minutes. Yeah, we've actually sat in the room where he'll do a thing for an hour or two and I'll sit behind him and read a book or just do something on my That's laptop. That's how we did the We Car one. Yeah. To, and then, for the first ones. Yeah, because we didn't have time to leave and come back. So we would just literally trade every hour or two and we would get it done quicker. So I would say on average seven, six to nine hours per song and this one was... This one was the first one that we mixed, so this one was probably seven, a day. Yeah, seven, eight hours. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. So Geo Hewitt saying, not a question, just wanted to say a huge thank you for so much information packed in here, and also Drew Turmoil is sick. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Danny Salat's wondering, why is it bad to send the song to mastering with too much headroom? Uh, I guess, there, I mean, you could get into a risk about your noise floor. In the digital world, it probably really doesn't matter, and you're probably good to ask that tongue-in-cheek question, but, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we the one that we just sent to Mike, Mike is uh, mastering another record for us right now, and I sent it with uh, a lot more headroom on accident than we normally would have, but... Um, I think it's, he has such, if you have a great mastering engineer doing it, then they have the tools to make sure the noise floor doesn't get too weird. Yeah. It's just kind of reducing the um, margin of error. Exactly. Finding a good, a good balance. Yeah, who knows, maybe if you send it with too much headroom, they're going to think, oh, they wanted a quiet master. Yeah, maybe when you send it with too much headroom, they pull, they have to compensate more, and that means they may have to change your mix more, too like by compressing it a lot more or limiting it a lot more. So it just kind of leaves it potentially open to changing more than you want it to be. 
So Douglas Martin's wondering, how do you know when production elements like the ticks and the 808 drops are adding to a song and when you are just overcooking it and or trying to compensate for other lacking elements in a song? That's a good question. That's, I mean, that is a good question. This song has more 808s than any other <laughs> song I've done in the last year because it's a mirror. And the whole thing was just make it everything it should be, which is just like a Armageddon type thing. So for this one, it was just almost like every time a new part starts, put it in there. But um, I find myself using 808s and, and swells less and less, but more often I find myself just turning them down than taking them out because I still want to feel it. So I think it's about your level. If you have an 808 every measure in a song, <laughs> but it's at the right level, it could technically be cool. I mean, that's what hip hop songs are. We've had are. that before. One of the motionless tracks had an 808 throughout the entire song where the downbeat was louder and then the yeah. other beats were quieter, but then every like fourth bar, it was a really loud one. Yeah, I think it's, a, it's your choice of taste. You know, do you want to be a super flashy, super ear candy producer? Do you want to be a Will Yip type producer where it's just very, you know, like citizen turnover kind of garage type thing? It, it's depend it depends on what your point of view and what your aesthetic as a producer is. So mine is, I want to have, I want it to feel like humans are playing the songs, but I want it to feel like the best version of a human is playing the song. So that's why there are some production, but there's not 25 tracks of sense. And that's why there are 808s and swells. And in this song, they're a little louder than normal, but they are not massively overtaking the song. And in a lot of the other records I do, I very, very rarely use 808s more than maybe once or twice because the more often you use something, the less special it is. So. Yeah, I usually place them on choruses and then you'll delete them if you need them. Yeah. Kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Joey Lundberg is wondering, when mixing metal guitars with bass, what's the relationship you see between them in your words? How should they interact? Um, I want the, the bass to be like a center mono guitar. Kind of. Like that's, I want the grit to be riding in the middle there. I think that's what gives the bass a lot of presence. Um, on the side, realistically, just making sure the guitar doesn't step on the low end of the bass so it lets it does its job, but also complements whatever grind characteristic you pick in the middle. So I find myself oftentimes like reamping through the bass DI back through the same amp the guitars went through just to perfectly glue it there so I know the saturation characteristic is the same. So complementary satura saturation and like get the hell out of the way of the low end. Well, Dave Watkins was wondering, if you didn't have the UAD multiband plugin, what would be your next go-to? Pro MB. I use it at home. Um, I have a setting that emulates the one that Drew has um, when I'm like building sessions from scratch at home, um, and it's pretty damn close. Yeah, it's great. All right, Alex Danforth is wondering, and this will be the last question. Can you guys speak to your perseverance in dealing with your journey in mixing? Because you mentioned hating your mixes starting out, but setting a goal to get better with each mix? Um, yeah, I mean, when I was 14 is when I started mixing, and I'm 30 now, so I spent 16, 16 years trying to get better, and I think that there's, there's times in your life where you feel like you really have it, and you feel like you've really dialed it in, and then something comes along and you're like, <laughs> you're like, oh man, I, th I really thought I knew something. And then it's a, a time period to learn and be humble and to realize that there's people out there that are better than you and there's resources out there that you should have been tapping into. And you go through a season of growth and then your mixes start to shape a little bit better and then you start to have a little bit better sound. And then you go back into feeling like, okay, now I've really got it. And that might be a week, that might be a year. And then you hear something else and you start to doubt yourself and you start to think, I need to, I need to learn. And I think refining is a constant uh, snowball effect of feeling like you can do anything and then feeling like you're the worst and then feeling like you can do anything and then feeling like you're the worst. And I think that they, I think they're both healthy. As long as you don't feed into either of them too much, you want to be confident in what you're doing and you want the people in the room to trust you and you want 
people in the room to look to you to make those tough decisions. And then you also want to realize you're probably not the best and you probably never will be. No one's ever technically the best at mixing. So you want to be humble enough to learn, to read, to talk to people, to ask for help, to ask for advice. That's why Jeff and I work so well together. It's because I'm, I have no pride about who does what, where it goes, who gets what credit. All I want is for my song to succeed. So that is one example of I could have been like, no, I could just do this all myself and I just won't call anyone and I'll take it all on and it would have you know, crushed me. But that was a, a defining moment of moving here and being like, this is gonna be tough in general, living in Los Angeles, I need help. I need to realize that I'm good at songwriting, I'm good at producing, I'm good at making the broad strokes and I really need someone to help me do all these other things that I'm not as good at and I don't have time to focus on. So I think as you're going through your mixed career, you're going to do things that you're like, okay, I did that great. I love that. I did that poorly. I should change that. And it's about being open. It's about like being aware of yourself and knowing that it's okay to fail and it's okay to succeed. So, Yeah, I think I still get like a... I think some of you will identify with this. I'm really confident with most of my mixes until I start printing them, <laughs> until I then send them over to the band, and like I instantly turn into a nervous mess, like, oh, everything's wrong with this. I fucked up this X, Y, Z. Um, and a lot of that is just like getting in your own head with it. So I really like being able to um, pass stuff off to like a buffer like Drew before going to someone else. So that having someone else um, there is super, super helpful. Um, yeah, even if we weren't working together, if you just have a friend or you have yes. someone, someone that you trust, someone that's just like has a similar music taste to what you're going after, you know, if you're making a metal record, then you're going to want to ask a friend or someone that you trust that listens to metal to just be like, hey, does this stand up to it? And they probably can't be like, no, you need to notch the guitar at 3K, but they'll be like, no, this kind of sounds like shit. Or they'll be like, no, this sounds good. So having a... You want to be open enough to getting feedback, and you can't take feedback personally because all it is is good because you want feedback. If it's good feedback, great. If it's bad feedback, awesome, even better. So many people are afraid to tell me when they don't like things, and that isn't helping anyone. So when we get mixed notes, we're just like, thank you so much for conveying what we need to be doing. So as you're learning to mix, get feedback. Don't take it personally. Use it as fuel. Be thankful that someone told you where you were messing up so you can fix it and get better. Yeah, there's a lot to be said for assuming. And, like, I know the cynics in the room, myself included, will, like, roll your eyes at this. You should kind of approach every bit of criticism as if it was valid in some way. Because it came from someone who's, like, they said it for a reason. Maybe their reasoning is, like, not quite as good or comes from a place of misunderstanding. But it was wrong for them, and that's, like, what they've experienced with yeah. it. You're not going to change how they experienced it, so you need to be able to incorporate that in a way where you can respond to it positively and yeah. work around that. Yeah. Um, I'm remembering we did one thing on this mix that we didn't show or do in this mixed one, which is the two bus dip. You notching reminded me. What was it? Um, this is very funny to do at the very end. Uh, I had mentioned earlier on our two bus we have one last plug-in. So this is probably what the difference was in the scoop. Sort of. Um, everyone hates 4K, right? Mm -mm. Oh, this yeah. This mouse is starting to get a little... I remember this, yeah. Uh, I opened up a project once of Drew's and, like, was amazed that he was doing this um, until I started doing it myself. I feel like I, I saw Joey do something like this and wanted to emulate it. Yep. So this is the 2-bus. We'll find uh, the most annoying frequency between 3.1 and 3.8 and notch it. And it actually helps a lot, so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. And sometimes some songs, some productions won't need it, but if you have distorted electric guitars yep. and distorted <laughs> bass, there's a ch uh, there's always value in just sweeping. trying it. Yeah, try try that out, and you're probably gonna enjoy it. It's gonna sound smoother. Yeah, I was pretty skeptical of that until last uh, year. We had a record where Chris Lord Algae mixed three of the singles, 
and we had sent him tracks, and he clearly did not do this giant dip on the two bus. But then when we would apply that dip to his mixes, they got better. Yeah. And it was like, well, we know these tracks, we might as well just keep it up. Yeah. Um, hilarious. Yeah. Well, awesome, dudes. Thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, of you course. Guys Thanks for it. having us. Thank you. Yeah, it's been a pleasure watching you guys work. It's been yeah, it's, uh, enlightening it's a fun song. and awesome. So, yeah. uh, and thank all you guys for tuning in and uh, watching this and for participating. We'll see you next month, August 2017, with uh, John Brown and Monuments. It's going to be bad ass, man. And, uh, Thanks for tuning in to 2017 July Nail the Mix with uh, Wizard Blood, Drew Falk, Jeff Dunn, and Muir, Flag of the Beast. We'll see you guys next time.